average harvest. Um, we also have the lowest days per deer of anywhere in the state. So one of the metrics we use for monitoring trends in deer is hunter efficiency. How many days in the field does it take to kill a deer? And on average, uh, unit four hunters kill a deer every other day that they go hunting. So you saw a lot of great presentations the first couple days from some very smart folks uh, that work for the department. I kind of more consider myself a blue collar biology, so this is a you know, technical term for me for the number of deer in Unit 4. We have, we have a lot of deer, and we'll, we'll talk more about, when we get into the proposals, we'll, we'll get some data that supports that. But, um, so we look, you know, it's, everybody has said you can't, it's really hard to count deer in a forested environment, so we look for trends in the population. Some of the tools that we need, that we use to monitor deer populations include pellet surveys, aerial alpine surveys, uh, body condition surveys, where I also get, um, by cruising the shorelines and, and classifying deer after the winter, I can get buck to doe and fawn uh, to doe ratios. And then we do beach mortality surveys to assess the overwinter uh, severity and, and declines in population associated with, with uh, deep snowfall. The region has transitioned away from pellet surveys, and you saw Dan's presentation about trail cameras, so I used this trail cam picture to kind of show that we're, we're going that way in Unit 4, and, and that's, that's one of the projects I didn't get done this summer was getting my cameras out. But So this summer we'll, we'll start putting cameras out in Unit 4 and, and get going uh, along with the rest of the region. It actually worked out pretty good for me because every all my colleagues got to figure out and and, and uh, figure out all the the bumps and the processes and and so I'm I'm uh, leaning on their their expertise to kind of do a bang up job in unit four. Moving on to mountain goats, we do not have any unit four specific proposals this uh, go around, and we have a negative. C and T finding, although I will mention that the Federal Subsistence Board considers mountain goats in Unit 4 a subsistence species. So uh, we, should, we should have a party or, or make up t-shirts or something because this is the 100 year anniversary of mountain goats being introduced to Baranoff Island. They were introduced in, in, two, in 1923. So, so 100 years of mountain goats on Baranoff. It's pretty, I think that's pretty neat. Um, we get about 15% of the harvest by guided non-residents, but, but really the bulk, of, the bulk of the harvest is by a very small, dedicated, kind of core, hardcore group of guys on, uh, and gals. We have a lot of, actually pretty high amount of female mount goat hunters on Barren Off as well, so that's pretty cool too. Um, and then we do get about one goat a year that's taken by a, a non-local Alaskan resident. So uh, mountain goat hunting on, on Barren Off is the real deal. Uh, we have our, our goats body size wise are very big. We get 350 pound billies, but our horns are really small. So a nine inch billy goat on Baranoff is hard to come by. So uh, Baranoff's not necessarily, a, again, a place where uh, folks are gonna come for a trophy mountain, mountain goat. And it's, it's difficult hunting. I mean, it's, it's not a matter of finding goats on Baranoff. It's a matter of finding one in a place that you can get to and finding one in a place where even if you can get to, are you going to be able to recover it if, if you're able to be successful? So um, it's very difficult hunting and for big goats with little horns. This is a graphic of our population estimates. Uh, just to do a little bit of explanation on the, the bottom of the graph, the triangles are our minimum counts for a, we have a, a central core, we call this the consistently surveyed area, which we try to try to do every year. And then when, when weather and pilot availability and planes and other vi variety of other factors all line up, we can get an island-wide survey, and those are the circles at the top of your graph. You can see that in 2019, we counted a record number of mountain goats on Baranoff Island. We have a population estimate of nearly 1,900 goats. And since then, uh, population's down a little bit. I was able to get a complete island-wide survey done this past October, um, but we're still, we're still very high on our goat, goat numbers on Baranoff, and we have tremendous opportunities if you're willing to, to get after it.
So this is a graph of our harvest going back to the mid 90s. We had some conservation concerns in the mid 2000s based on some of those some of those uh, severe winters that I that I mentioned for deer. And then keep in mind, uh, you know, just because it's a mild winter down here on the beach for deer, you get up to a thousand feet, and all this rainfall is is coming down as snow. So um, just because it's just because it's mild for the deer doesn't necessarily mean it's mild for the goats. So we had some conservation concerns uh, due to weather, and then we had high female harvest uh, during those years. You can see up to, up to 40, sometimes 50% nannies in our harvest going up to about 2011 when my predecessor uh, devised a new mountain goat management strategy. And you heard a little bit about a nanny penalty yesterday. And I just wanted to clarify in unit four, our nanny penalty isn't, isn't tied to the individual hunter. It's, uh, we, we call it one and done, where it's, it's tied to a hunt zone. So in 2011, we divided Baranoff Island into nine different mountain goat hunt zones. And so when a nanny was killed by a hunter in one of those zones, that entire zone was closed by emergency order. So, um, so it didn't penalize necessarily the hunter for the next year, but it penalized basically all the hunters by not being able to hunt anymore in that zone. So since 2011, when we've gone to that one and done system and, and relied on, on peer pressure to, to keep the nanny harvest down, we've gone from about 20 nannies per year to about four nannies per year. So we've really uh, been, this has been the most successful strategy anywhere in the state to reduce mountain goat nanny harvest. And we've, we've really shifted the culture of goat hunting in unit four. In 2017, I modified the, our mountain goat strategy even further. Uh, when we had nine hunt zones, we were losing a tremendous amount of opportunity because an you know, entire large geographical area might be closed because of one nanny. And there might be uh, more harvest available or opportunities available in more remote areas of that, of that zone. And so I divided the zone, the island into 34 smaller zones. That way, and then you know, this was coupled with this in, the increase in population that we were seeing. And this, this way, we, we kept the one and done strategy, but if a zone gets closed, it's just a small geographic area. And so it retains opportunity for hunters to just go to a different nearby adjacent zone. So this has been a highly uh, successful strategy. The, the hunters seem to, to like it. And um, you know, these aren't arbitrary zones we've we had mountain goats with collars, so we're using movement and spatial data to determine where these goats are, are hanging out. We used uh, past survey zones to kind of make sure we could stay consistent with our, with our surveys. We used um, local hunter knowledge and some distinct landmarks on the ground to help the hunters know what zones they're in. So um, it's very specific and um, pretty detailed, and then, uh, but, but it's working great. And, Managing by emergency orders is pretty common for mountain goats. It's not necessarily a, a, a burden for, for us as managers. So this is working out really well. Uh, unit four fur bears, you know, we've mentioned over and over that Martin are the most important uh, fur bear in, in Southeast, and that's no different for unit four. Um, you've got the numbers there in front of you for our, our averages over the last five years. We do have a positive CNT for, for fur bears, and the ANS is 90% of the harvestable portion. And we have no Unit 4 specific proposals this go around. I, I do want to make a couple mentions on, on Unit 4 fur bears, since they kind of have a little bit of a colorful history in, in Unit 4. Uh, the only endemic species is the Pacific Martin on Admiralty Island. Uh, on both Baranoff and Chichigoff, they were introduced in the mid Back in the 1930s and 50s, there was also a pretty good unofficial citizens effort uh, when after they were introduced to Baranoff Island in the 30s, trappers were, were live trapping and every time they catch a female, they were, they were taking it over to Chichigoff Island and you know, in, the, in the winter, the, the females are already pregnant. So um, Martin quickly responded on Chichigoff. And then they decided that, that the Martin needed something to eat. So they should introduce red squirrels to these places. And so uh, squirrels were, were transplanted to Baranoff and Chichigoff in the 1930s. 
And the, the fun unofficial rumor about that was that due to poor weather, uh, these squirrels were airdropped uh, sans parachutes into some of these places. So apparently another, another positive attribute of old growth forests is that the canopy provides a soft enough landing for uh, enough squirrels to, to survive and, and uh, expand. So. And we do get a little bit of squirrel harvest. We got we got some some kids in Sitka that are kind of kind of into that and roam the hills with their their pellet guns. So that's pretty fun. And I'll touch on bird hunting a little bit. Uh, we do we have excellent waterfowl hunting. I wouldn't say it's very popular. There's there's a pretty small dedicated group that that does it. Um, and then we have a really fun opportunity on Admiralty Island. We have uh, city grouse, or also known as hooters. And they're they're very abundant on Admiralty, and it's a great great chance to to get out in the spring, kind of shake off the the winter winter doldrums, and you know release your cabin fever and get out and, and climb some mountains and stretch the legs and get into some animals. So um, we have a little bit a little bit of ptarmigan, um, but they're not not necessarily targeted. It's more of an incidental uh, associated with with uh, mountain goat or deer hunting up in the Alpine. And that ends my presentation. There's a lot more fun stuff about Unit 4, but this was a kind of a 30,000 foot overview, and Natalie told me to keep it to 20 minutes, so. Questions on Unit 4? Go ahead, Stosh. Yeah, thank you. That was a good overview. Appreciate that. Um, talking about your zones and you reduced the size recently. Have you had any problems with people harvesting on the wrong side of the line after you closed the zone? Uh, through the chair, Member, Member Hoffman, we have not had, uh, that situation has not come up, no. Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on your deer uh, harvest reports, I think that was slide 12 or page 12. Um, it looks really good. I'm impressed with it, but I'm, uh, with the IM objectives that you have, have you considered uh, adjusting those IM objectives so your chart even looks better? <laughs> through, through, the, through the chair, Member Barrett, uh, we or more consistent. Yes, we've we've in house talked about that quite a bit, and and uh, the interesting thing about that and that line is is without going too too deep into the into the weeds on it, that it was set. Uh, in the years prior to that, and there was an anomaly year where we had like 12,000 deer reported harvested, reported harvested, and so that really um, biased that that line quite a bit higher than I think it it should be. But um, so. uh, generally, because when I look at harvest objectives and population objectives under IM, sometimes you know those are the numbers that we use to trigger uh, you know other other options. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. That was a great presentation. How much goat movement do you have island-wide between zone to zone? Yeah, thank you for the question uh, through the chair, Member Fletcher. Uh, actually, mountain goats on Baranoff have fairly small home ranges. Uh, they, they don't migrate uh, necessarily uh, out to different zones. There, there's obviously some, but uh, it's just pretty minimal. Um, they do migrate down during the wintertime, so we have uh, fairly good winter habitat for, for mountain goats. They, they do want winter in the timber, but yeah, pretty, pretty small home ranges. So. Thanks. Any additional questions on this? And I think we're ready to move into our proposals. We'll start with proposal 10, which has already been moved and seconded, so we can get the department response. Stand by for Henry. It's okay. <clears throat> We're ready. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is RC four, tab three point two. Before you is proposal 10 to decrease the bag limit for unit four remainder 
from six to four deer. This is a public proposal. The department is opposed to this proposal. We are opposed because there's no biological concern. Unit four deer populations can be sustainably managed under the current or proposed regulations. However, the department supports providing opportunities to hunt when harvestable surpluses exist. This provides for food security and generational passage of hunting traditions. And you can see that uh, our, your ACs, um, some oppose and some support. This is a map of Unit 4. You can see this proposal would, is only aimed at the remainder of Unit 4. So the, the area of Northeast Chichikov Island that's highlighted in red would not be included in this, in this proposal. Uh, this area currently already has a lower deer limit of three deer, with bucks only to September 14th. Northeast Chichigoff generally has higher snowfall totals than other parts of Unit 4, and also has an extensive um, road system associated with clear-cut logging, so uh, the deer are a little more vulnerable there and, and suffer a little, little heavier winters, and so we already have a reduced bag limit for this area. All right, let's go into some of the data that supports that Unit 4 has high deer populations. This is a graphic of our pellet surveys over the past uh, 20 or 10 years or so, past, past decade. You can see the blue bars with stars uh, highlighted. Those are our Unit 4 pellet group surveys. And you can see that consistently Unit 4 has the highest densities or highest counts of deer pellet surveys of any other place in Southeast Alaska. Sometimes it's uh, far exceeds other areas. And then I do want to note that those areas with those years without um, bars are just, are, are just years that we did not get surveys done. It doesn't necessarily mean low numbers. So I just wanted to point that out. We did do aerial alpine surveys for a few years, and it's still a tool that I keep in my toolbox. And you can see that we did surveys on South Admiralty Island and then Northeast Chichigoff Island as well. And again, uh, South Admiralty had the uh, highest number of deer. We counted deer per hour on these surveys. So the highest number of deer per hour of anywhere else in Southeast Alaska and Northeast Chichigoff tied for the third highest counts of anywhere in Southeast Alaska. I think in one of our surveys, we counted three, over 300 deer per hour on South Admiralty. It's a tremendous amount of deer. I mentioned uh, during the area overview deer mortality surveys, and you can see that uh, in, after that big snowfall year of 2006, 2007, biologists walked beaches looking for uh, carcasses of overwinter kills and counted four deer per mile of beach walked. Since then, we have not even uh, achieved one, one mortality per year, and most years were down around uh, very close to zero. Uh, I will note that, that 2022, survey results. We, we did a concentrated effort in Unit 4 because uh, in late November and December, we started to get some pretty heavy snowfalls across the region, and we kind of were like thinking, okay, this might be the big one that, that finally knocks the deer population back. And so we, we geared up to do um, multiple surveys around the region. Generally, I, I survey as far as I can reach with my, um, with my boat out of Sitka but we did some, some charter flights out of Juneau to do the east side of Admiralty. Uh, we did some, uh, some flights over to Lysiansky area, to northeast Chichigoff. So we wanted to get a, a you know, real good coverage of, of, the, whole, of the whole unit. Um, by January, uh, we had weather like this. The temperatures warmed up, our snowfall went away, and the deer moved back up into the timber and, and seemed to come, come through the winter just fine. But we did a little, little higher uh, mortality last year than than some of the earlier years, but nothing to be biologically uh, concerned with. And again, again we look at our, uh, we use harvest st statistics to monitor trends in our deer population. And you can see that we are generally very stable in our deer population with about uh, 5,700 deer taken every year. We're generally very consistently between 5,000 and 7,000 deer every year. And then I mentioned that, that effort harvest data that we use. And you can see that Unit 4, on average, 
takes, it takes a hunter 2.3 days of hunting to take one deer in Unit 4. And you compare that to other areas across the region, Unit 2, hunters need nearly just a little over four days per deer, four days per, per deer. Uh, Kodiak hunters need almost four days per deer. Uh, Ketchikan hunters need about five days per deer. And then you go move all the way up to the, the poor Douglas Island uh, hunters need, need almost eight days of hunting effort before they find one deer to harvest. So, so we have uh, extremely efficient hunting, and this is the best metric anywhere in the state. Moving on to a little, little bit of history here. Uh, at the 2019 Board of Game meeting, the bag limit was raised from four to six deer. Prior to 2019, the bag limit was four, and it had been four since before statehood. So this, uh, for federally qualified hunters in Unit 4, the bag limit has been, was six deer prior to that, is still six deer. And they also get an additional uh, month of hunting. They have a January season, and then also they have a very liberal designated hunter system where any federally qualified hunter can hunt for any other federally qualified hunter. So this, in this proposal, if it were to pass, it would be mostly Juneau residents who are affected. So we have three years of data from, since this uh, bag limit has been raised to six deer. So we looked at how many additional deer are, have we been taking over those three years. And we found that between 2019 and 2021, under this new bag limit, we had an average of 30 non-federally qualified hunters who took five deer and 29 non-federally qualified hunters who took six deer. And this averages out to about 88 additional year deer per year. It's about one to one and a half percent of the annual harvest. And 80% of those additional deer were taken by Juno hunters. And there's, there's not, of that 20, remaining 20%, it's really spread out between a whole bunch of different communities. So. And this is just another way of looking at that data. This is the number of uh, the number of deer that hunters harvested between zero and six of uh, non-federally qualified hunters during those three years. And you can see that 37% of the hunters take zero, 31% of the hunters took one deer, 15% took two deer, and 9% took three deer. So 97% of non-federally qualified hunters took four deer or less during these three years. About 3% of the hunters took advantage of this increased bag limit and were able to take uh, deer number five or deer number five and six. And this is just another way of, of stating that. So 97% of the non-federally -qual non qualified hunters took four or fewer deer, indicating that a four deer bag limit is adequate for the majority of hunters. But conversely, we only saw a one and a half percent increase in the total unit four harvest, indicating to us that a six deer bag limit provides a sustainable increased opportunity. We've heard testimony about this already, that this, that this proposal was submitted specifically to reestablish a clearer priority for federally qualified hunters in an effort to avoid closures associated with current federal subsistence proposals So just taking a 30,000 foot view of those current proposals that are before the Federal Subsistence Board, this is WP 2207. This map shows the areas that would be affected. It's basically the entire west side of Admiralty Island would be closed from September 15th to November 30th. WP 2208 would reduce the bag limit for non-federally qualified hunters on Northeast Chichigoff Island from three deer east of Port Frederick and six deer west of Port Frederick to two bucks. You see Port Frederick is that uh, large body of water kind of in the right splits that, that yellow area. And then WP 22-10 would reduce the deer bag limit for non-federally qualified hunters in the Lysiansky Inlet area from six deer to four deer. So in conclusion, the Department of Fish and Game is strongly opposed to the federal proposals. Uh, our comments have been out in the public for, for several months now. You saw the deer video that we've produced. Uh, we've come out very strongly opposed to these federal proposals. Unit 4 deer populations are currently high and stable. 
The four deer bag limit is adequate for most non-federally qualified hunters. However, six deer is sustainable and provides an additional opportunity. So it's gonna be fully up to you all on the Board of Game to decide if you wanna make changes on the state side to try to influence the Federal Subsistence Board. Uh, we don't have any, any agreements with the Federal Subsistence Board about if we pass one proposal, they'll pass a proposal. So um, it's really just up, up to you all. Um, the state's comments on the federal proposals are available online and the Federal Subsistence Board meets January 31st to February 3rd. And again, the department is opposed to this proposal because there's no biological concern. Unit four deer populations can be sustainably managed under the current or proposed regulations. However, the department supports providing opportunities to hunt when harvestable surpluses exist. This provides for food security and generational passage of hunting traditions. This is proposal number 10 and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So do you have a best guess or do you think you're close to the, the total carrying capacity? Are you worried about that at all? The carrying capacity for overpopulating too much? Yeah, through the chair. Um, in some watersheds, we are reaching maximum carrying capacity. And in some years, I put out advisory announcements actually encouraging hunters to take does as part of their part of their bag limit. So um, yeah, we're very robust populations. It's not to the point where you, you see these uh, pictures back east where the deer are unnaturally uh, exceeding carrying capacity and, and devastating uh, the landscape. But yeah, we're, we're at or near winter capacity in some watersheds for sure. Additional questions. Um, do we have a statistics on non-resident take in Unit 4? Mr. Chairman, uh, approximately 2% of the harvest is taken by non-resident hunters. So that's a larger number than the, than the additional take by um, hunters that take six. Correct, it's still, it's still a very small number. We're talking about you know, 150 deer approximately. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Steve, that was a very good overview. Um, I was wondering, well, my first question is, is do all hunters have to use harvest tickets and reports down there, federally qualified, non-federally qualified? Yeah, through the, through the chair, Member Brett, uh, yes, everybody that hunts deer, whether you're federally or non-federally qualified, gets the state harvest tickets and are required to report um, their harvest at the end of the season. So do you have uh, data on how many federally qualified people take five or six deer like you did for non-federally qualified? We do have that number. I don't have that in front of me right now, but uh, we get about 70% uh, respondents to our harvest sur surveys when we do a um, expansion factor to account for the remaining uh, permits. But I don't know if that gets to your, exactly to your question. Well, I just wanted it's, to see what the difference yeah, was between the harvest of five or six deer uh, we have it for non-federally qualified. I'd like to see what the it's, federally qualified people are doing. Yeah, I, I have that. I could get back to you on that. Um, that's included in our in our comments to the Federal Subsistence Board. It's it's much higher. The you know, federally qualified hunters do take uh, five and six deer on a fairly regular basis, but I don't have that exact um, percentage in front of me. All right, thank you. Additional quick, go ahead, um, Jake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is uh, the majority of the hunting effort <coughs> on, uh, takes place along the coastline. I know you talked about some alpine stuff too, but. Yeah, through the chair, member, member Fletcher. We don't have a big road system in Unit 4 except for Northeast Chichigoff Island. So yes, uh, boat hunting is, is the name of the game. There's a very limited amount of road system just in the Sitka area, but I'd say 90% of the, of the harvest outside of Northeast Chichigoff is by boat-based hunters. So and you get a mile away from the beach and you've left all the competition behind. So there's a tremendous amount of refugia in Unit 4, which uh, contributes to the, the high opportunities because uh, there's, there's just a lot of places where humans never, never reach. Go ahead, Jake. So there isn't a lot of hunter conflict in the, you don't, you're not getting reports of, you know, two hunters conflicting with one another where they're hunting. I mean, through the, through the chair, and it's always a bummer when when there's another boat in your favorite favorite bay, but uh, you just move on to the 
the next next spot. Um, obviously, there's there's competition for uh, you know out of Sitka specifically. You've got you know, hundreds of hunters launching from one or two boat launches, you know, especially. I mean, if you go to you go to the boat launch on on November 10th and it's overflow parking so um, there's obviously competition um, just like for anything thank you hey, Ben thank you mr. chairman just to um, add a lifeline to Steve um, through the chair uh, member Brett um, I pulled up our comments for the federal proposal and um, the, um, and looking at the pie chart for average annual federally qualified hunters that harvest um, more than four deer, so you had um, six percent um, harvested five deer and seven percent harvested six deer. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I'd like to clarify something you commented you said boat hunting and it's important to note that boat hunting in some parts of the state I means people shooting things from a boat and we don't shoot things from the boat in southeast Alaska so that would be a, a different way to put it yeah mr. chairman thank you for that clarification boat uh, access to your hunting areas via boat transportation thank okay you. thank you Just want to make make sure that people listening don't think that we're hunting from boats um, and um, any further questions go ahead Al yeah thank you mr. chairman uh, so Steve you said that there was uh, 70 percent compliance with uh, turning in harvest data from federally qualified people do you have that figure for non federally qualified people with their compliances with the harvest tickets and reports don't through the chair uh, I don't have those exact numbers it's generally higher for the non federally qualified hunters uh, you see higher compliance in the larger urban areas uh, than you do in some of the villages but we've, we've made a pretty tremendous effort to try to increase that harvest response uh, we even I'll even make personal phone calls I get a list of all the all the folks from Huna or all the folks from Angoon uh, who haven't reported and I will call them as, and try to get uh, as many as I can so. Thank you. So, in this area, non residents and residents have the same uh, hunting season bag limits. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the bag limit is currently the same. The season length for non federally qualified hunters goes an oh, extra month. I wasn't or, or, talking about non federally qualified, so residents and non residents. Oh, right. So, through the, through the chair, the state season is, is, the same, is the same for residents and non residents, and the bag limit is the same as well. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions from board members? Not discussion? Well, call the question. I'm not ready for the question. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping there'll be some discussion on this. Um, I wanted to point out, we're being asked to restrict opportunity for a species that's primarily used for personal consumption we had testimony from the department that it's not a trophy species and AS 1605255D which provides um, that the regulations adopted under this section must provide that consistent with provisions of AS 1605258 which is the subsistence statutes the taking of moose deer elk caribou by residents for personal and family consumption has preference over taking by non-residents and I think that indicates that we have a duty to look at um, if if we're going to do this and I don't support this proposal but if we were going to reduce um, consum uh, reduce the taking here that we would have we have to look at non-resident take first before we look at resident take and since this area has the same um, bag limits and seasons for residents and non-residents I think that's something that we really need to consider and discuss before we take action on this thank you go ahead thank you mr. chair so I mean we've got an abundant resource 
we've got a bag limit of six. Um, it's, it appears that the non-qualified hunters are already kind of self-limiting. They're, they're taking what they feel they need. We got a very small percentage of the people that take five five deer, and then even a smaller percentage take six. So, um, I don't I don't support this proposal as written. Um, now we did have some testimony from APHA where the the guides were willing to reduce the non-resident to two deer, but to be honest with you, I, with the with the population, I, I don't even know that, see where that's really necessary to restrict that, but uh, I'll be interested to hear what other board members have to say on that. James. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be supporting this. Um, the department's opposed. There's no biological concern. Um, for the non-federally qualified hunters, it was 3% that, that uh, took five or, or five or more. Um, and, it, and it doesn't appear like there is a conflict. Um, as stated in the proposal, which is the reason for the proposal. So um, I'm not really seeing what the concern is, and so I'm not going to be supporting it. Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Because of your comments, I'd like to propose an amendment to reduce non-resident bag limits for deer in GMU-4 to two deer bucks only. Second. We have an amendment before us, discussion on the amendment. Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the department, how many, do we have data on how many individual non-resident people take more than two deer? Through the chair, Member Brett, I, I don't have the exact number, but if you consider the, uh, the small number of non-resident hunters that, that hunt deer in Unit 4, it's about maybe 150 deer taken, you know, most of them, and we heard testimony from the guides and, and just my personally talking to most of the hunters, they all generally take two deer. You buy two tags, you shoot you shoot the first antlered buck so you can check off your, you know, your Sitka blacktail deer on your list of North American wild wild game and then and then you hold out and look for look for a bigger one. So um, that's just it would be a very small number that take more than two. Go ahead, L. Uh, my second question is do you have any data that non residents are taking does? I'm Sure, they do. Yeah, on occasion, just to, uh, generally, our harvest is about seventy-five percent bucks overall. Um, generally, non-residents are, are targeting targeting bucks and targeting the rut season. But um, I can imagine that a few does are taken, but I don't have the exact numbers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, or thank you, Steve. Oh, uh, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to add a little bit more to the discussion, uh, you know, a lot of uh, residents of Southeast Alaska, non-resident relatives come up and go out, and sometimes they're interested in the biggest buck they can find. Sometimes they're just excited about taking a blacktail. Uh, however, uh, non-residents that utilize a guide or a transporter, things like that, you know, more often than not, they're looking for a buck. And in ungulate hunts, if you're harvesting males, it's not going to make that much of an impact. Further discussion on the amendment? Call the question on the amendment? Call the question. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Call the roll, Christy. On the amendment, do you reduce amendment. the non-resident bag limit to two bucks? Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cootie? No. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Mr. Keogh? No. Ms. Cusack? No. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. And Mr. Burnett? Yes. That amendment fails by vote of three yeas to four nays. Okay, the original proposal is back before us. Um, additional discussion on proposal 10. Intent. Go ahead, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple um, points here for context for the small percentage of people who might harvest more than for deer, it's a very strong subsistence pattern throughout the state that there are high harvesters who harvest most of the um, wild resources and then share very heavily throughout their community. So that might be what's happening with those few people, the few percentage who are the high harvesters. Um, they're providing subsistence resources through the, to their community. 
And the second point is, I think, Mr. Chair, you were um, getting there, but this proposal would represent a um, reduction in subsistence opportunity. So if it were to be adopted, it would be great if the record could show why this would still, why a four buck limit would still provide a reasonable opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any additional discussion on this? Go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to support this proposal. Um, I think we're providing and meeting the subsistence requirements for the state. I think there is a clear def, a clear priority for federal qualified people with the extra days they get to harvest deer and the opportunity to harvest deer for other other people in their communities. And so I think, uh, and those are the reasons I'm going to use or put on the record. Additional discussion? If not, I believe we're ready for the question. Oh, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, I guess just a little bit more for the record. Um, I don't think I'm going to support this either just because of Ms. Olson's comments and the department's comments about the deer population there. Thank you. Okay. Call the question. Question has been called on Proposal 10. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you poll the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 10. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Keough? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. And Mr. Hoffman? No. Proposal fails 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, I move to take no action on Proposal 11. And I guess the author wants to have it pulled. Second. We ask for unanimous consent that we take no action on proposal number 11. Okay, we will take no action on proposal number 11. On to proposal 12. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt proposal 12, open the Mitchell Bay closed area in unit four to brown bear hunting. Second. Proposal 12 has been moved and seconded. The department's response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Before you is proposal 12 to open the Mitchell Bay closed area to brown bear hunting in unit four. This is a public proposal. The department's recommendation is neutral because there is no biological, biological concern for some additional harvest on Admiralty Island. This request is mostly allocated between user groups. This is a map of the Mitchell Bay closed area, it encompasses Mitchell Bay, Kennelcoo Bay, and Favorite Bay, and uh, extends 660 feet from the mean high tide line to the uplands. But I think this is actually a, a better map for you. This is a Google Earth image of, of the area, and it just um, really highlights that this is, a, this is fantastic bear habitat. There's multiple estuaries, coves, and hidden bays. Um, a lot of there's a lot of habitat here for brown bears. There are currently four guide outfitter businesses uh, that would be able to take advantage of this new opportunity, plus obviously uh, resident hunters. The current population estimate for Admiralty Island is 1,560 bears. We don't have a specific estimate for this particular um, closed area. The guideline harvest level for Admiralty is 62 bears. Our 10-year average is 42, with 86% of that take being male. Kutsnahu Incorporated is the major landowner. They are the uh, Inkska uh, Corporation for the village of Angoon. And there is a cooperative land management zone in this area. The Mitchell Bay area was created in 1991 for bear viewing and economic development. And this area and the issues surrounding it are, are highly polarizing and have a significant history. And I wanted to read into uh, the record a couple of paragraphs that uh, are included in our uh, ANRs for this proposal just to get it on the record. The Mitchell Bay closed area has a long history. In 1932, the US Congress seriously considered closing all of Admiralty Island to hunting in order to create a bear refuge. As a compromise between development interests and preservation of bears, the Territorial Game Commission created the Pack Creek and Thayer Creek closed areas. In 1984, 
several Unit 4 hunting guides proposed expanding the Pack Creek area to include Swan Cove, Swan Island, and Windfall Harbor. This proposal was approved along with a reduction in the Thayer Mountain closed area. The remaining Thayer Mountain closed area was renamed the Salt Lake closed area. Then in 1991, at the request of Angoon residents, the Salt Lake closed area was expanded to include the Mitchell Bay shoreline within 660 feet of mean high tide for the purpose of developing a bear viewing area and to provide economic opportunity for Angoon. The shoreline of Mitchell Bay is a special cooperative land management zone created by Anilka. The majority of the land is owned by Kutsunhu Incorporated, the, Ang the Angoon Anska Village Corporation. The U.S. Forest Service manages surface resources and regulates public access as part, as, at, as part of Admiralty Island National Monument and Wilderness on the condition that Kutsunhu Incorporated be assured quiet enjoyment of the area. The closure proposal was an outgrowth of Kutsunhu's interest in pursuing commercial, non-consumptive recreation as part of its long-term development strategy for the area. There was also growing concern at the time that bears wounded by hunters would pose a threat to local residents using the area for harvesting fish and other wildlife. Most recently at the 2004 Board of Game meeting, uh, the closed areas were reviewed and this area was included in that and the board voted to retain. Some of the reasons that the board gave at that time were to reduce conflicts between hunters and locals, provide safety for local, local users, and to recognize the cultural importance of bears to Angoon. The department determined that opening the closed area would be contrary to the original intent and the board agreed and voted to retain status quo. Then in 2020, the Forest Service signed an agreement between hunting guides and the small cruise ship industry called the 2020 Forest Service Best Management Practices to help reduce crowding and conflicts in Unit 4 associated with the increasing tourism that we've already talked about. The author of this proposal gave two, um, two reasons for submitting the proposal, one being to reduce brown bear predation um, and this was is specifically tied to the federal subsistence board proposals that were uh, that we've heard a lot about this week. Uh, but brown bears are generally not a driver of deer populations. We do know we do know that they predate on deer occasionally, particularly when uh, fawns are born and are most vulnerable. But we did uh, we did have a study back in the late 90s that found very few uh, deer remains in scats, uh, and we also weren't able to determine whether these are you know. For you know, scavenged deer or deer that the bears were, were um, predating. So um, very few deer in, in these brown bear scats. And then we've also, as a, the department has, um, has done a few deer studies where we have collared deer and we've reported zero predation mortalities. You know, obviously it happens, but uh, in general, brown bears uh, aren't, compared to like, black bears and wolves and other parts of, of Southeast Alaska, brown bears are not a driver of deer, deer populations. And obviously um, biologists, hunters, guides, and others all report uh, seeing bears and deer in close proximity and uh, exhibiting no apparent concern. The other reason given for this proposal was to reduce uh, human bear conflict. This is an apocalyptic looking picture of the dump in Angoon. This was taken in 2018 at the request of the village of Angoon. Myself and Alaska State, State Troopers went over there and uh, killed a, a couple of, of bears that were posing a public safety issue to the town. This is the last, these are the last DLPs that we've had in the Angoon area. The proposal suggests that opening the Mitchell Bay closed area may result in fewer human bear conflicts associated with the Angoon village dump. Over the last 10 years, we've only had six DLPs in Angoon. And actually the dump is outside of the Mitchell Bay closed area. So technically somebody could hunt at the dump if they chose to do so. Um, brown bear hunting is not, a, is not a culturally significant use um, by Angoon residents, even though they are culturally significant. So we don't expect to see a significant increase in, in hunting by local folks there, even if the Mitchell Bay closed area were to open. And generally, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio. You don't, you know, you take out one bear 
via hunting doesn't necessarily re re mean you're gonna re reduce your DLPs by one, by one bear. Um, hunters generally want the largest male bears, but uh, you know, bears that post public safety issues in, in towns come in all shapes and sizes, um, often sows with cubs or juvenile bears. So um, we're not necessarily gonna target by hunting the bears that are gonna cause problems. Again, this is proposal 12 to open the Mitchell Bay closed area to brown bear hunting in unit four. This is a public proposal and the department is neutral. We feel that it is unlikely this proposal would solve the two issues raised by the author, uh, that being uh, brown bear predation and human conflict. And we're neutral because there is, is no biological, biological, biological concern for some additional harvest on Admiralty Island. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Um, questions from board members? Al, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the closed area is just for bears. They're st are they still allowed to take deer in that area? Through the chair, member Brett, yeah, it's, the closure is just for brown bears, so uh, hunt, hunt, deer hunting is still allowed. Thank you. So are you aware of um, any plans for or current use of that area for bear viewing uh, commercially in the summertime? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, there's, there's currently one um, uh, lodge in the area that does uh, bear viewing tours, and, and I have heard of some. It's, it's in the works, or they still plan to do it. They still want to. Uh, I don't know how far along those uh, business plans are, but... Uh, Obviously, we've, we've talked a lot this meeting about increasing tourism, so it's definitely a viable uh, potential. Well, additional questions? Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, given the, the length of this, this being in place and, uh, and the fact that the landowner is having to... The, the primary landowner in the area is not in favor of this. Even if we were to support this program, it, it doesn't seem like we'd accomplish anything. Um, the landowner still has control whether or not anybody can hunt in that in that boundary there. But um, based on the overview of the area and stuff and their bear management plan, it, it just seems like everything they're doing is really is working really well. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm, I'm interested in in throwing. A monkey wrench and it, just the very fact that we don't have a bunch of proposals trying to close areas it sounds like everybody's kind of getting along down there so I I'm not likely to support this proposal thank you thank you uh, Lynn additional discussion from the board um, a question for for Ryan or or uh, Deputy Commissioner Mulligan um, has the department um, considered um, setting up a new bear management look, group and looking at the area in terms of making any fundamental changes or uh, recommendations for changes in that area? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We haven't really thought seriously about doing it. Uh, I can't remember, recall, when was our last Sitka Board of Game meeting? And, and I believe in 2013, uh, the board and the department reconvened uh, the brown bear management team. And, you know, several steps were taken to implement more parts of that. Uh, but, at, and bear viewing non consumptive use, including the Mitchell Bay area, is part of that discussion. Um, and there were no real pushes uh, to take a look at that. Periodically, as uh, Mr. Bethune pointed out, we do get a request from the board to review closed areas. Um, I, I thought it was sooner, more recent than 2004, but, you know, that doesn't matter. Uh, and so I'm sure we'll do that again uh, at some point. But I, you know, tourism's, uh, I, I really appreciate Mr. Kehoe, Member Kehoe's comments that uh, it's functioning uh, pretty well. And it's actually good to hear that there's some economic discussions and development potential um, going on down there. And uh, I guess until we get a real push, we probably won't put a lot of time into reviewing it. That, of course, unless the board says, next time we're here, <laughs> bring it to us. So. 
Okay, any additional discussion, Al? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking at the topographical map on Mitchell Bay, and it seems to me if somebody wanted to actually hunt that 660 feet, the terrain or topography is not going to... Uh, <coughs> Not, uh, not allow them to, to get out beyond that. It looks fairly flat and not steep like lots of places are. So. Through the chair, Member Brett, uh, I think, and as uh, Member Keo pointed out, you would still need landowner permission to cross uh, uh, through those right. lands and, and get, uh, access those, those lands. So. Okay. Um, Ryan, you have additional comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nope, I just wanted to back up a little bit and clarify a statement the department made about being able to hunt within the landfill. Um, there's actual statewide regulations prohibiting hunting within a half mile of landfill, so it actually couldn't get that right. close. Thank you. Um, Stosh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no interest in supporting this proposal. It's been in place for over 20 years. Uh, several user groups came to a consensus, and I don't want to undo all that. I think things are working just fine right now. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional comments from the board? If not, Al? Call the question. Question has been called. Um, the board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you poll the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 12. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Keogh? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Proposal fails, zero to seven. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 13, change the RB088 hunt boundary in Unit 4 to include Northeast Chichikov and increase the allowable harvest for brown bear. Second. Been moved and seconded. The department comments, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is proposal 13 to change the spring bear hunt boundaries and raise the guideline harvest level in parts of Unit 4. This is a public proposal. The department is opposed to this proposal due to conservation concerns. The current hunt areas, seasons, and guideline mortality levels are sustainable. Changes could result in an unsustainable, unsustainable mortality and declining bear populations. Also, user conflicts could result in the department cautions against making changes to long-standing brown bear regulations without input from the brown bear management team. So this, is, this proposal is kind of a twofer. Uh, you got actually two, kind of two asks in, in one. Uh, the first ask is to change the spring brown bear hunt boundaries uh, for RB and DB 088 to include Northeast Chichigoff Island. And then the second part is to raise the guideline harvest level from 4% to up to 15% in guide use areas 0411, 0415, and 0416. So there's, there's a lot to unwrap in this proposal, and I'm going to do my best to, to walk you all through, through the, do, the two separate parts of this proposal, but there, I will say there's a little bit of overlap between, between the two. A little bit more on the brown bear management strategy. The brown bear management team uh, comprised, was comprised of 15 individuals representing landowners, resource agencies, special interest groups, uh, board of game, the state, and, other, and a, a real diverse uh, bunch of uh, entities in a very collaborative project. It was done at the Board of Games' request to develop a comprehensive management recommendation for Unit 4 bears. The goals of the brown bear management strategy were the long-term conservation of Unit 4 brown bears and their habitats, to, pro to provide a broad spectrum of public enjoyment and sustainable uses, including hunting and viewing opportunities, and to improve communication among the public and agencies involved in brown bear management. And as Ryan mentioned, this the Brown Bear Management Strategy was reaffirmed by the Board of Game and members of the Brown Bear Management Team at the 2013 Board of Game meeting in Sitka. All right, so I got a bunch of maps for you. This is the um, current and proposed map of RBDB 088. Um, it, 
within the department, we refer to 088 as the outside drainages and 089 as the inside drainages. So you can see on the, on the left side of your map is the current uh, 088 hunt and under this uh, proposed proposal, uh, the entire uh, Lysiansky area and Northeast Chichigoff Island uh, would be included in the outside drainages hunt. And this is another, another way of looking at it. This is the inside drainages hunt. On the left of your screen is the current boundaries and then you can see the reduction in the inside drainages hunt if this proposal were to pass and it gives you a better, better picture of, of the additional areas that would be included in RB and DB 088. Eighty percent of our spring harvest comes from the inside drainages and then fifty percent of that harvest occurs between May 11th and May 20th. If, if this proposal were to pass, the season would be extended in these additional areas by 11 days. It would go from May 21 to 31. The outside drainages uh, are generally not as popular to hunt. Uh, they're, they're difficult to access and there's fewer anchorages. About 75% of the total brown bear harvest in Unit 4 occurs in the springtime. So you can see that these, the inside drainage accounts for a vast majority of the overall brown bar harvest in Unit 4. There are currently three guides authorized to do up to 34 hunts in, in guide use areas 0411, 0415, and 0416, representing a significant, a significant possible increased harvest. This is the chronology of Unit 4 brown bear harvest on the spring brown bear hunt. You can see that the uh, May 11 to 20 period uh, accounts for about 50% of the overall harvest. If, if this area was to open, uh, so the, that entire May 21 to 31 harvest is from outside drainages. So if we added that significant land mass to the inside drainages hunt, I would expect to see um, a signif significant increase in that May 21 to 31 time period. We've, we've already talked a little bit about um, brown bear activity and the rut and um, green up and, and the availability of, of bears and, and just the hunting just gets better and better as the spring progresses. So in the real world on the ground effect is that you'd be able to hunt northeast Chichigoff and the Lysiansky area for an additional 11 days. The current boundaries have been in place for 42 years. The current regulations and the brown bear management strategy guidelines have been very successful. And then again, I'm on to mention the 2020 Forest Service Best Management Practices Agreement between hunting guides and the small cruise ship industry. The inside and outside drainages are not specifically mentioned in the brown bear management strategy, although they were in place when the brown bear management strategy was developed, so they definitely were taken into account. The separate hunts were based on conservation concerns and uh, you know we don't have a real good written record within the department of, of how those boundaries were come up. They came up with those boundaries but I've talked to several people who have been who were involved historically in those in those talks and there was it was a lot of work to come up with those boundaries and there was real on the boots uh, real on the ground boots uh, on the ground experience you know right down to uh, sun aspect and and you know where the, where daylight hits these these specific bays and estuaries and the timing of green up and so uh, there was a lot of thought and a lot of um, years of, of experience that went into coming up with these uh, boundary lines. All right, so that kind of ends the the part one proposal of part one of this proposal the the boundary shift and now we're going to move into part two which is the uh, raising the guideline harvest level. Uh, currently, the brown bear management strategy sets the guideline harvest level at 4%. The guideline harvest level for Northeast Chichigoff Island is 18 bears. And the last, over the last decade, we've averaged 12 bears out of that area with about 75% of those being male. I will note that 40% of, of that take is, is non-hunting related. So we do get a significant number of uh, DLPs and agency kills in the, particularly in the HUNA, uh, associated with the community of HUNA. 
For the remainder of Chichigof, which would also be included in this proposal, uh, we have a guideline harvest level of 50 bears. The 10-year average has been 37, with, a, with over 80% male in the harvest. So here's another map showing those three guide use areas, 0411, 0415, and 0416. And you can see there's a, a heavy pink line on that map which de denotes the proposed boundary change and which would align the boundary with uh, the guide use area. So that's one of the, the goals of this proposal is, is to align the, the hunt boundaries with current guide use area boundaries. So some theoretical numbers here. If we were to increase the guideline harvest level for Northeast Chichigoff to 15% of the estimated population, that would be 68 bears. And if we raised it 15% for the remainder of Chichigoff Island, um, it would be 186 bears. And so, I mean, these are obviously very theoretical numbers and we have limits to the number of hunts that it can occur. So uh, these are you know, extreme examples, but uh, the, we manage based on a four island strategy. And so the concept of um, assigning guideline harvest levels to specific guide use areas uh, would really confound our management. We'd have to um, come up with some outside the box thinking and outside of the brown bear management strategy to assign specific guideline harvest levels to um, something other than those four specific islands. Then the proponent of this proposal also cites brown bear predation and human bear conflict as part of their proposal. I won't uh, belabor, we've gone over this with the last proposal, but uh, again, brown bear predation does not drive deer populations. The proponent suggests that raising the guideline harvest levels will help reduce human bear conflict. Over the last 10, uh, last 10 years, we've had 46 human caused mortalities that are not hunting related. Uh, and it does seem that it does seem like a lot, but if over 10 years, it's about four or five bears on an annual basis. And then we do have uh, years where because of poor fish runs or poor berry crops, we'll get an uptick. We had, we had 16 or 18 DLPs in 2018 in, in Huna. So that again helps to, to skew those numbers uh, pretty high. And, but, but again, sport harvest doesn't necessarily translate to less DLPs. Again, the, tar the hunters are targeting the largest male bears and bears that cause uh, conflicts in town can come in uh, all, all sizes and, and uh, sows and cubs, et cetera. So, um, and we currently have regulations in place, the DLP regulations that allow for the, the removal of bears that cause pub public safety issues. And we're trying to increase our educational efforts in these towns for uh, garbage handling. I do presentations every year on, on how to secure your trash, those kind of things. So we're, we're working on it. Again, the current boundaries have been in place for 42 years. Brown bears are being successfully managed for both hunting and non-consumptive uses under the current regulations. We do have conservation concerns if the proposal is adopted. We may see user group conflicts. Again, that Northeast Chichikov uh, area, recall we've got over 250,000 cruise ship uh, visitors coming to Huna every year. And those uh, cruise ship, uh, those tour operators are not expecting to see hunting happening around Northeast Chich from May uh, 21st to, to May 31st. So uh, we may see user group conflicts increase. And, in, and this proposal is unlikely to address the issues raised in the proposals. Again, this is proposal 13 to change the spring brown bear hunt boundaries and raise the guideline harvest level in parts of unit four. This is a public proposal. The department is opposed due to conservation concerns, current hunt areas, seasons, and guideline mortality levels are sustainable. Changes could result in unsustainable mortality and declining bear populations. Also, user conflicts could result, and the department cautions against making changes to longstanding brown bear regulations without input from the brown bear management team. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Questions for the department from board members? Al. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just looking at some of the AC stuff, and I was, uh, um, and I totally missed it during the AC uh, presentations, but um, I was wondering if you knew maybe why the AC and Pelican didn't comment on this proposal. Through, through the chair, member, member Brett, uh, I was there for that meeting, and they, they just decided that it, not to comment on it. I don't, and they, there wasn't actually very much discussion even on it. So it was uh, um, honestly boggled my mind a little bit. But yeah, they, they chose not to, not to take it up. So they, yeah. All right. Thank you. Additional questions from board members. Go ahead, Jake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> is uh, Prime Spring habitat for bears kind of uh, equally dispersed between both sides of that island? And I imagine that's like goose tongue grass, or, or, or what are they eating in the spring, bears? Well, they're they're obviously moving out through the chair, member member Fletcher. They're coming out of hibernation and they're and they're migrating right down to the beaches. That's the first first place where where things green up. So they're looking for they're looking for the the goose tongue. They're looking for um, just grasses, sedges. They're looking for um, overwinter uh, carcasses from uh, deer. They're looking for um, they're flipping rocks and getting crabs and eels and things like that. So um, does that answer your question? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Any additional questions? Discussion from board members on this proposal. Um, intent. Um, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm kind of going the same way as the, the past proposal. Um, just with all the overview and uh, presentations the department's given here, that it just seems like what they've got going down there was agreed on a long time ago, and it's just amazing that it's still still intact and nobody's, um, or at least not not a whole lot of people are complaining about the, the process of it. Um, I guess basically I'm just leaning leaning along the lines. If it's not broke, why, why would we want to fix it? So um, I'm not real inclined to support this proposal either. Additional comments, Al? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, I would, I'm torn between this one still, but, you know, there's uh, 14 uh, PCs uh, in support of it, and... Uh, eight against, but I was really looking at Icy Straits and Pelican for direction on how they were going. But I did see the Sika tribe of Alaska was supporting this in their comments, and so now I'm, I'm split still. But I'm tending to go towards, you know, to keep this in place. Um, I was just hoping for more direction from the, the local people. Any additional comments? I'm, I intend to not support the proposal. Um, it's a very complex working arrangement between the tourism industry, the, the guides, everyone in this area. And uh, so, you know, it's a trophy area. Raising the guideline harvest is going to have a tendency to degrade trophy quality over time, I believe. Um, it has a potential anyway. And also the experience of the people, you know, People in Huna, he said there were 250 cruise ship visitors previous year, but I know that they're planning to double that at least in the future and, and way more. So it's it's a major, you know, the, the, there's a lot of things going on there. Um, in fact, my wife and I used to do um, fishing and bear watching tours along, around that area. And uh, it's really cool when you wake up in the morning and there's nine bears on the beach. So. Any additional comments, questions? Al? Call a question. Question's been called. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 13. Mr. Keogh? No. Ms. Kusak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Brett? No. Proposal fails, zero to seven. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt proposal 14, change the brown bear hunt area 
for RB088 in Unit 4 to include all of Lazansky Inlet drainage. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Proposal 14, if the department would comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, before you is Proposal 14. This would change the spring brown bear hunt boundaries to include all of Lysiansky Inlet within RB and DB 088. This is a public proposal. The department is neutral because there is not a biological concern for a small increase in harvest in this area. However, user conflicts could result and the department again cautions against making changes to long-standing brown bear regulations without input from the brown bear management team. And these are some of the same slides from the previous presentation about the brown bear management strategy and the brown bear management team. Again, here are your goals for the brown bear management strategy, the long-term conservation of unit four brown bears and their habitats to provide a broad spectrum of public enjoyment and sustainable uses, both hunting and non-hunting, and to improve communication among the public and the agencies involved in brown bear management. Again, this was reaffirmed at the board of game meeting in 2013. So the last proposal and the, uh, you heard public testimony that the last proposal was the big ask and this is the, the small ask. Um, this is the map of RB088. The current boundary is highlighted in red and the proposed boundary is highlighted in is that yellow line. So you can see that uh, currently uh, most of Lysiansky Inlet is not included in the outside drainages hunt. And if this proposal were to pass, that line would shift to the north shore of uh, Lysiansky Inlet and allow for hunting again for that 11 additional days um, for all of Lysiansky Inlet. This is a different map, uh, again, uh, maybe showing better where those boundary changes would be. The blue line at, on the bottom, bottom left of your screen is the current boundary, and then the red line is the, would be the proposed boundary. And again, this follows guide use area, uh, the north boundary of guide use area 0415. So one of the goals of this proposal is to align the hunt boundary with the guide use area. The remainder of Chichigoff Island has a guideline harvest level of 50 bears. Uh, the 10-year average has been 37 with over 80% male. And again, the proposal's intent is to align the guide use area boundary with the hunt boundary. There are, two, there are currently two guide outfitter operations with up to 30 hunts allocated that could take advantage of the increased opportunity. Again, this is that same graphic of the chronology of the unit four bear harvest over the last decade with 50% of the bears being taken in that May 11 to 20 time period. Uh, so you'll, I would expect to see some shift in the earlier hunts um, to that later May 21 to 31 period if this were adopted. So in the real world, the on the ground effect is that you'd be able to hunt the Lysiansky Inlet for an additional 11 days. Again, 80% of our spring harvest comes from inside drainages, and 50% of that harvest uh, occurs between May 11th and May 20th. So the season would be extended by 11 days in this area. I would again remind you of the 2020 Forest Service Best Management Practices Agreement between hunting guides and the small cruise ship industry. The current boundaries and dates have been in place for 42 years. The current regulations have been successful we expect to see some inc increased harvest in that localized area, but because it's such a small area, we don't anticipate any biological, any biological, biological concerns. But we do uh, expect there could be potential for user group, user group conflicts. And uh, again, I'll remind you of the, um, some of the processes that went into um, consideration for coming up with those boundaries 42 years ago. Again, this is proposal 14 to change the spring brown bear hunt boundary to include all of Lysiansky Inlet within RB and DB 088. It's a public proposal. The department is neutral because there is not a biological concern for a small increase in harvest. However, user conflicts could result and the department cautions against making changes to longstanding brown bear regulations without input from the brown bear management team. 
Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, questions? Members? Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you said you anticipate potential conflicts. What kind of conflicts? I mean, the proposal to me seems fairly reasonable that they've signed up for a guide use area, but part of their guide use area is not included in the in the, the hunt boundary, so they're just trying to get the full use of their use area. Um, so what kind of conflicts do you anticipate just by including that in? Through the chairman, uh, Member Kehoe, uh, again, with the potential tourism outfitters uh, in the area. And I'm not real familiar with how much uh, tourism is going on in that area, but there are some, some lodges nearby, um, so there could be conflicts between bear viewing and bear hunting. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to add to Steve's comments that uh, recently the U.S. Forest Service, which manages all the uplands around there, uh, went through an extensive process called a Shoreline 2 process where they allocated um, opportunity to bear viewing operations and bear guiding operations. Um, so they got the two groups together and talked and worked out boundaries and um, you know, come to a, a resolution about who gets to go where when. So this would uh, affect that, that agreement. Um, Jake, did you still have a question? Yeah, I guess it's just a real quick one. So um, when a hunter prints out his permit or he walks in and gets his permit and he's going to participate in this hunt in the spring, is there a time limit that he can stay in the field? Or uh, like, uh, anyway, on Kodiak, there's a, you know, you can hunt 15 days, or, you know, two, a couple weeks. Um, is there a time frame down here that a hunter can be in the field or could they hunt the whole season? Through the chair, Member Fletcher, there's, we don't have any, any time limits on hunters. If you want to stay out there for the entire brown bear season, you're welcome to do so. Thanks. Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve, do you know how long uh, the guide, guide use boundaries have been in existence? Through, through the chair, uh, Member Brad, I, I do not know how long those boundaries have been in place. Uh, I know they were in place in the back in the 90s when I worked for the Department of Natural Resources. So it's been at least that long. Thank you. Any additional questions, if not comments or intent from the board? Discussion? Uh, Lynn. Yeah, sure. Quick question. So this is, they're trying to increase change boundaries for RB 088 is the area they're trying to is that included in another registration bear hunt or, or is there no bear hunt in there through the chair member Kehoe there there currently is brown bear hunting there uh, that but it's currently part of the uh, inside drainages hunts or I get those mixed up it, currently that you could hunt there until the 20th of May and then they're trying to add that 11 days of hunting opportunity in that area. So you can, you can hunt in there until uh, the inside drainages hunt ends. Does that oh, okay. answer your so question? It's, or a it's a different hunt number, but the, yes. the season closure is the 20th versus the correct. Th okay, thank you. Um, Stosh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I won't be supporting this proposal. I, I realize it won't have as big impact as proposal 13, which we didn't support, but still it's it's messing with the brown bear management plan that was put in place a long time ago, and I have no interest in changing that. If we want to cause more problems and a lot more proposals, that's what's going to happen if we support this. Okay. Any other additional comments on this, Al? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was really trying some way to support this proposal. Um, I wish when the, the federal side was doing their shoreline management that they would have considered uh, aligning boundaries to uh, gay management units because I think it's a good idea. I think the complexity, you know, you take it out of there. So that was just a hindsight that was overlooked. And I hope in the future when they look at making agreements that uh, they consider the guide use areas versus boundaries, you know, sometimes it's really applicable like in this instance, but uh, it throws a monkey wrench in, in after the fact. So I don't think I'll be able to support this. Additional comments, Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, kind of go along the same lines. I, uh, I, if 
maybe if they had added to close the season on the 20th, I, I probably would support it. But no, I just think it again, it throws a monkey wrench into the whole plan, and uh, I don't intend to support it. Thank you. Any additional comments? I mean, perhaps guide use boundaries could be changed instead, but you know, that's a that's for a different board. Okay, so um, um, ready for the question? Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 14. Mr. Fletcher? No. Ms. Kuzek? No. Mr. Keogh? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Chairman Burnett? Yeah, no. <laughs> Proposal <laughs> fails, 0 to 7. Okay, at, th at this time we're going to uh, take a 15-minute uh, break and get set up for the next area. Thank you.
I'm going to call the Board of Game Meeting back to order, and at this time we'll have the Petersburg area update. If you want to go ahead with that. Yep. Hello. I've been told that you can find my, my uh, uh, presentation at RC4 tab 4.1. And my name is Frank Robbins. I'm the Petersburg area biologist. I've been in Petersburg for about three years. I came after about an eight to nine year stint in Glen Allen. Uh, our other staff member is Hillary Wood. Uh, she's our program tech. In addition to frontline and administrative duties, Hillary helps with the sealing of bears. She seals fur bears. She checks in moose. She does field work. And she's uh, invaluable to the success of the Petersburg office. Petersburg area office manages Unit 1B and Unit 3. Both units are about 3,000 square miles each, with Unit 1B located on the central southeast Alaska mainland, and Unit 3 consisting of several islands within the central panhandle, the largest being Kupernoff, QU, Wrangell, Adelin, Midkoff, and Zarembo Island. Uh, Petersburg on Midkoff Island has the largest population in the area with 3,000 residents followed by the town of Wrangell with 2,000, and the village of Cake on Kupernoff Island with 550 residents. Big game species in the Petersburg area include deer, moose, mountain goat on the mainland in Unit 1B, elk on Edelin and Zarembo Islands uh, in Unit 3, black bear, brown bear, and wolves. Fur bears in the Petersburg area include Martin, River Otter, Wolf, Beaver Mink, Ermine, and Wolverine. The higher density of Wolverines in the Petersburg area are on the mainland in Unit 1B in the coastal mountains. Small game species include waterfowl, sooty grouse, and ptarmigan. Unit 1B includes the Stickeen River, and the Stickeen River Delta is a very popular waterfowl hunting destination. And hunting for sooty grouse or hooters is very popular in the spring. The Petersburg office administ administers what is currently the largest moose hunt in southeast Alaska, the RM038 moose registration hunt. The RM038 hunt area includes Unit 1B, Unit 3, and a very small portion of the southern Unit, unit 1C. Over 1,000 hunters registered for the RM038 hunt. Units 1B and Unit 3 combined have a positive C and T and an ANS of 40. Uh, the antler restriction for this hunt is probably the liberalist in the state. Uh, it's one bull with uh, spike fork antlers, 50 inch. Uh, two brow tines on each side or three brow tines on one side. We have a special regulation in this uh, hunt. A damaged, broken, or altered antler is not considered a spike fork antler. Um, this, this slide uh, depicts the RM038 moose harvest uh, between 2013 and 2022. The moose harvest increased over this period with the harvest exceeding 100 bulls over the nine, last nine seasons with a high of 130 pull, 132 bulls harvested in 2021. This slide depicts the RM038 moose harvest by unit between 2013 and 2022. The unit three harvest is represented in white with the unit 1B in yellow and unit 1C in green. The Unit 1-3 harvest increased steadily over this period while the Unit 1-B harvest has been in slow decline. During the 2022 season, 70% of the harvest or 83 bulls were harvested in Unit 3. 29% or 30, 34 bulls were harvested in Unit 1-B and 1% 1 of the harvest was in Unit 1-C. This is a reversal from just 20 years ago when the preponderance of the harvest occurred in the, on the mainland in Unit 1B. Uh, the decline in the Unit 1B harvest is likely related to a decrease in the overall forage availability as clear cuts in parts of the unit have grown to stem exclusion stage. This westward shift in the moose harvest is most striking relative to Kew Island. Kew Island is the westernmost island in Unit 3. 
A decade ago, the Q harvest ranged from one to four bulls compared to last season when 29 bulls were harvested on Q, or about 25% of the total RM038 harvest. And the QU moose harvest has exceeded 20 uh, for the last three seasons. So every moose harvested in the RM038 hunt is required to be checked by an ADFNG representative. To check in, department personnel collect harvest information, assess antler configuration, and collect a tooth for aging. In recent years, about 10% of the bull moose harvested annually have not met the RM038 antler restriction and have been classified as, as uh, sublegal. Uh, this declined to 3.5% in 2020, but increased again to 10% in 2022. Our goal is to stay below 10%, and we've attempted to accomplish this through public outreach. Uh, ADF and G staff, along with troopers, uh, attempt to hold in-person uh, workshops every year, um, and we also offered education events online. Here occur both 1B and Unit 3. Both units have a positive C and T with an A and S in Unit 1B being 40 to 50, and the Unit 3 A and S being 150 to 175. Deer dis distribution in Unit B on the mainland is patchy, but deer are widespread on the islands in Unit 3. The graph on the left describes the Unit 1B sickle blacktail harvest between 2012 and 2021. The average harvest over this period was 106, with an average of 108 over the last five years. The 2021 deer harvest of 139 was the highest in 25 years, and likely a result of heavy December snow pushing the deer down the, the shoreline where they're more readily accessible. The graph on the upper right describes Unit 3 Sitka blacktail harvest over the same time period. Between 2012 and 2021, an average of 662 deer were harvested in Unit 3, with an average of 723 deer harvested over the last five years. Uh, the Unit 3 deer harvest has exceeded 700 over the last three seasons, in which we, in which we have harvest estimates. And because uh, the deer season concludes in, in November for all of Unit 3 outside of the archery only Petersburg management area. There was no increase in harvest associated with the heavy snow of December in 2021. However, the estimated 785 deer harvested in 2021 was still among the highest harvest seen in Unit 3 in, in decades. So in 2021, we began a, began a trail camera project to estimate trends in Sitka blacktail deer abundance on Midkoff Island. The hope is that trail cameras will provide an economical method to collect more precise information on population trend, as well as deer demographic, demographic information. Uh, this image depicts 40 random locations uh, within winter deer habitat on Midkoff Island where we have deployed trail cameras. Once deployed, the cameras remain in place throughout the year with batteries replaced and SD cards retrieved during the summer. So between 2021 and 2022, we installed 40 trail cameras. The trail cameras were designed to replace the deer pellet counts uh, to estimate annual deer population trends. And we hope to be able to develop annual age and sex ratio estimates we're also assessing the potential of using trail camera technology to monitor other species. And starting this winter, we began reviewing the first photos collected from cameras installed in 2021. Developing moose population information in the coastal rainforest habitat of Southeast Alaska is a challenge. We've collected several moose photos in conjunction with the deer pilot project and hope to develop a trail camera methodology that will help us assess, assess moose population trends as well. In addition to deer and moose, we've captured several images of bears and wolves that have helped to better describe the distribution of the predators on Metcalf Island.
So black bears are widespread in unit three. The unit has a positive C and T and A and S of 15 to 20. And about 75% of the unit three black bear hunters are non-residents. This slide describes the unit three black bear harvest between 2012 and 2021. An average of 161 black bears were harvested over this period. Three drawing hunts were implemented in Unit 3 for non-guided non-residents in 2012. The decline in harvest between 2013 and 2015 can partially be attributed to the lower number of hunters after the re requirement for drawing permits for non-guided non-residents was instituted. We are currently issuing 50 drawing permits on QU and uh, 100 uh, non-resident, non-guided permits on Cooper and Off Island. The decline in uh, harvest during 2019 is related to the non-resident season closure during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, males make up about 80% of the Unit 3 harvest, and the average skull size was about 18 inches. This slide describes a Unit 1B and Unit 3 wolf harvest between 2012 and 2021. Unit 1 with Unit 1B in yellow and Unit 3 in green. During this 10 year period, the Unit 1B wolf harvest averaged 14, uh, with an average of 12 wolves over the last five years. The Unit 1B harvest can be variable due to weather conditions, with most trappers accessing the area via boat. Over this period, an average of 54 wolves were harvested and sealed from Unit 3. Uh, the decline in the number of wolves sealed in 2021 can be explained by the harsh weather and deep snow, and many of the avid local wolf trappers didn't take to the field until late in the season. This slide represents the, cum the cumulative reported wolf harvest by month in Unit 1B between 2017 and 2021. Over this five-year period, 62 wolves were reported harvested in Unit 1B. The hunting season in the year runs from August 1st through May 31st for the area south of Bradfield Canal and the East Fork of the Bradfield River, and August 1st to, August, to April 30th for the remainder of the unit. The trapping season runs from November 1st to April 30th. Majority, I'm sorry, the majority of the wolves reported over this period were taken during the month of March, followed by February and January. Similar to the previous slide, this slide represents the cumulative reported wolf harvest by month in Unit 3 between 2017 and 2021. Over this five-year period, 208 wolves were reported harvested in Unit 3. The hunting season in the unit runs from August 1st to May 31st, and the trapping season from November 1st to April 30th. The majority of the wolves reported during this period were taken during the months of January through April. So in spring 1987, 33 Roosevelt elk were translocated from Oregon to Dewey Anchorage on southwest Edelin Island, and 17 Rocky Mountain elk were translocated from Oregon to Johnson Cove on northwest Edelin Island. Elk transplanted on Edelin Island eventually made their way to and established a small population on Zarembo Island. Currently, Edelin Island is only open to elk hunting and there is one September archery hunt, uh, two two-week unrestricted weapon drawing hunts in October, and a two-week registration hunt in November. Between 2012 and 2021, an average of six bulls were harvested annually on Edelin Island, with most bulls being harvested during the unrestricted weapons hunt. Uh, Unit 3 has a negative CNT finding. I should point out that one bull that was harvested in 2017 on Zarembo Island, at that time we had a general season hunt for elk outside of Edlin and Zarembo Islands. The idea with, it, with that hunt was to forestall the, uh, the uh, um, establishment of elk populations on other islands. So at that point, if you saw an elk on Wrangell Island, you could harvest it if you saw it on Metcalf. This bull was harvested on a very small island on the mouth of St. John's Harbor, just yards from 
Zarembo Island. And so uh, technically it was not on Zarembo Island, but it was a Zarembo Island elk. They're both spring and fall bear brown bear seasons in Unit 1B and Unit 3. Though so most of the brown bears harvested in the Petersburg area are, are harvested in Unit 1B, typically in the Bradfield Canal area. The brown bear harvest in 1B averages around four bears annually, with none harvested in 2019. Uh, not represented on this slide, but a total of seven brown bears have been legally harvested in Unit 3 since 1995. <laughs> With most, with most of the bears harvested on Wrangell Island. One brown bear was harvested during the Unit 3 fall registration hunt. It was created in 2019. Um, there is a positive CNT finding for brown bears in Unit 1B and Unit 3 combined with an ANS of 1. Uh, the Petersburg uh, area has one registration mountain goat hunt on the mainland in Unit 1B. The RG004 hunt. This slide represents the RG004 harvest between 2012 and 2021. Unit 1B has a positive CNT finding with an ANS of 5 to 10 mountain goats. Over this period, an average of 20 goats were harvested, with an average of 19 harvested during the first five years of the period, increasing to 22 over the last five years. The nanny harvest has been increasing over the last few years, mostly harvested by local residents. Uh, as a result, we've been actively encouraging RG004 recipients to target bellies. Uh, unfortunately, weather has prohibited us from complete, completing goat surveys in recent years. However, I'm happy to say we were able to uh, survey the four co core goat areas in Unit 1B last October and the results were comparable to the most recent previous survey results. That concludes my presentation. Any questions? Questions from board members? Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Frank. That was really good and informational. I'm curious, uh, in unit three for wolf harvest, it seems like the trend from since 2012 has been trending down. Um, is it due to lack of effort, lack of wolves? Um, uh, remember, Brad, through the chair, uh, so that the period of those graphs, I think it starts 2012 through 2021. The first 10 years of that period, we averaged uh, 20 wolf trappers or, or trappers that reported wolf harvest in the last first five years. The last five years that, that dropped to 10. So there are fewer wolf trappers. Um, actively so a lack of effort in that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen in, in uh, 1B it's more stable. Is that trapper effort just been as, just as stable? At, at, uh, to the chair, I think that's true. We have fewer uh, wolf trappers that access Unit 1B, a few hardcore wolf trappers from Petersburg and a, and a couple of residents there on uh, and uh, Thomas Bay, but yeah, it's more stable. Additional questions, board member? I think you might be getting it off easy here. I do want to ask you, have you noticed any um, increase in the number of um, transporters that are bringing non-resident hunters to hunt on QU Island? Uh, To the chair, I'm unaware of an increase in transporters. Of course, I've been in Petersburg three years. I am aware of some large lodges that facilitate and, ex and, and host bear hunters. Uh, but in terms of licensed transporters, I'm unaware of any increase. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your presentation. And uh, we will go on with the Petersburg area, Petersburg and Wrangell area proposals. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt proposal 15, change the description of the Petersburg road system closed area. Second. <coughs> 
Proposal 15 has been moved and seconded, so we're ready for department um, comments whenever you are. Thank you. I understand or have been told that this, uh, my presentation can be found at RC4 tab 4.2. And uh, I'll be introducing proposal 15. Um, this proposal would correct the southern boundary description of the Petersburg Road System closed area and regulation. It was submitted by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. The department recommendation is support. Petersburg AC was in support, Durango AC took no action. This slide represents the Petersburg Road System closed area. The closed area begins at 8.75 miles of the Metcalf Highway. There are multiple dwellings along the Metcalf Highway from 8.7 mile to roughly mile marker 11. And beyond that, several public use facilities are located adjacent to the highway, including the Petersburg Gun Club, our gun range, Vine River Rapids Trail, the Swan Observatory, and the Blind Slough Picnic Area. Current regulation for the closed area states a strip one fourth mile wide on each side of the Metcalf Highway from mile marker 8.75 of the Metcalf Highway to the Crystal Lake Campground as close to the taking of big game except wolves. The current description is, is inaccurate. There is no facility named the Crystal Lake Campground. I've asked long-term residents of Petersburg, and I'm convinced there never has been a facility called the Crystal Lake Campground. Uh, the public use facility located at the southern boundary is named the Blind Slough Picnic Area, and it's not consistently labeled on all, all maps. Some maps say Blind Slough Campground, Others, Blind Slough Picnic Area. Changing the southern boundary description to a mile marker would make it consistent with the northern boundary description. Uh, if a landmark is desired for the southern boundary, the department recommends Crystal Lake Road at 17.2 mile of the Metcalf Highway. Again, this proposal would correct the southern boundary description of the Petersburg Road System closed area. In regulation, it was uh, submitted by the department. The department supports uh, Petersburg AC support. And Wrangell took no action. Questions from board members? Go ahead, Jake. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, do you have any idea of the, uh, the amount of trapping that goes on in, on the road system there? Are you aware of any? So out to about, I'm going to say, 11, 12 miles, there's a lot of private land. And so I think most of the trapping would occur actually past this closed, closed area. Once you get past, that would be where most of the, the trapping. Of course, a lot of the trapping in the unit is done via boat. So, you know, but there is some trapping along the roads in the Forest Service Road, but it would be south of this closed area. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comment? Go ahead, Stash. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just got a quick comment on reading uh, through the PC-114 by OSM. It, it says in here, um, currently the descriptors are misaligned and the adoption of this proposal would further misalign them. Are, are they misunderstanding this, or? Uh, Member Hoffman, through the chair, I'm not 
understanding what they're saying. Yeah. That, I was just seeing if they were catching something we weren't, but I doubt it. Thank you. Get it. Go um. Through the chair, just uh, other information. The Federal Public Register for notice, noti, uh, not, notifying the public that uh, the Federal Board will be taking proposals uh, should be out in a week or so. So uh, whatever you uh, do adopt, uh, a, rec a, a proposal to the Federal Subsistence Board uh, would potentially bring them in parallel if the Board does adopt that. So we haven't announced it yet, but the, it's pretty soon we'll be starting to take proposals for the wildlife cycle to be deliberated a year from the spring. Thank you, Mr. Okay, thank you, George. Um, any additional comments, um, intent? I intend to vote for this. I think it's a simple um, simple change that just makes something clear that isn't clear in the current regulation. Go ahead, Stash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be supporting it as well. It's just housekeeping and correcting a mistake. Okay. That, um, I think that we're ready for the question, likely. Call the question. Question has been called. <clears throat> the board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 15, Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Mr. Keogh? Yes. Ms. Kuzak? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Proposal carries 7 to 0. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 16, lengthen the deer season in Unit 3, that portion of Mitkoff Island within the Petersburg Management Area. William? Second. Okay. Proposal 16 has been moved and seconded. Um, department comments, please. Proposal 16 would change the deer season opening date from October 1st to August 1st in the Petersburg management area. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. The Petersburg AC supported and the Wrangell AC took no action. This proposal mentions that there's currently no August and September deer hunting opportunities on Metcalf Island and lengthening the season would provide increased opportunity for bow hunters. Petersburg management area on Metcalf Island is approximately 10 square miles in area. It's located within the Petersburg city limits. The area was established in 2002 in response to complaints about high deer numbers that had resulted in nuisance uh, deer issues and public safety concerns in the form of deer uh, vehicle collisions. Because of city prohibition on the discharge of firearms, the Petersburg Management Area was established as an archery only hunt area, and Petersburg Management uh, hunters must successfully complete a bow hunter certification course. This slide represents the current Unit 3 Sika Black Hill seasons and bag limits and proposed Petersburg Management Area season change. Petersburg Management Area has a current bag limit of two bucks by archery only and is open from, August, from October 1st to December 15th to both residents and non-residents. This proposal asks for a season change to August 1st to December 15th. The average Petersburg Management Area reported deer harvest uh, over the last Five seasons was six, ranging from three to 11. Adoption of this proposal would extend the deer season in the Petersburg management area by two months, but would not change the bag limit. Uh, archery harvest data specific to the Petersburg management area is difficult to assess. What I mean by this is the uh, area in which we code hunts is actually larger than the Petersburg management area. So it's difficult to determine if bow hunters were hunting within the management area or outside the management area. Uh, though we think there are roughly 20 local certified bow hunters uh, that could participate in the hunt, and um, the only buck harvest uh, and the only buck harvest in the, within the management area would not likely impact the overall Metcalf Island population. 
Again, this uh, proposal would change the deer season opening from August, October 1st to August 1st in the Petersburg management area. It's a public proposal, department's neutral. Thank you. Um, so what's the land ownership in this area, in the Petersburg management area? That is to say, is it, is it openly accessible to everyone or is it limited by land ownership patterns? It's open to everyone. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Frank, uh, is there, uh, is there getting to be a, a, the deer getting to be a nuisance in the management area in the community? Are they getting in people's gardens and roses and trees and? Uh, Member Brad, to the, to the chair, I think that depends who you ask, but I, I do have to extract deer from gardens every, every, every spring and summer. So they're deer in town, yeah. I guess a follow up uh, is, uh, do those deer just stay localized, or are they moving outside or immigrating, migrating from the management area? The intention, when I originally read the, uh, I think the, the concept of this hunt, uh, the idea was a lot of the deer were being attracted to town because of en enticements, and some people were feeding deer. Uh, I think that's likely still true, uh, though there's nothing that prevents the deer from moving in and out of the, the Petersburg you know, management area. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions on this one? Go ahead, Al. Guess nobody else is. Um, are you trying to manage a population of deer within the management area? Uh, to the chair, Member Brett, no, we're just trying to provide opportunity and, and through this opportunity we could, you know, maybe, you know, lower the, the, the number of deer that could potentially you know, be uh, cause problems in town. Yes. Right, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, I, I intend to support this proposal. It sounds like we can provide additional opportunity. Um, Sounds like the resource will take it, and we've got pretty much overwhelming support from various ACs and the public for, for this proposal. So, anyone else? Um, James. Yeah, I agree with uh, Member Keogh. I, I intend to support this as well. I mean, it, it's, if it's not likely to impact the overall um, deer population, um, increasing the opportunity for the hunters in that area is a good thing, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. I just maybe follow up a little bit along the lines of Member Brett. Is there an uh, increase of um, deer mortality from vehicles in town? Is that being a problem? Uh, to the Chair Member Hoffman, the, the roads in Mekoff and, and the Mekoff Highway are a, a large contributor to mortality of deer uh, on Mekoff Island. Okay, um, any additional comments? I intend to support this. Uh, go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also intend to support this. I almost, uh, I'm thinking that we need to increase that bag limit, and I would hope maybe the next uh, three years uh, the department could address and see if there potentially is a need for a higher bag limit in that management area to offset the vehicle, vehicle uh, collisions and uh, uh, property damage. Okay, well, this proposal would be doubling the time, almost doubling the time it's open. But we're year. limited on hunters. Right. <laughs> but there are 20 hunters that can Thank you, Mr. Chair. spread out the thing. So anyway, I think we're we ready for the question. Call the question. The question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 16, Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Ms. Kuzak? Yes. Mr. Keogh? Yes. And Mr. Barrett? Yes. Proposal carries 7 to 0.
Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 17, establish a fall drawing permit hunt for elk on Zarumbo Island in Unit 3. Second. Proposal has been moved and seconded. Um, please, department comment. Uh, this uh, proposal would create a non-restricted weapon bull only drawing hunt with up to 25 permits for elk in, on Zarimbo Island in Unit 3 with the season of October 1st through 31st. It's a public proposal. The department recommendation is to oppose. The department has no data to su su suggest an increase in Zarimbo Island population since hunting was closed. Uh, Harvesting of elk from this population may significantly impact the existing herd. Should this proposal be adopted, the department asks that a conservative number of permits be issued to ensure the sustainability of the herd. Um, the AC recommendations, Peterburg AC was in support and the Wrangell AC was in support. Uh, this uh, proposal asks to create uh, and the elk drawing cottons are in Hawaii with up to 25 permits with a season of October 1st to October 31st with up to 25 permits open to residents and non-residents with a one bull bag limit. Okay, this is a map of Unit 3. The green shaded area represents the current Unit 3 elk hunting area, which is Edlin and associated islands. The blue shaded area represents Rimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, and the Cachaveroff Islands. When elk hunting began in 1997, Rimbo Island was included in the hunt area, but is currently closed. The orange shaded area represents the Unit 3 remainder, and up until 2019, there was a general season elk hunt uh, in the Unit 3 reminder that I alluded to earlier. It's, current, it's currently a, a federal subsistence hunt. Elk hunting on Zrimbo Island has been closed since 2006 due to population concerns. It is difficult to effectively survey the area, but based on limited survey data and public reports, the Zrimbo elk population is estimated to be less than 50 animals. There is no available data to suggest that the Zrimbo Island elk population has increased since elk hunting ended in 2006. We anticipate that harvest success would be higher on Zrimbo Island than Edelin Island because of greater access via widespread logging roads. Uh, in 2020, the Federal Subsistence Board determined that rural residents of Units 1 through 5 have customary and traditional use of elk on federal lands in Unit 3. Proposals have been submitted to establish federal subsistence elk hunt in Unit 3, and in 2022, the Federal Subsistence Board established a registration elk hunt in Unit 3 outside of Edelton's Rimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, and the Cachaveroff Islands, open to residents of 1 through 5. Again, this proposal would create a bull-only drawing hunt with up to 25 permits for elk on Zarembo Island in Unit 3. The season of October 1st through 31st, it's a public proposal. Uh, the department recommendation is to oppose. Uh, Petersburg AC was in support and the Wrangell AC was in support. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Frank, question would be if, if you're estimating the population still to be around 50, is there a harvestable surplus in a population of 50? So I've been a biologist for 30, pushing 30 years. I did one time manage the uh, Chitna bison herd, and year in and year out, we would fly over the Chitna bison herd and count 50 animals. We issued two permits annually. The, the management objective for these elk herds is to uh, manage the populations below carrying capacity, uh, provide opportunity, and post-harvest maintain a bull cow ratio of 25 to 30 bulls. The difficulty is trying to assess what the current bull cow ratio, how many there are and what the count bull cow ratio is. Theoretically, it would be possible to manage that. Um, Al, go ahead. Yeah, thank you all. 
So my question, Frank, is uh, you, you were estimating the elk population in 2006 at just under uh, 50 or 50 carib or 50 elk. Um, so what would you base on normal productivity, normal mortality? What would you estimate the population in 2023? Member Barrett, to the chair, we really don't know. I can tell you the, the most I've seen on it. So uh, in the winter, early spring, uh, the elk like the intertidal zone. We've heard uh, people talk about getting trail camera photos on the beach. So I attempt to fly surveys during that period and hopefully try to catch them out on the intertidal zone. The most I've ever counted is 23. Uh, I get regular reports from fishermen. Uh, one fisherman in particular who keeps a, has kept an eye on that elk herd for uh, years. Uh, he saw about 35 last winter with seven bulls. One particularly large bull, I think everyone that had been in a boat and along the shoreline had seen. <laughs> had seen. So uh, that's some of the best information that I get. When we had a deep... Uh, snow in December last year, I was excited because I thought, oh boy, you know, all the elk on the rim are going to be down on the shoreline. And we took off and the further south we got on Metcalf, the less and less snow. We were wallowing in snow on the north end of Metcalf. By the time I got to Zaremba, there was no snow. And so we flew around <laughs> forever and, and thought we saw one elk. They're really difficult to, to find. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to add to the discussion a little bit, you know, as uh, elk were originally put on Edelin, they moved over to Zrimbo. There was a hunt there for a while. Harvest was uh, fairly low, um, closed in 2006 because of concerns about low numbers based on the information we knew. And that, you know, it's just very simple. We, we can't count them. You know, we've tried. Um, and we've also made additional efforts to get out to Edelin and Zrimbo um, to collar elk, and we are largely unsuccessful there uh, because of the same reason, finding them and then having an opportunity to, to actually get a dart on them and get them in the ground. It, it, this is a, I, I think back to previous boards and discussions in the southeast, and um, an example that comes to my mind is the Cleveland Planinza goats, where we had a small goat population. Um, we did not recommend hunting it. Um, however, the, the board adopted it. One thing we had going there was we actually knew how many animals were on the ground, or a minimum count, I should say, because we, we could count those. This one's definitely, um, you know, a little bit, it, it's a little bit of a black box for everybody. The department certainly has to shoulder some responsibility because we haven't, you know, we haven't figured it out. It's not for a lack of trying to determine what's out there, but we haven't figured out the mousetrap to get us there. Um, and I would fall back that we have to, you know, we. We do have a responsibility, even small populations, to make sure we do it, manage appropriately, whether that includes harvest or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Ryan. Um, question for you: We do you know what the cause of what the main causes of mortality is? Do we? <clears throat> we don't know how many calves are being born every year. We don't know what the main cause is. The why hasn't the population grown? We don't know. Right? I think the, the correct answer is that we don't know. And what can we do to get more knowledge? And would a limited draw hunt, you know, I think this proposal asks for 25 permits, up to 25. Maybe it's only two. Um, would that provide us potentially some information? Because there'd be someone on the ground. Um, are there really 50, or are there 40, or are there 60? Are we limited by habitat? Are we limited by weather events? Is there predation on the island? I and mean, what's the answer? Um, in an isolated population hasn't grown. Um, it looks like there should be food here. There's deer on the island, right? What's the deer population doing? Uh, to the chair. I I can say, based on harvest information, uh, uh, 
between 2012 and 2016, the, the harvest averaged about 230. Uh, over the last five years, it declined to about 190, though the number of hunters also declined. Uh, so I looked at, as Steve mentioned, I looked at days per deer. And between 2012 and 2016, it was 3.5 days per deer. Uh, between 2017 and 2021, it was three days per deer. So it actually go, went down. So Zerimbo is still providing a, a very good uh, deer hunting opportunity. So, so it's good deer habitat. Are the deer eating, eating the elk's food, keeping them out? I mean, really, it's, it's, it's something we don't know the answer to, and you don't apparently know the answer to. So <clears throat> it, would be, it would be good to have some information, but maybe elk just don't belong there. And maybe it's just not an appropriate place for elk, and they were an introduced species. They're not supposed to be there anyway. Right? It wasn't the plan. So my question is, why not hunt a bull? You know, maybe the harvestable surplus is one or two, but obviously they're aging out and dying if they've been there that long. You know, some are being born. So something's going on here. If you had a herd of 50 cattle, you'd certainly be harvesting some. So... Uh, just just some comments. Uh, go ahead, Sash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> During public testimony, I know the department has limited information on this these uh, elk, but the public testimony I heard uh, with a lot of people with experience in that area noted higher elk populations than normal. And um, it makes sense to me. Uh, there hasn't been any hunting on there for several years and I guess the only other question I have, have is, and is out migration um, how much information do we have on that uh, and then the elk expanding uh, north or west uh, member Hoffman through the chair um, we hear rumor regularly about I hear uh, rumor about elk on Mitkoff or elk on Kupernoff uh, the trail cameras now are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And, you know, the department's putting out, I've got, I probably got collectively 50 or 60 cameras out on, uh, you know, around the area. The, the members of the public, I've yet to see an elk, a picture of an elk or even an elk sign on any island off of uh, Zarembo or, or uh, uh, Edelman. So we see, we hear river, but uh, no, no evidence of any. Go ahead with the follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. And so, with the lack of information um, from the department, but I think the uh, the people that testified and we heard from earlier have really good knowledge, and I'm I, I'm going to base my my vote on that. I think it's I think the population is expanding, and I think a small bull hunt won't hurt. Go ahead, James. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, just just changing course here, just a little bit. So, in the in the proposal, they had mentioned that. Um, there was a concern that the um, elk would be displacing the deer, um, which is a, you know, one of the testifiers had mentioned is a food source. And um, understanding that, you know, through your surveys, you're just not sure on how many of the elk there are. Understand that. Um, but through any other surveys, have you been able to determine um, the food source for the deer, whether that, that is um, uh, being can, taken up by the elk at all? Uh, Member Cooney, through the chair, there was a research project conducted on Adlin, I believe it was published in the 90s, and that it, it uh, uh, looked at diet overlap between elk and deer on, on Adlin. And um, browse species, we have limited browse species, there's not a lot of diverse uh, browse here, and there was overlap, it was 64% overlap. The deer and the elk preferred different things, but there was overlap. The, qu the question was, if there's an abundance of forage, even though there's o overlap, is there true competition? And if there's if forage isn't limiting, you know, it's not a problem. Uh, the issue would be deep snow winter. If you had a deep snow winter that uh, limited access to forage, theoretically the elk would 
have an advantage. Yeah. Al. Yeah, thank you. I, I thought I heard somebody make the comment there's a there's a, quite a bit of road system on on Zimbo. So I'm wondering, uh, I know we have a lot of modern technology on, on estimating uh, populations of species. Have you ever thought about putting some people out there on them road systems and just doing it the old-fashioned way of boots on the grounds and making some counts that way or some identifying some elk that way? To the chair, member Brad, I, my instinct are that cameras are the way of the future and that we'll probably be putting cameras out on Shrimp Island, largely because we don't have many boots on the ground, <laughs> boots to put on the ground in Petersburg. So I suspect it will we'll take a camera approach. Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, over the last couple of days, I got to talk to a lot of people on breaks out there that really, you know, know this country and uh, there's overwhelming public support for it. Um, this, this up to language um, I'm really comfortable with and I plan on supporting this. Okay, any further discussion from board members? Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 17. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Mr. Keough? Yes. Ms. Cusack? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Proposal carries 7 to 0. Mr. Chair, move to adopt Proposal 18, establish a fall drawing permit hunt for elk on Zerumbo, Bushy, Shrubby, and Kashnaroff Island in Unit 3. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Please uh, go ahead with the department report. Sorry. Um, proposal 18 would create a non restricted weapon bull only drawing hunt with up to five permits for elk on Zerimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, Cachavera Islands with a season September 15th to October 15th. It's a public proposal. Uh, the department recommendation is to, pose, is to oppose uh, with the same comments as the previous uh, proposal. AC recommendation, Petersburg AC is in support, and the Wrangell AC opposed. Again, this is the same map from the previous uh, proposal showing uh, Ellen current uh, elk hunting area, uh, Ellen Island, uh, the proposed hunt areas, Rimbo Island, and uh, Unit 3 remainder. Um, this proposed uh, hunt structure would uh, have the hunt area of Zerimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, and the Cachavera Islands. Draw permits uh, up to five uh, with a, a resident season and non resident season of September 15th to October 15th, and one bull by permit. Uh, again, elk hunting on Zerimbo Island has been closed since 2006. Uh, the same information from the previous proposal. And the Federal uh, Subsistence Board uh, has been, uh, uh, or recent proposals have been submitted to the Federal Subsistence Board on Unit 3 out. Again, this proposal would create a bull only drawing hunt with up to five permits for elk on Zerimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, Cachavera Islands with the season of September 15th to October 15th. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is opposed. Uh, the, P the Petersburg AC was in support and the Wrangell AC opposed. Thank you. Um, questions from the from board members for the department. 
Um, I was going to point out that we just established a drawing permit hunt on Zarembo with the different dates. And if we were to do this, it would be somewhat in conflict. It might be appropriate to think of an amendment to this that would, if we were going to go forward with it, that did not include Zarembo Island. And um, maybe align the seasons dates with what we have done on Zarembo. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Frank, do, <clears throat> does the department have any information on elk population on the other other islands other than Zarembo? Member Keo, through the chair, no. And I, to be honest, I tried to look up the history of why those were even, you know, mentioned, and I and I don't know. But in, in current regulations, it says elk hunting is closed on Zrembo, Bushy, Shrevy, and the Cachaveroff Islands. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think we took a, a pretty big leap just on the, the previous proposal. Um, I know the, they still had up to language, only five on this. I think Zrembo is a start to at least see if we can get an accurate population uh, estimate and maybe provide a little bit of additional opportunity, but uh, so this time I, I don't plan on supporting Proposal 18. Other board members? Go ahead, Stosh. Yeah, thank you. I, I got that a same concept as um, Member Kehoe. Um, we, I think we done quite a bit here. It's a big change, and I'd like to see what happens here before we do anything else. Any additional member comments? Go ahead, Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Member Keo and, and Member Hoffman's comments are pretty wise. I'm kind of leaning that way as well. Yeah. Any any additional? If not, um, I guess we're ready for the question on this one. Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board on Proposal 18? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 18. Mr. Keogh? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Ms. Kuzak? No, proposal fails zero to seven. Give, given the time at this point, we're going to take a break, a one and a break till 1.30 for lunch, and uh, we'll come back and continue on with proposals. Um, thank you. We recess.
Okay, I'm going to call the meeting of the Board of Game back to order at 1.31 p.m. And, uh, okay, we got to wait two minutes because of recording issues. Again, we're going to call the meeting back to order at 1.33 p.m. Go ahead, Vice Chair. Yep. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 19, change the hunt structure for elk on Elton Island in Unit 3. Second. Proposal 19 has been moved and seconded. I'd like to hear the Department's comments. Okay, Proposal 19 would change the current elk hunting structure on Elton Island. It's a Ketchikan Advisory Committee proposal. The department's recommendation is to oppose. The change in the methods means may lead to increased harvest that may reduce overall hunting opportunity because of a need to close season early. This proposal has allocative elements concerning residency of hunters. The Petersburg AC opposed and the Wrangell AC opposed. This map represents the current Unit 3 elk hunting area, it's the area that's surrounded by the red line, which is Adeline Island and associated small islands. There are currently three drawing hunts for elk in Unit 3 and one registration hunt. The DE 318 is an archery only hunt with 25 permits and with season dates of September 1st through September 30th. The DE-321 is an unrestricted weapons hunt with 50 permits issued in a two-week season starting October 1st through October 15th. The DE-323 is also an unrestricted weapons hunt with 50 permits issued starting October 16th through October 31st. And the RE-325 registration hunt is two weeks long and open from November 15th to November 30th. The number of registration permits issued is variable but has been averaged around 50. All hunts have a bag limit of one bull by permit. The post hunt structure would decrease the archery season, the DE 318, by two weeks. It would create an Alaska resident only unrestricted weapons drawing hunt during the last two weeks of September with 25 permits. It would eliminate the DE 323 drawing hunt and it would decrease the number of DE-321 drawing permits from 50 to 40, and it would lengthen the RE-325 registration hunt by two weeks with an earlier opening day. This slide represents the number of elk permits issued and the elk harvested between 2012 and 2021. Over this period, an average of 100, 
80 total log permits were issued for Ellen Island hunts. About 40% of the permit recipients reported hunting, and hunter success ranged from 5 to 12%, averaging about 8%. And the total harvest averaged six bulls annually. Non-residents received about 5% of the permits, about 30% of the non-residents reported hunting, and only one bull elk was harvested by a non-resident during this period. This slide represents the chronology of elk harvested on Edelin Island between 2012 and 2021. Most elk over this period were harvested during the month of October, which coincides with the two current unrestricted weapons drawing hunts. In 2020, the Federal Subsistence Board determined that rural residents of Units 1 through 5 have customary and traditional use of elk on federal lands in Unit 3. Proposals have been submitted to establish federal subsistence hunts in Unit 3. And in 2022, the Federal Subsistence Board established a registration elk hunt in Unit 3 outside of Edlin, Zarimbo, Bushy, Shrubby, and the Cachaveroff Islands, open to residents of Units 1 through 5. Again, this proposal would change the current elk hunt structure on Edelin Island, proposed by the Ketchikan Advisory Committee. The department's recommendation is opposed. Petersburg AC opposed, the Wrangell AC opposed. Thank you. Um, questions from committee members? Quickly, um, this is a web, there's a weapons restricted hunt here. Um, do you recall the the history of the weapons restricted hunt, is it for public safety purposes? Is it for conservation purposes? Or, um, you know, because it's limiting the number of people that can participate in harvesting a consumptive species. So it, it, there has to be some reason why we would do that, why the board did that in the past. Uh, to the chair, I'm not sure why. To be honest, I think it was, it was op to provide opportunity to archery hunters early in the season. Uh, if there was thoughts beyond that, I'm unaware. Yeah. Ryan, do you have anything on the on the history? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, that predated me as well, and uh, I'm not sure why they established the early season archery hunt. Uh, it's just there isn't a public safety concern with an archery. Well, I mean, for a weapons restricted hunt or anything like that. So, I'm unaware of any. So it's a producing a a uh, harvest opportunity that's restricted to a certain class of hunters. That's what we're doing here. Thank you. It's the way as it is right now. Not when we're doing that. Um, questions from um, board members. Concerns. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Frank, uh, how close are we to uh, harvesting our harvestable surplus on that island? Um, Member Barrett, to the chair, uh, Ellen is much like Zarembo. Uh, surveying the population is, is very difficult. Uh, and as a result, trying to determine harvestable sur surplus is also very difficult. Um, I saw 12 cows last summer. Typically, when we got, when we did accomplish at least good minimum counts, it was in uh, the middle of the summer on hot days, and the elk would be high in the alpine. Uh, I've yet to catch any elk in the alpine. I've yet to see much sign of elk in the alpine. Uh, a pilot uh, who is a good acquaintance of mine has a cabin on Prince of Wales. He calls me every summer to tell me how many elk he sees. One summer he saw hardly any elk in the alpine. Last summer he sent, sent me a video of 20 cows, two calves, and one bull. And for Ellen, that was the best numbers I received for last, last year. Um, Jake. Are there any like public safety concerns with overcrowding and, and hunting up there? Um, uh, Mayor Fletcher, through the chair, none that I'm aware of. 
I think the when I hear people talk about overcrowding, the issue is largely the elk are distributed along the southern part of the island. The southern part around McHenry Inlet or kind of uh, northwest of there in, in Rocky Bay. Uh, this elk, this hunt has been in existence long enough where everybody knows where elk have been harvested in the past, and that's where they go. And so um, I talked to ACs about overcrowding issues, and I said, well, one way we could address it is just lower the number of permits. No one was receptive to that. Other hunters that I've talked to said, if you go to the places that everybody's going to, naturally you're going to count other hunters, so I go hunt somewhere else. And that was, was his approach. But in, in terms of, of safety issues, I, I don't think there's enough hunters out there to create a public safety issue. One other question, are there, are there moose on Edelton Island? Uh, so the chair, yes, there are. We, I think, I know of one that was harvested last year. Thanks. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I wanted to swing back around to Member Barrett's question, and I appreciate, Frank, you know, we experience all the same challenges. At least we can see a few um, on Edelin Island, but it, if, you, if you look at just based on the harvest, we're probably pretty darn close to harvesting what is available. Um, the I've never hunted the island. Many people in the uh, audience have and, and others. Um, it, I understand it's a very difficult island, so there's there's compounding factors there, but man, that's a pretty solid harvest over a long period of time. Stable harvest, I should say. Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Frank, on that, going with that harvest, does the department collect data on the age classes that are being harvested? Uh, to the chair member Brett, yes we do. We take teeth from every elk uh, photo. We ask for a photo and we ask for teeth from every elk that's harvested. Uh, the average age is, is low. You know, it's two and a half, three and a half. So. But then you're getting, you, you know you're getting productivity. Uh, yes, I assume so, yeah. and and. You know, for example, the bull that I got the video of uh, last summer, I'm unaware that that one was harvested. But the, the individual that flies every year, that you know, he's an avid elk hunter. He's been tracking that population for a long time. He, every year, tells me he's seeing fewer and fewer elk. He's seeing fewer and fewer calves. And he has a concern. Thank you. Jake. Hey, thanks. How does, how does weather affect hunt participation, particularly the, later in the season? Uh, Member Fletcher, uh, to the chair, the registration hunt, that part of the, the, the year of November is, can be really sketchy. And uh, weather definitely impacts participation uh, in that hunt. Uh, though, you know, we're Lately, we've had you know one or two bulls harvested in the hunt. It's it's offering an opportunity. Um, it's an unlimited permit, so uh, you know that's that would be my concern. Uh, you know, if all the stars aligned and all the elk just happened to be out in, on the bank at the same time, but largely people observe the, the, the elk from the shore from their boats and then and then go on in the stock. But yeah, there's no doubt that, that weather in November affects participation. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Stosh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, looking at slide 29, the success rate for Elton Island elk, looks like it's pretty close to about 10% average in the last 10 years success rate, but um, if we change our methods and means, it's, I think that's, we're gonna over harvest. I think that shows, that graph shows me that we have a, a really good, that's about what the take should be. 
10%. And if we had changed the methods and means, we could drastically change that, which could lead to over harvest. So I'm, I'm, I won't be supporting this. Additional comments? Um, I look at this and I see that the, the two closest ACs and the department oppose this. So the, um, there's a lot of others. That, there are a number of people that support it, and there's ACs that support it, but the, it's the two closest ACs to it that oppose it. And so that kind of pushes me toward um, opposing this also. Go ahead, Stas. Yeah, thank you. Does the department have any history on any of their hunts where we switched methods and means and the, how much the success rate went up in those hunts, just an average? Remember Hoff, Hoffman through the chair, I can't remember what year, but at some point we were issuing far more permits than we're cur currently issuing. And 10, 12 years ago, maybe a little longer, 15 years ago, because of population concerns, they dropped it down to the current number of 125, and it's been there ever, ever, ever since. James? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this might be an obvious question or answer to the question, but what, is there a specific reason why, um, why there isn't uh, a hunt um, or a, it, there isn't a, an unrestricted weapons hunt from the 16th to the 30th there of September? I'm, uh, um, Mr. Cooney, through the chair, I'm going out on a limb here on this. I'm guessing that the season dates were chosen to provide opportunity during a period. In other words, we wouldn't we wouldn't establish an uh, a unrestricted, unlimited hunt during the rut for concern of over harvest. I think that the current seasons are based on providing opportunity or a period where we're less likely to over harvest elk. Yeah, thank you. Any additional questions or comments from board members? If not, are we ready for the question? Call the question. The question has been called. <clears throat> the board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank Final action on Proposal 19, Mr. Fletcher? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Oops. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Keogh? No. Proposal fails 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 20, split Elton Island in Unit 3 into two hunt areas for elk. Second. Proposal 20 has been moved and seconded. Here from the department. Thank you. Uh, proposal 20 would split the current Edelin Island October elk hunt area into two hunt areas, allocating 20 drawing permits to the northern area and 80 to the southern. It's a public proposal. The department recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC took no action. Wrangell AC opposed. Um, the department is neutral on this proposal because the elk population on Edelin Island is managed as a whole. Disturbing the harvest between the northern and southern portion of the island is allocative and does not create biological concerns for the population. Elk can be sustainably managed under the current or proposed regulations. The proposal states that the current October hunt structure and level of participation is creating hunter congestion and increased competition that could result in potentially dangerous situations. This map represents the current Unit 3 elk hunt area, which is Edelin and associated small islands. The red line from Anita Bay to Burnett Inlet represents the suggested boundary that would create two new hunt areas. Again, there are currently three drawing hunts for elk in Unit 3 and one registration hunt. Um, this proposal would decrease the current DE321 drawing hunt permits from 50 to 40 
It would create a new drawing hunt with 10 permits for a proposed hunt area north of a line running between Anita Bay and Burnett Inlet for the season of October 1st to October 15th. It would also decrease the number of DE-323 permits from 50 uh, to 40 and create a new drawing hunt with 10 permits for proposed on area north of the line running from Anita Bay and Burnett Inlet. With the season of October 16th to October 31st, the new hunts would be open to residents and non-residents with a bag limit of one bull. The DE-318 archery hunt and the RE-325 registration hunt would be unchanged and the total number of Evelyn Island elk permits would remain the same. Again, this slide represents the number of elk permits issued and the elk harvested between 2012 and 2021. This proposal would likely decrease harvest opportunity for hunters drawn for the proposed northern hunt area. 17% of the historic Evelyn Island elk harvest has occurred in the proposed northern hunt area, and no harvest occurred there in 11 of 25 seasons. Again, in 2020, the Federal Subsistence Board determined that rural residents of Unit 1 through 5 are customary and traditional use of elk on federal lands in Unit 13. I'm sorry, Unit 3. And proposals have been <laughs> submitted to establish subsistence elk hunts in Unit 3. And in 2022, the Federal Subsistence Board established a registration elk hunt in Unit 3 outside of Edlands, Rimbo, Bushy Shrubby, the Kashavaroff Islands, open to residents of 1 through 5. Again, this proposal would split the current Edlin Island October elk hunt area into two hunt areas, allocating 20 drawing permits to the northern area and 80 to the southern. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC took no action. The Wrangell AC opposed. Questions from committee members? Go ahead, Stosh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of basic questions. Um, all of this is boat based hunting, correct? For these elk, or most of it? To the chair, yes. Okay, and um, second question is. Um, have we had uh, complaints of crowding in, in this current hunt structure? Uh, through the chair, Member Hoffman, let me rephrase. Most of the hunting is by boat. There, in the early season, the archery season, there are a couple of lakes up, up high and high elevation that people fly into. But, but the vast majority of the hunting is by boat. In terms of the crowding, uh, I, I've heard some comments, but once again, it's largely because I think people know where elk are, have traditionally been harvested, and they go they go to those spots. Uh, you know, folks will hunt there along McHenry Inlet. They go to the south end of the island, and they'll run up into to Rocky Bay. It's it's well known where elk hang out, and where they've traditionally been been harvested. Uh, there's there's hunters that hunt from the boat, too. And they'll just, uh, you know, glass the shorelines looking for elk. Uh, that southern part of Ellen Island is a wilderness area. It's really rough. And there's that faction of hunter that likes to get after it. And they'll, they'll go and hike and, and hunt. So I think, I think I've heard some complaints about crowding, but I've also heard from folks that they find places to go. Al? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm um, looking at your department comments that were submitted in there, and I'm wondering what your confidence level with uh, what I've heard is potentially a decreasing uh, population of elk, but it says the elk can be sustainably managed under the current or proposed regulation. Member Moret through the chair, I think like the previous uh, proposal, that's that harvest of five. It, you know, we've we've kind of plateaued there, and over the last several seasons. In fact, it's not even in this uh, presentation. But the 2022 season, we also harvest, harvested five bulls, and so it, it seems like that's the consistent. Uh, a consistent number, at least lately. 
uh, under the, this proposed structure, uh, there's a chance that folks would, would uh, draw permits for an area where there are very few elk. Okay, thank you. Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I, got, I got schooled out there. They cannot go in the book. Um, elk taken in here just because they're not uh, genetically pure they get red flag <laughs> um, talking to a lot of folks out there in the in the audience um, during breaks uh, it kind of seems to be like there's two distinct elk populations here right um, and there isn't a lot of spillover between those two one one group kind of stays um, in their you know traditional habitat one stays kind of higher up in that in that uh, on the on the I guess the, the east side of the island and if we split this would that give you an extra tool in managing those two different populations Mr. Fletcher to the chair, uh, to the chair uh, back when we had collars on elk that's where we sort of first learned how these elk and elk uh, move the, the patterns of movement uh, during the summer, it would be up in the high country, uh, Mount Shakes, Mount Evelyn. As weather moved in, they generally moved south. Uh, there's some consistency there, but it's not, you know, a cow may head south one year and then head southwest another year. So to, to say that we've identified two distinct um, herds, I don't, I don't know that we have. Uh, we, what we have uh, learned is that they generally are high in the, in the summer and they move south, generally move south in the winter. Though it's true that there are often moose in the, I mean, the elk in the southern part of Evelyn during the hunting season and then a small group in that Rocky Bay area and they could they could interchange, you know. So uh, I think that's what we understand at this point. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Lynn. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess if the board were to pass this, do you? I mean, we we could actually accomplish a couple things. One is the there was a complaint that overcrowding. Um, we, we can maybe alleviate that a little bit, um, and then the people that were putting in for the for the new permit, it seems like they did due diligence. They would realize they're putting in for a permit that might have a s extremely low success rate, but but at the same time they might be willing to do it, and, and we could split the effort up cr more across the island a little bit. Um, your your thoughts on that? Do you do you agree with that, or do you? I mean, to the chair, I guess my thoughts are uh, I would be concerned that we'd be limiting opportunity. That, uh, that at this point, when you draw the permit, you can, you can hunt the whole island. Uh, I think, you know, there, you know, we know that the sort of crowding is a common theme in hunting. And... Uh, I think you can find a place to go. I personally think you can find a place to go. Um, Any additional? Go ahead, Ryan. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it, it occurs to me as we, uh, when Member Flesher uh, mentioned that, you know, potentially there's two separate herds there. If we were to take that tract, we're already pretty aware that there's a smaller number of elk on the north end. And so then we'd have to, you know, we want to keep managing the herd as, as a, a whole, you know, the island-wide um, herd. But if we really start focusing on them as independent herds, we're much more likely to have to take management action on that northern end, and that could limit opportunity. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before we leave the subject of elk, um, I'm just curious on where does uh, the elk on Zarembo and, and uh, uh, Etlin 
prioritizing the department's uh, work on getting information. I have both. Uh, I'll take a, a shot at that one. So uh, through the chair to member Barrett, um, we did a, a radio collaring study on those elk. Uh, it's, um, I think as we discussed previously, it's very difficult to, to um, get a hold of those animals because the entire southern half of Adeline Island is a wilderness area where we can't use a helicopter, and helicopter capture is really the thing that um, the way to catch them. Uh, we did have an earlier attempt, ooh, back in the early 2000s, where uh, one of our biologists um, tried to develop a self-collaring system where you would essentially hang a, something that looked like, sort of like a wolf snare, but it was a radio collar <laughs> on a trail used by elk and with the idea that they would walk into it and, and collar themselves. Um, it was novel, but it, it was ineffective. Um, so, you know, we have, we have put some effort into looking into these elk, um, but with, you know, we have to look at the resources available to the region and where we're really going to get the most bang for our buck. And, you know, it would be a big investment to try to do, gain more information on these elk because of the difficult circumstances they're in for what is really a very small harvest. Um, so it, at this point, I would say it's a lower priority than some other places. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of interest in elk uh, on these two areas, um, but I'm, I'm tending not to support this. I don't think uh, we have enough information to distinguish that there's two populations or unique populations on the island, and uh, I think it would uh, eliminate some uh, opportunity. Yeah, I'm with I'm with Al on this one. Um, I think you explained that on that one hot area. Most years, no elk are harvested there. And that could be because people don't want to hunt there, but um, more likely it's because there's not elk there at the time when the hunting season happens. So I think um, splitting the island probably isn't going to be successful. James? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I, I agree with, uh, with yourself and Member Barrett that my biggest concern would be to splitting it now. We'd be right back here in three years with folks upset uh, that had three years of opportunity at something <laughs> what they thought they were going to have on the north end just ended up being uh, not a very good quality hunt. And so uh, we're not, I don't think we're doing anybody any favors by splitting it. Jake? Hey, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm actually probably going to support this. I think that, uh, that it makes a lot of sense and, and um, I, th I think I know these aren't two distinct um, populations, but I think kind of splitting up hunter effort would actually kind of I increase the opportunity. Thank you. Um, any additional comments or if not, I think we're ready for the question. Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding costs to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, could you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 20. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Ms. Kusak? No. Mr. Keogh? No. And Mr. Brett? No. Proposal fails by a vote of one yay to six nays. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 21, eliminate the regulation that excludes broken, damaged, or antlered, or altered antlers from the definition of spike fork antlers for units 1B, 1C, and 3. Second. Proposal 21 has been moved and seconded. To hear from the department. Yes. <clears throat> Proposal 21 would eliminate the regulation specific to the RM038 moose hunt that damaged, broken, or altered antlers are not considered spike fork moose as defined by 5AAC 92.990-46B. Uh, it's a public proposal. Uh, the department recommendation is to pose. Um, uh, uh, moose harvest has steadily increased, providing both continued hunting opportunity and and also good odds of success. This change would likely increase harvest that may result in a decline of available bull moose. Adoption of this proposal could result in bull cow ratios falling below man management objectives of 25 bulls per 100 cows. 
Moose in the RM038 hunt area cannot be surveyed, so it's difficult to assess impacts on the populations as a result of, of uh, conservative management is warranted. So the current antler restriction uh, reg reads in unit B, that portion of unit 1C south of Port Hobart, including all of Port Hooton, drainages, and unit 3, a damaged, broken, or altered antler is not considered a spike fork antler as defined in 5AAC 92.990. So during the early 2000s, managers noticed that sublegal bulls were being harvested during antler restricted hunts that they were subsequently altered to meet the antler point requirements. The two methods of alteration included intentional breaks or points filed with ground down. The intentional alteration of antlers was most prevalent in the RM038 hunt area. This comprised a selective harvest strategy because most of the broken antlered moose fell within the protected middle age class. And as a result, this could affect the desired bull cow ratio. The regulations at the time failed to address broken antlers. It was extremely difficult to prove that antlers had been intentionally altered. And it was frustrating for Alaska wildlife troopers, ADFNG, and conscientious moose hunters. About 9% of the annual harvest included bulls with broken antlers that affected legality. In 2006, 25% of the Sticky and River, River harvest included bulls with broken or suspiciously altered antlers, and the season was closed by emergency order. That same year, a joint Alaska Wildlife Trooper and ADF&G proposal was submitted to address the issue. This slide represents three bulls that were harvested under the RM038 hunt. The top slide is a legal spike that was harvested in 2020. Uh, the photo on the lower left it came from the 2006 Board of Game uh, meeting. Um, and it depicts a broken antlered bull that was submitted at check-in as a spike. Again, uh, that the photo on the lower right is a bull that was harvested in the RM038 hunt. Uh, it has a broken bane beam. It was harvested in 2022 season, and it was submitted at check-in as a spike. This slide also represents three bulls harvested during the RM038 hunt. The bull at the top was harvested in 2020 as a legal fork. Photo on the lower left appeared in the department presentation in 2006, and, and this broken antler bull was submitted as a fork. The photo on the lower right is of a bull harvested during the 2021 season with a broken main palm and was submitted as a fork. This slide follows the previous pattern with the legal fork harvested in 2020 on top. Uh, followed by a broken antler moose presented at the Board of Game meeting in 2006. Um, submitted as a fork and a moose harvested in 2021 with broken antlers that were submitted as a fork. This slide represents the RM038 sublegal antler harvest between 2012 and 2021. This is the period after the broken damaged or altered regulation was adopted. During this period, an average of 8.7 bulls were found to have sublegal antlers. 20% of these had, 26% of these had broken, damaged, or altered antlers. They were submitted as spikes or forks, with 74% of the sublegal harvest made up of unbroken sublegal antler configurations, such as insufficient number of brow times. So during this period, the broken antler uh, Spike forks made up just 26 percent of the of the harvest. I mean, of the legal of the legal uh, sublegal harvest. This slide describes the RM038 harvest between 2012 and 2021. Moose harvest increased over this period, with harvest exceeding 100 bulls over the last nine seasons, including the last season with a high of 132 bulls harvested in 2021. 
This slide represents hunter success during the RM038 moose hunt between 2012 and 2021. Hunter success increased over this period, going from less than 10% success in 2012 to 18% success in 2021. Prior to the adoption of the broken damage altered regulation, 9% or 7 to 11% of the annual harvest included bulls with broken antlers that impacted legality. Over the last 10 seasons and subsequent to the establishment of the regulation, the harvest of spiked fork bulls with broken damage or altered antlers has declined to 2% or 0 to 4%. The RM038 hunt has the most liberal, liberal antler restrictions in the state, and the RM038 moose season fully encompasses the rut and is open for a full month under the current regulations. Adoption of this proposal would likely result in a future decrease in bull moose harvested as the number of bull moose in the population declines and may result in lower breeding success. Again, this proposal would eliminate the regulations, specifically the RM038 moose hunt, that damaged, broken, or altered antlers are not considered spiked fork moose, as defined by 5AC 92-990-46B. It's a public pro proposal. Department of Recreation is opposed. Both uh, the Petersburg AC opposed and the Wrangell AC supported. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, questions from committee members. Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Frank, uh, is this considered the uh, Alaskan Yukon moose species, or is it? I was looking at the Fish and Game website, and they kind of cut out Southeast Alaska. And it's Andersoni subspecies, so ca Canadian moose, I guess. So, if I could follow up on that, what? I'm not familiar with that species of moose, but uh, where they do have that similar species of moose, do they have an issue with antlers breaking while they're fighting, or is it common? Because it's not real common in my area to have such broken antlers. Member Brett, through the chair, uh, I, I don't know. My instinct is uh, our season fully encompasses the right. People call in moose from uh, day one of the season and calling a moose at the, at the end of the season. We see more broken antlers the last two weeks. As the season progresses, we see more broken antlers. Uh, and I think that may be the, you know, the, the result is the fact that we're, we're hunting the rut and the bulls are, are fighting. Whereas mo a lot of the seasons, particularly north of here, they end prior to the height of the rut. Yeah, uh, I, I was just noticing the photos you provided for us and they look like they were type of antlers that could easily break with aggressive uh, fighting. Remember, right through the chair, if I may, when I, when I first got to Petersburg, I got curious about that. And um, so I looked in the literature. <laughs> and because I, you know, late in this, the year, I would see broken antlers, you'd see holes where tines had been driven through main palms. There was a lot of fighting going on. I was wondering how I could use this information to sort of estimate the density of bulls. Uh, you know, because the areas that generally have a lot of males, there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of competition for females. And uh, I couldn't find anything in the literature that said like persistent, you know, pr uh, precipitation makes uh, antlers more fragile. I, I couldn't find anything. There, there may be some nutrient deficiency that I'm unaware of. I don't know. But I think the, the main key is we hunt the rut. I mean, that, and, these, and they're fighting, and as a result, there's, there's broken antlers. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions, Jake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess this, uh, this question is for Captain Frenzel. Uh, what what sort of orientation or, or training do troopers get whenever they're they're looking at, at these antlers? And the, if I could have a, a brief follow up, do you guys do any outreach to the public? Member Fletcher, through the chair, um, we do do outreach along with Fish and Game. Try to get to communities that are within the hunt area. Talk about um, moose, um, how to judge moose. The, um, and for our own hen house, 
Um, we get new guys down here. We try to work with Fish and Game. All the moose typically go through Fish and Game's shop, and it's just not the trooper making the decision all the time. Um, we do it in collaboration with the local biologist. Thank you. If I could follow up on that, <coughs> Captain Frenzel, if a, you know, it's illegal to alter the antlers anywhere in the state. This one's uniquely um, illegal on the broken antlers. Is there a way to tell whether a antler was broken pre-harvest or post-harvest? The trooper's looking at it. Chair Burnett, um, it is very difficult um, without, we have sent antlers in the past up to the crime lab to look for tool marks, look for um, shoe polish or whatever else might be in there to um, make it look like more of a natural break, but it is very difficult to tell and when that occur, that break occurred. Did it occur the day before it hit the ground or 15 minutes after? So. And is it correct to assume that this isn't a big problem in other parts of the state in terms of, uh, it's less of a problem with broken antlers in other parts of the state than here? Chair Burnett, this was a issue we saw in Southeast when this started occurring. Um, this went into effect about the time I got to Southeast, so I didn't have a lot of um, dealings with it myself as a trooper down here because um, it already switched to the broken antler. Then it got reduced. This was a uh, region wide. Then it got pulled back to RM038 hunt where um, the initial problem was really an issue. The um, areas we have seen in other places, Gus Davis, I can recall cases up there where people were altering antlers. We charge them, as you mentioned, the regulation says statewide you cannot break an antler, alter an antler. Thank you. Um, other committee member questions, comments, intent? Al? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, my intent is I'm, I'm not going to support this. Um, I see the personal comments and the AC comments are very, very split. They're very equal. Um, so I'm going to tend to leave this the way it is. Uh, this is an issue that we'll see in three years from now again. Uh, it's pretty common. Um, I may do, I'm going to probably do some research and see if, uh, if that's something common with the rut with those, uh, that type of moose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to lean towards Member Barrett's comments there. Um, but it just kind of looks like since they implemented this, that their harvest is slowly increasing, that maybe saving those mid-range mid, mid bulls, tweener bulls, whatever you want to call them, um, is actually working to, to their advantage. That they're, they're, So they're, they're actually harvesting a few more moose as a result of saving those moose. So I intend to oppose this proposal. James. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question for the Frank, are there, do you, have, do you know the number of 50-inch of, uh, um, moose that are harvested each year? And, and my apologies if I overlook the numbers here in the, in the report. Member Kearney, through the chair, uh, maybe one or two a year. But very few, uh, Anderson and I reach 50 inches. Yeah. Go ahead, James. Yeah, and just one follow-up question then. Um, and don't mean to put you on the spot, but perhaps the, the department can answer this then. Do you think that the, um, the current regulation of 50-inch um, uh, antlers um, with three or more brow tines, at least on one side, or two on both, um, is working? Um, uh, through the chair to Member Cooney, um, this appears to be working. You know, that we have an increasing harvest. Um, and it's just, you know, since it's a population that we can't really survey, um, having this, you know, it's, it's a liberal enter restriction. Um, so we provide a lot of opportunity. We, we can have a long season during the rut. Um, so we're providing, you know, a lot of opportunity that way. And really, it's, it's best way we can have that opportunity and sure against over harvest. No, thanks. That, I think that answers my question. I'm just, you know, I'm curious to see, you know, if, if this is a trend because 
they just aren't reaching the 50 inch mark and so you got people who are really out there reaching for it, not giving them an excuse for shooting any legal moose at all. I'm just, I'm wondering how much opportunity there is uh, for those animals to get to that 50 inch mark and if because of that, you might see the, the, that was the reason for this to be implemented, so thanks. Uh, Ryan and Captain Prenzel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up with uh, uh, Mr. Cooney as well. And as uh, Mr. Schubacher pointed out, once we get down towards the central and into the southern southeast areas, it's almost all Andersoni. As you move a little bit further north, we started to get into mixing zones. Uh, the Taku gets a little bit of influence from the interior, uh, then Haines, and um, uh, once we get into the Yakutat area, it's even further, uh, we see more input. So we actually see, even with the Andersoni influence, in other places, we see a fair number of antlers that make it to 50 inches. This one, uh, it looks, it's fairly pure, if you will, uh, with the BC forest moose. And um, we've also discussed over the years different, different possibilities of how could we provide that opportunity by thinking outside the Spike Fork 53 brow tine box. Um, we've talked about it a little bit. It's going to take some doing, you know, and uh, when it comes up. But one way to ensure that we were providing that opportunity was, and we went round and round, maybe in this room, uh, on the two by two. Uh, but that was a, a proposal we thought actually really would benefit hunters. Captain Frenzel. Thank you, Chair. Um, another thing I was gonna point out was, this is a steadily increasing hunt that for harvest. And typically you see when we have continued increases in harvest, the violation rate kind of staying with that and it's not happening here. We're staying at that, um, as the graph showed on slide 51. It's not really changing. So. Thank you. Um, additional comments from board members? If not, um, call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding costs to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? <clears throat> Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 21. Mr. Brett? No. Mr. Keough? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chair Burnett? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Proposal fails, 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 22, eliminate the restriction for using motorized vehicles for the RM038 moose hunt in Unit 1, Bravo. Second. Proposal 22 has been moved and seconded. Um, when you're ready, you go ahead and give the department response. Proposal 21, um, sorry. How about 22? 22. Okay. Uh, the effect of this proposal would eliminate the motorized vehicle restriction as a condition of the RM038 moose hunt in Unit 1B. It's a public proposal. Department of Recognition is new, uh, neutral. Petersburg AC supports and Wrangell AC supports. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we're good with removing this condition from the hunt. Um, the we're, we're just looking for guidance from the public. Yeah. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, uh, uh, this does not require board action, actually. Neither uh, this one or I would, recommend, I would suggest 23 would probably fall in that, too. Obviously, it's a board proposal. You guys have it. Uh, this is a permit condition. Um, that comes with the hunt for that area. Uh, and we've had a lot of discussion internally. We've heard a lot from um, folks that hunt over in the Thomas Bay area, uh, and we are fine removing that permit condition. Uh, it was in place for various reasons in the past, and a lot of those have been, um, are no longer factors. Okay, so that's for proposal 22 that I'm gonna recommend that we take no action on it. and. Um, proposal 23, which would go, if 
if you remove that permit restriction, then proposal 23 would be moot. So we could move to take no action on both of those if you want to do so. Mr. Chair, I move to take no action on proposals 22 and 23. Second. Thank you. We're taking no action on these because they fall under the authority of the... Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't mean to interrupt your sentence there, but I just wanted to mention for the board and for anybody who's listening that um, where there's, because there's so much federal land involved, that um, the Forest Service has restrictions on motorized vehicles as well as e-bikes. So um, regardless of what the board does, if someone's hunting on Forest Service land, they would need to be aware of the Forest Service regulations. Right. And I, I, I was just going to say we're going to, I'm going to ask for unanimous consent because this falls under the authority of the department and the Forest Service and not the authority of the board in this case. So we have unanimous consent. We'll take no action on those two. Mr. We're Chair, I move to that proposal 24, open the Peters Creek drainage, Petersburg Creek drainage for Kupanoff Island and Unit 3 to black bear hunting. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Let's go ahead with proposal 24. Thank you. Proposal 24 would create a resident-only registration archery black bear hunt in the Petersburg Creek closed area with up to 10 permits issued. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. Um, AC recommendations, Petersburg AC opposes. Wrangell AC, no action. This proposal would create a registration archery black bear hunt within the current Petersburg Creek closed area with up to 10 permits available to residents on a first come first served basis with permits issued to the Petersburg, issued in the Petersburg ADF and G office. The season would be from April 15th to June 30th with a bag limit of one bear. This slide represents the Petersburg Creek closed area immediately across Wrangell Narrows from the town of Petersburg. Uh, the closed, closed area uh, comprises the Petersburg Creek drainage on Kupernoff Island. Um, actually, the city of Kupernoff is at, right at the mouth of, uh, of Petersburg Creek, the small city of Kupernoff. Uh, there are large grass flats, uh, first two miles or so up the creek uh, where, where bears uh, um, visit in early in spring and early summer to take advantage of the, the new green up. Petersburg Creek closed area is a 115 square kilometer or 44 square miles in area located on Kupernoff Island near the town of Petersburg and been closed to the taking of black bears since 1975. It is a popular public recreation area and was created due to public safety concerns and to provide a bear viewing area close to Petersburg. Um, uh, it's common for residents to take uh, kayaks or the jet skiff up the creek in the evenings, you know, in, in May, early June, have a picnic. Uh, wait for the tide to recede and just float out and, and watch bears. Uh, tourists, there's a boardwalk that, that uh, parallels the creek all the way up to Petersburg Lake uh, that tourists and backpackers and hikers uh, take advantage of. There are hunting for other species allowed in the area, but uh, the first season would be moose season that starts September 15th. Um, when the bears are no longer accessing the grass flats as heavily and, the, and there's fewer people uh, utilizing the creek. In 2004, the Board of Game reviewed all closed and controlled use areas to ascertain the, ascertain the continued need for each area. On completion of this review, the status of the Petersburg Creek closed area was unchanged. This slide describes the Kupernoff Island black bear harvest between 2017 and 2021. 
The average black bear harvest on Cooper and I Island over this period was 70, ranging from 38 to 90. This average is somewhat low due to the non-resident bear season closure during COVID-19 outbreak in 2019, when the harvest was only 38. Because of its proximity to Petersburg and ease of access, Petersburg Creek is popular with sport fishermen. There's a very uh, important steelhead fishery there. Uh, hikers and wildlife viewers. Spring steelhead fishing coincides with the peak of the spring black bear hunting season. Unit 3 has a baiting season for black bears, and while there are some permanent cabins along the creek, much of the drainage would be open to baiting. Black bear hunting in the area when sport fishing and wildlife viewing activities are high could result in user conflicts and public safety concerns. Petersburg Creek closed area represents roughly 1.5% of the total Unit 3 area. An adoption of this proposal would effectively eliminate the Petersburg Creek closed area. Again, Proposal 24 would create a resident-only registration archery black bear hunt in the Petersburg Creek closed area with up to 10 permits. It's a public proposal, Department's neutral. Petersburg AC opposed. Wrangell AC took no action. Thank you. Um, questions, comments from board members? I'm a little uncomfortable with having um, an archery season next to where people are out fishing and uh, when you shoot a, a black bear with an, um, in an archery season, how long do you wait before you go after it? Do you know? Uh, to the chair, I've never shot a bear with an archery. Equipment, uh, it's so it's my understanding that you you know you wait and let it bleed to death so um, before you pursue it. So there's it could be go anywhere while you're out there. So I would be a little concerned with a number of people in the same area that you're with archery season Al I would just comment that none of my bears go very far after I shoot them with an arrow <laughs> that could be but it, it's not it's, it's different so anyway um, Lynn thank you mr. chair um, yeah I have to agree with member Brett you know properly placed arrow they, they don't go very far um, and it's very effective however we also it appears that this this thing's been in place since the mid 70s um, it actually sounds like it's somewhat of a developed wildlife viewing area. Um, so I'm not really interested in stirring that pot. So I'm going to oppose this proposal. Jake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to go on the record as saying that there's a, there was a lot of, of uh, public testimony, public comments that, uh, that both supported and opposed this. Good. And we have no support from ACs, as I recall. Well. Yeah, so you allow moose hunting in there with firearms then? Remember right through the chair, yes. Uh, it's open to moose hunting and deer hunting. Uh, it, moose hunting season starts September 15th in the area, and I, and I believe deer season starts October 1st. So when do people in the springtime start frequent, frequenting the area? Remember right through the chair, when we start getting really nice weather, and the sun, the sun's out, and there stops raining, and uh, it, the, there's a you know a steady stream of people kayaking across, across or taking. I take, I've taken uh, visitors across Petersburg Creek. Yeah. So. so, just a bear viewing opportunity is why people don't want either archery or, or rifle or mm, weapon hunting. It's important uh, for viewing. Uh, to the chair, Member Brett, it's uh, an important steelhead fishery. Uh, of course, the steelhead, the steelhead probably enter a little bit later than when most of the bear, I mean, a little bit earlier before most of the bears come out. But there are a number of fishermen that access Petersburg Creek, either steelhead fishing or trout fishing. Uh, there's this a multiple use area. One follow up. Um, there hasn't been any increase in uh, uh, bad bear activity? Uh, remember right through the chair, none that can be attributed to Petersburg Creek bears. Okay, thank you. 
Stosh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Has this proposal come up before in the past since 1973 or whenever it was first put in place? Member Hoffman says the chair. I, I don't know. I don't know. Go ahead and follow up. Yeah, thank you, because I, I don't think it has, and, and um, it's been there so long, and I, th I think it's not, not a very big area. I think Petersburg is against it, and they're, they're, they'd be the most affected by it. I think for, I'd, I'd just leave it the way it is. Uh, Jake? Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are, have there any... Have there been bears taken in defense of life or property there recently? Um, Member Fletcher through the chair. None that I can remember. Yeah. Uh, there are a f most of the permanent dwellings are along the Wrangell Narrows, not so many up Petersburg Creek. There's some hunting cabins up Petersburg Creek. Uh, but I don't remember any recent DLPs uh, in the area. Thank you. Any further discussion, um, questions? Um, James, did you have something to say? No, I, I, I'm, my intent is not to support this either for the spring. I mean, I, I don't know, as we sit here and talk through it, it sounds like there is some hunting opportunity in the fall, but uh, yeah, as written in the proposal, I, I can't support this. Call a question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 24. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Brett? No. Mr. Keough? No. And Ms. Cusack? No. That motion fa proposal fails 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 25, allow black bear hunting in the Peters Creek drainage area with season dates to align with Unit 3. Second. Been, proposal 25 has been moved and seconded. The department comments, please. Proposal 25 would eliminate the Petersburg Creek closed area. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC opposed. The Wrangell AC took no action. Again, this map represents Petersburg Creek closed area. Uh, closed area is a 115 square mile area located on Cooper North Island in the town of Petersburg and has been closed to taking black bears since 1975. It's a popular public rec recreation area. It was created due to public safety concerns and provide a bear viewing area close to Petersburg. This slide describes Kupenoff black bear harvest between 2017 and 2021. The average black bear harvest in Kupenoff Island over this period was 70, ranging from 38 to 90. Sorry. Uh, because of the proximity to Petersburg Creek and ease of access, Petersburg Creek is very popular to support fishermen, hikers, and wildlife viewers. Several lodges in the Petersburg area host non-guided, non-resident black bear hunters that would gain access to the Petersburg Creek drainage if this proposal were adopted. Spring stillhead and fall sockeye and coho runs coincide with the peak of spring and fall black bear hunting seasons. Unit 3 has a baiting season for black bears. If adopted, hunting season and bag limits would match the rest of Cooperknoff Island. Uh, black bear hunting, an area where sport fishing and wildlife viewing activities are high, could result in user conflicts and public safety concerns. Again, Proposal 25 would eliminate the Petersburg Creek closed area. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation, recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC opposes. Wrangell AC took no action. Okay, thank you. Um, comments from, questions from board members? Go ahead, Al. Well, I'll go out on a limb. Um, 
I, I didn't see where the proposal was wanting to eliminate the restricted area. It wanted to do exactly what proposal 24 was asking for. If we could, uh, department, why? It's characterized differently. Is it one just open a hunting season there, and the other one's to open a different kind of hunting in there? Um, to the chair, I think the proposal asks to allow hunting in the Petersburg control use, I mean, it's Petersburg Creek closed area with the same season dates and bag limits as on the rest of Cupernoff Island, which would eliminate the Petersburg Creek closed area. Right. It would have the effect of eliminating it because it was simply there to close it. Um, any, any other questions for them? So what kind of bear harvest do you think we would get from this area? To the chair, it would be relatively low, I think. Uh, I would add the caveat that down the Wrangell Narrows there are several lodges that host uh, non-resident, non-guided permit holders that they would immediately have access to Petersburg Creek. They hunt Duncan, it's further down Duncan Canal, it's further down. I, my, my impression would be they would be running up and down uh, Wrangell Narrows, going up Duncan Canal, going up Petersburg Creek, uh, hunting bears. Uh, I don't think we necessarily would have a biological concern, but there certainly would be concern for maybe some public safety issues. Uh, I think I'm going to agree with the Petersburg AC here because they're the AC that's affected and no, it, none of our ACs supported this. Um, there's a minimum public comments that's in support. About anyone else here? If, any further comments? Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 25. Mr. Hoffman. No. Mr. Cooney. No. Mr. Barrett. No. Mr. Keel. No. Ms. Cusack. No. Mr. Fletcher. No. Chairman Burnett. No. Proposal fails, zero to seven. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt proposal 26, reduce the permit allocation and bag limit for non-residents, non-guided black bear hunters on Kiwi and Cooperknopf Islands in Unit 3. Second. Proposal 26 has been moved and seconded. Department comments, please. Proposal 26 would reduce the number of draw permits for unguided non-resident black bear on Q Island and limit harvest to one black bear every four regulatory years for non-residents on Q Island. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC opposed. Wrangell AC took no action. The proposal expresses concern about a black bear population decline on Q and Cupernoff Islands. The proposal states a prolonged high harvest, wolf predation, and habitat alteration have caused reduction in black bear population. The proposal also states that hunter services have expanded interest in hunting Q Island for black bears, resulting in increased harvest success. Additional concerns include hunter crowding and conflicts in the field. From 2012 to 2016, the department offered 40 drawing permits annually for non-resident black bear hunters without a guide on Kiyu Island. After five years, the department evaluated the level of hunter participation, effort, the success rate, and total harvest of black bears and increased the number of drawing permits available to unguided non-residents on Kiyu Island to a maximum level of 50 permits beginning in 2017. In 2019, the Board of Game adopted a department proposal to increase the number of permits that may be issued to non-resident black bear hunters without a guide on Kiyu Island for 50 to 75 permits 
should the harvestable surplus of berries increase on the island. To date, the department has not increased the number of, of non-resident, non-guided drying permits beyond 50. Since 2017, a total of 50 drawing permits, the DL-029, have been issued annually to non-resident, non-guided black bear hunters, hunting with, uh, non-resident black bear hunters hunting without a guide on QI. Island. An average of 26 black bears were harvested by DL-029 hunters over the last five seasons, with hunter success averaging 87%. The total number of black bears harvested by all hunters on QU Island has increased over the last several years, with an average harvest of 63 black bears between 2012 and 2016, increasing to 86 between 2017 and 2021. Much of this increase can be attributed to increased harvest by non-guided non-residents. Um, uh, they averaged 13 bears and 53% success rate between 2012 and 2016, which increased to 26 bears and 87% success rate between 2017 and 2021. Um, males make up roughly, I'm sorry, and if you look at that, uh, that uh, table, um, you can see that the last column, the hunter success, the last five years just jumped up from, from you know, about 50% to 80%. <laughs> Males make up roughly 80% of the annual Q Island black bear harvest. A unit three black bear management objective is maintain an average annual skull size of at least 18 and a half inches. Black bears harvested on QU Island have met that objective six of the last 10 years. While overall hunter success remains high for QU Island black bear hunters, the number of bears with skull sizes 20 inches has declined over the last decade. We're talking about really large trophy size bears. Uh, during the decade of 1990 through 1999, 14.2% of the male black bears harvested on QU Island at skull sizes equal to or greater to 20 inches. This declined to 9.4% during 2010 and 2019. The average age of male black bears harvested on QU Island is on a slightly decreasing trend over the last 20 years. Between 2000 and 2009, the average age of males was eight years old, ranging from 7.1 in 2000 to 9.2 in 2009. During the following decade, male black bears averaged 7.5 years old, ranging from 6.5 in 2015 and 8.5 in 2012. This is just a slight decline. You know, if you, the trend line is, is uh, yeah, it's almost even. It's, it's for just a very slight decline. In 2019, the Board of Game increased the number of non-resident, non-guided dry permits that may be issued from 50 to 75 should the harvestable surplus of bears increase on Key Island. To date, the department has not increased the number of DL-029 permits beyond 50 permits. Non-resident hunters not using registered guide were required to draw a permit to hunt black bear on Key Island starting in 2012. Applications for this drawing hunt have increased since with 627 DL-029 applications received for the 2022 regulatory year. Over the last five seasons, success rate for bear hunters on Kew Island averaged 72% with 83% male harvest. Non-resident, non-guided hunters were 87% successful over the same period. Between 2012 and 2021, guided hunters harvested 50%, guided non-resident harvest uh, hunters harvested 50% of the black bears from Kiwi Island. The harvest by non-guided non-residents was 26%. Due to the relative decrease in the harvest of male black bears with skulls equal to or greater than 20 inch, the department has been considering lowering the number of DL-29 and DL-30 permits by 10 to 20%. 
department has received positive support in the, uh, the proposed reduction of permits by the Petersburg AC. The number of guided black bear hunts are dictated by commercial use permits issued by the U.S. Forest Service that would not be impacted by this proposal. Again, Proposal 26 would reduce the number of draw permits for unguided non-resident black bear on QUI Island and limit harvest to one black bear every four regulatory years. It's a public proposal. The department's neutral. Petersburg AC opposed. The Wrangell AC took no action. Thank you. A um, couple of quick questions. How do you account for the increase in hunter success for non-guided non-residents? So the, the easiest way I account for it is uh, that first five years when hunter success was about 50%, um, non-resident, non-guided hunters shot mainly bear, male bears. So that, that last five years when hunter success went up to 80, 90%, 26% of the non-guided, non-resident harvest was females, compared to 11% of the non-resident guided harvest being females. So my impression is they were a lot less selective. I have a feeling that the proposal was correct in that there are hunter services that are helping. And when I say hunter services, I mean anything from podcasts to YouTube videos to you know, a variety of, of uh, sources. I, do, uh, I think there's a lot of information out there on how to hunt, how to draw permits, and how to hunt QU Island. So if that well, thank you. And do you you mentioned um, in the in this that um, the department was considering reducing the number of permits issued. If we took no action on this, would that have any effect on? It's never gone but above fifty or not. Whether whether we pass this or not, um, the department still has the authority to reduce it. So. Um, our action is not necessarily going to di dictate the total number of permits. But given overharvest of females and um, school size reduction, there seems to be a, a trend there that might push the department. And is there a, do you have a, a matrix of when you do this? And that might be a good, as a question for you or for anyone else there in the department. To the chair, we have a, uh, I, I don't think we have a, a, a matrix. We do have a, an estimate of har harvestable surplus. For Kew Island, it's 84. Uh, over the last five years, we averaged 86, so it's two bears over that uh, uh, harvestable surplus. I can tell you that, that I don't want to inflict too much information, but when I, when I came to Petersburg, I, I thought about, well, what's this area's claim to fame? And I knew, I knew of the moose hunt, and I knew of QU Island black bears. And I knew that Q was known for high density of black bears, and many of those black bears being big. And then after a couple of, sealing, a couple of years of sealing bears, I just, when you see a 20-inch black bear skull, it's something to see. And I just wasn't seeing them in the, at the rate that I sort of anticipated seeing them. And so I looked at the data. And as you saw that decade of the 1990s, it was, I don't, can't remember exactly, maybe only almost 200 were harvest, harvested. And then it, the next decade was similar. And then the following decade, it just really dropped off. And, and I, I thought, well, I don't have a, a mandate to manage QI as a trophy unit, but that's what it's known for. And I started, again, I, most of the male bears that are 20 inches or greater or at least 10 years old or older. And my impression, my thought was, well, maybe because some hunters may be less selective than others, 
that those bears just aren't getting to that age anymore. And the only permits that I have control over are the non-resident, uh, non-guided. So I thought, well, let's, let's drop them a little bit and see if school sizes respond. And that, that's the history behind that. Okay, thank you. Discuss board members, questions or comments? Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, definitely from your data there, the trend's there. I mean, when you start seeing age class come down and skull size come down, I mean, you're, you're reducing your population in, in the way I see it. Um, so, I, yeah, I would, I mean, I don't know, does it make it easier if we pass this proposal for you, or does it, does it make a difference? Uh, Member Keogh, through the, through the chair, I, I wish that the proposer had called me before he submitted the proposal. That's right, because that was my intent, and I, I had already gone to Petersburg AZ. I pre presented them with the data because it was, you know, it could potentially affect folks. I said, "How do you, how do you feel about this?" They unanimously supported me reducing the number. I it was, I'd already thought about it, already talked to leadership about it. It was something that I had intended to do. So, go ahead. Appreciate that information. Um, so I guess my next question is, so if we reduce those permits and I guess I don't know how long it would take to see a reverse in the trend, but um, at the same time, if your harvest stays relatively the same, even reducing the non-resident, non-guided harvest, what option would you do? I mean, you, you're bound to have options on season dates. You could play with the season dates to Maybe take a little opportunity away there. Mayor Keogh, the chair, that's all we could do would be season dates, uh, uh, permit numbers. That's the only permit that we have some control over. Uh, you know, I would expect maybe five years to see some sort of uh, something, maybe some sort of change in the trend, particularly when you see it over the last five years that they've really become less selective in, in harvest. And uh, I have received calls from uh, registered guides who have, have suggested that they might be willing to lower the number of, of uh, permitted hunts. Uh, so if everybody's on the same page, you know, we, we might see a, some change. Yeah. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Robbins covered it, uh, talking about the the overall non-resident um, harvest in that okay, area. Okay, Jake, do you have some? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. How many 10-year-old bears get killed off a of kuyu a year? Member Fletcher, through the chair, I don't know at this point. It's a good, really good question. Not many. Yeah. And, I, you know, kuyu's... I don't know, I don't remember the exact history, but it it became famous pretty quick and known for black bears and having this super, made the highest density of black bears on that planet Earth, you know, big bears, and people wanted to come to Kiwi and hunt black bears. And I, I think that enough hunters have come, and it's not a bio, it's very much, I think, a qualitative issue. It's not a biological issue. Uh, uh, but I think that maybe some of those middle-aged bears, that those age classes have been hit enough to where there's just fewer bears making it to 10 years old. Or, and I could say fewer 10-year-olds than there were before. I don't know exactly how many. Yeah. Follow-up? Follow-up? Yeah. Um, have, you, have you considered at all or anybody ever talked about having a skull size minimum for non-residents there? I know they're not a guide-required um, species, but, you know, in Kodiak we had a skull size minimum. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through the chair, uh, Member Fletcher. It came up uh, in 2010 when we uh, delved, uh, again, I'll use this hotel, it was here, when uh, we went through a, a long exercise with a lot of different folks, a lot of stakeholders, and um, all of the area biologists to uh, start looking at harvestable surplus uh, for black bears across the region uh, with a lot of focus in Central Southeast and on Prince of Wales. That idea was out there for a while. Um, it didn't gain any traction at that point. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if adopted, one of the things this would do is uh, also go to one, one black bear every four years. 
By any chance, um, do you have any statistics on how many repeat uh, non-resident, non-guided hunters are coming back each year and, fi and finding success? Member Cooney, through the chair, at this point, the draw uh, odds are so high. I don't know that you would draw one once or every four years. And when I looked through the uh, our our data, I could I tried to look for repeats. I'm sure there are probably some, but it's not it's not very many. Yeah. yeah thank you, Jake. Hey, thanks. You know, Kuyu is a, a really special place, and if if you want to, you know, it's it's my opinion. If you want to keep taking trophy bears off of off of islands like Kuyu, you're going to have to have all the hunters buy into it, and you're going to have to have them all sold on this on this idea that listen, we're probably going to harvest fewer bears, but we're going to harvest bigger bears because of that. Um, and just thanks. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I don't think we need to take any action on this. I think the department has the the authority and the ability to to uh, reduce those permits. Um, but I am curious, uh, just from my own. I guess knowledge of black bears uh it takes a bear to be about 10 years old before it skull size is matured there's very little growth after 10 years old and uh so it was kind of going on how many were there but you know even at 10 years old you know how many 20 inch skulls you have i mean that's a an exceptional size bear Remember, right through the uh, chair, I go back to this uh, table here. Uh, between, as you can see, between 1990 and 1999, 132 bears were harvested uh, with skull sizes 20 inches longer or bigger. The following decade, it was 117, and it dropped to 56, 2010 to 2019. The total number of bears harvested also dropped. But the percent in the harvest uh, declined. So, you know, I just feel like there's fewer 10 year old bears and fewer large bears currently on key. Ruth? Would you say that a lot of Alaska residents hunt that island? Uh, Mayor Cusack, to the chair, uh, they make up about 25% of the harvest. Uh, the last five years they've been, and they've been more selective than the non-resident, non-guided. They still kill a few females. I think it was 20% of the, of the uh, resident harvest was female, but uh, still more selective than non-guided, non-resident harvest. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Al, you suggested that we might take no action on this as a result of the fact that the department has the authority to reduce harvest here, and it looks like they're going to, and I think um, I think everyone supports that, and so we probably need a motion to take no action for those reasons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to uh, take no action on Proposal 27 for the uh, record that we built on it. Second. Okay, it's 20, been moved. I'm sorry, 26. Okay, okay. <laughs> Proposal 26. Second concurs. Okay. Um, is there objection to taking no action on it? If not, we'll uh, move on. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 27 to require 100 yard trapping setbacks along the hiking trails and drivable surfaces on the Wrangell Island in Unit 3. Second. Been moved and seconded. Department comments? Proposal 27 will would pro prohibit trapping within a 100-yard buffer along all established hiking trails and drivable surfaces on Wrangell Island. It's a public proposal. Department recommendation is neutral. The AC recommendation, the Peace Break AC took no action. The Wrangell AC opposed. This proposal suggests that trapping along highly trafficked roads on Wrangell Island has led to many user conflicts. <laughs> including dogs being caught in traps. Um, this table represents the Wrangell Island trapper harvest between 2012 and 2021. Over this period, an average of seven trappers sealed 32 fur bears from Wrangell Island 
annually. The number of trappers and fur bears and the fur bear harvest has declined in recent years. Over the last five years, an average of five trappers sealed 17 fur bears annually from Wrangell, Alaska. Proposal would make it illegal to trap within, within 100 yards of the known 47 federal, state, borough trails and roads on Wrangell uh, Island. It's not an ex, you know, exhaustive number. That's the most that I could come up with was 47. I'm sure it doesn't account for all of them. Wrangell Borough Municipal Codes require the strain of pets within the city's business district. And ethical and safe trapping practices are encouraged by the department and Alaska Trapper Associations. Again, Proposal 27 would prohibit trapping with, within a 100-yard buffer along all established hiking trails and drivable surface on Wrangell Islands. Public proposal, department recommendation is neutral. Petersburg AC took no action, and Wrangell AC opposed. Thank you for your um, report. Go ahead and uh, when? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Frank, question. I mean, based, based on the harvest, trapper harvest from 12 to 21, the last roughly three, three, four years, um, the harvest has been fairly low, so I'm going to have to assume that the effort was fairly low. So, how many conflicts have we had? Member Keogh, uh, through the chair, I called the proposer. I talked to many people in Wrangell and asked them how big of an issue this was. Uh, it's my understanding that there was one incident with a pet dog that was very visible, and I believe it was somewhere around the business district, maybe near a harbor. Uh, it was a well-known incident, and. Uh, upset some folks. I didn't find evidence that that this was a common issue. Uh, what I had discovered was there were at least one issue that upset some folks. And so Additional discussion, Al? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not going to support this proposal. I think you got uh, three or four ACs, and you have a lot more public uh, comment uh, um, opposing this proposal. And I think uh, education is still the best uh, way to go. I think the department went uh, an extra step and even reached out and did some research on the issue and found very little evidence uh, of a you know, uh, uh, conflicts, so I'm not going to support this. Uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, land ownership along these roads and trails, What? who's the primary landowner uh, in, around the Arangal area? Member Kira, through the chair, uh, the primary landowner in Arangal Island would be the U.S. Forest Service. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of land status. I mean, I'm assuming around the city's business district, district is mostly private land or and borough land. Thank you. So just follow up on that. So if we were in that, past this, would that have anything to, uh, anything to do with federally qualified subsistence users? Pardon me. Through the chair to Member Keo, um, I don't think it would have any. If you were to pass it, um, it might be a restriction on some subsistence users who like to set near these areas. Is that? Does that answer your question? Well, my my thought was, if they're federally qualified on federal lands, that that, that there might be a little bit of conflict there, restricting them when there's no biological reason. George. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Cohen, the 
if it's a permit's issued and it's required, and it's required in federal subsistence regulations, then it would be the permit that's issued by the state, and it would be the conditions issued by the state. Now, uh, federal regulation does allow for uh, conditions. If a uh, permit condition, uh, it can be superseded under federal regulation, but in theory, the state would say, well, then that permit's no, more, no longer valid because you're allowing conditions that don't, that the conditions of the permit don't allow that. So it would have to likely go to the federal subsistence board to have other conditions, and if those permits don't match, in some parts of the state, you end up with a federal permit. But as far as I'm aware right now, and Ryan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if a permit is issued to a federally quali qualified subsistence user to participate in this, uh, they would have to adhere to those permit conditions. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to add to the discussion, there are no permits, though, for trapping. You know, it, it, I believe you're on track, um, that it would be a restriction. So. Okay. Uh, Stash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe a question to enforcement. Um, Mr. Frenzel, Captain Frenzel, uh, if we were to pass this as written, how would this work, for example, like um, drivable surfaces? Is that, would that pose a problem? Member Hoffman, through the chair. Um, yes, as I put in my written comments, um, I'd ask the board to define which trail specifically um, this would go around, or being so broad as written in the proposal, um, enforceability could become difficult because it would be every little trail or drivable surface. So you could use wording similar to what's in um, black bear baiting or uh, definitions that are already defined, like highway. Um, but that would be the intent of the board. If they wanted to go that route, we could figure out language that works. Thank you. Any additional comments? I, you know, we're probably going to have similar proposals at each of our meetings over time. And there's probably some level of restrictions or something that we need to do as a board, just to, because of the public concern about trapping and pets. And so really, you know, I'm actually thinking that maybe we set up a little subcommittee of the board to look at this, work with concerned people, not, and for a future meeting, come up with some kind of a statewide policy idea, how we, how we uh, handle this issue, because it's a persistent concern. It's not, a, it's a somewhat legitimate concern and somewhat not a legitimate concern in some ways, but it's something that um, I think we really need to take seriously. So, and we've had this other, and uh, so I'm not going to vote for this proposal as written, and we don't have any amended language for it that would make it so I could vote for it. But um, I think we can talk about that under other business later and see what, if we can find some, some way to address this issue on a statewide basis. Go ahead, James. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. This is understandably an emotional issue for a lot of people. Um, obviously, past Board of Game meetings, we've had a lot of emotions surrounding similar proposals just like this. And, and it's understandable when we're talking about uh, protecting pets. Um, but when we're trying to adopt ambiguous language like this, it makes uh, AWT's job very difficult. And it makes our job very difficult to try and define which are uh, which ro roads, trails, and whatnot are are mostly used. And so, uh, anyway, for that reason, uh, as written, I'm not going to be able to support this. Thank you. Any additional discussion? No. I'll call the question. Question has been called on proposal 27. And then we break. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding costs to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 27. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Keough? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. Proposal fails 0 to 7. 
At this time, we're going to take a 15 minute break and we'll come back to the Juno Haines, Skagway, and Yakutat areas.
Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Roy Churchwell. I'm the Juno Douglas area biologist responsible for management of units 1C, 1D, 5A, and 5B. The assistant area biologist, Carl Koch to my left, helps out with the management across the region with a focus on unit 1D. And we get, when we get to uh, the overview for 1D, he will provide that. I should also mention, I forgot that this is RC4 tab 5.1. The other members of the management team include Chad Rice and Lucas Baranovic, uh, who help with field work, and then Paul Converse, who works the front line for wildlife in the Douglas Fish and Game Office. He also helps uh, a lot of the other offices across the region uh, with their front line staff. Our responsibility in the Juno Douglas office includes the mainland up to the Canadian border from Cape Fenshaw in the south to Cape Fairweather in the north uh, for Unit 1 and then continuing north to Icy Bay for Unit 5. Two large pieces of land include, included in the units but not managed by the state wildlife include Glacier Bay National Park at the northwest end of Unit 1 and Wrangell St. Elias National Park at the northern end of Unit 5. Major urban centers include Juneau, Haines, Skagway, Yakutat, and Gustavus. Juneau is the largest city in the southeastern panhandle. Although the population centers are relatively small, summer tourism, including the cruise ship industry, brings in over a million visitors each summer to the area. Tourism is one of the biggest employers in the region, and many of those visitors come in on cruise ships that stop in Juneau, Skagway, Haines, and Yakutat. Guiding gets folks out in the woods for hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing. Heli skiing is more and more common and is centered around Haines and Juneau. And then commercial fisheries, mining, and logging are all industries that have supported folks in the area for a long time and continue today. Major mining projects include the Kensington Mine and Herbert Glacier Exploration uh, Area and then north of Juneau. And then the Palmer Project outside of Haines is also uh, an area where uh, mining's, mining is starting. Current lodging projects include work being done in Icy Bay and projects in the works near Haines uh, and then also around the area of Yakutat. So I just want to go over some of the uh, pr proposals and, and the species that they'll be focused on. So there are several proposals that may change how we manage wildlife in the Juno Douglas area. Most of the species we manage are found across all units of the management area with the exception of deer that are in units 1C and 5, but not 1D. There were no proposals for deer or moose in our management area this board game cycle. There were three proposals for brown bear with interest in increasing harvest, especially on the Chilkat Peninsula. Also two black bear proposals focused on sealing and baiting. Mountain goats had six proposals, mostly focused on increasing opportunity on the Chilkat Peninsula and in the archery area near Juneau, but also trying to address high nanny harvest. Once again, there is a proposal to move, remove the Douglas Island management area for wolves as is typical, there are four proposals to change fur bird trapping seasons. Uh, we talked about those yesterday. This year, there was interest in youth hunting on the Mendenhall Wetland State Game Refuge, and we are still trying to satisfy hunters on waterfowl season dates. Finally, there are two proposals suggesting a decrease in bag limits for grouse and ptarmigan in heavily hunted areas around Juneau. So now I'll go into the individual species and uh, tell you a little about, about their harvest and, and what's going on in this area. I want to 
orient you to these uh, different graphs. So, like I said, with that, I'm going to switch gears and, and work my way through our management species while filling in you, you in on how species management is going for each. I want to start by orienting you to all the data on these graphs. Harvest for residents and non-residents is depicted by the bars of the graph and relates to the y-axis on the left. The line is the number of days hunted and relates to the y-axis on the right. So this uh, will give you an idea of what our hunter effort is across the years. Then lastly, the number above each year is the number of hunters that hunted that year. So we'll have the number of hunters, the days hunted, and harvest by residents and harvest by non-residents. So for brown bear, harvest in Unit 1C is mostly driven by resident hunters, which is not in the case in our other units. Overall har harvest is low, with a harvest of around 10 bears for residents and non-residents combined. There has been a bit of an increase in harvest over the last five years compared to the five years prior to that. Success in Unit 1C is about 11% over the last five years compared to the five years prior to that. Oops, sorry, I got a little bit off. Success in Unit 1C uh, is 11% for residents and 66% for non-residents. Part of the difference in success is likely that many resident hunters get a brown bear permit for safety aspects so that they can keep a bear if they have to shoot one for, for DLP reasons, while non-residents have come here uh, specifically to harvest a bear. Now moving up to Unit 5. Uh, there has been a decline in harvest, especially over the last three years, uh, with most of the harvest uh, for non-residents. This downward trend in harvest could be from a combination of unusual spring weather impacting bear distribution, uh, the poor economy of influencing people's interest in hunting brown bears, and a transporter who took bear hunters uh, out has shut down in the Yakutat area and hasn't provided uh, that service for hunters to be able to get out in the field. Similar to other northern mainland game management units, uh, Unit 5 hunting success is 19% uh, for residents and about 45% for non-residents. Harvest of black bears is highest in Unit 1C, possibly because of its large, po large population center. We find that resident hunters drive black bear harvest across the area. Harvest was highest in 2019 and 20, and we think this is in part in response to uh, the COVID pandemic and many hunters having more time available uh, during the spring of those two years. Resident harvest is also high in Unit 5. Uh, once again, transporter availability may also impact uh, the black bear harvest in this unit, uh, as we have seen a decrease uh, over the last five years. Then moving on to un ungulates, 70% uh, of the Unit 1C harvest uh, occurs on Douglas Island, so that's one of the major uh, important hunt areas for uh, all the folks in Juneau. We have a Unit 1C harvest objective of 456 animals, uh, which we have not been able to reach for many years. Uh, it might be artificially high, similar to uh, the situation that uh, Steve talked about earlier uh, when he talked about the Unit 4 area. Both the number of hunters and hunter effort have been declining in Unit 1C, though, which is probably one of the other reasons uh, we can't reach historical harvest levels. I will mention that while 2021 is the lowest harvest we have seen, reports uh, this year, the 2022 season, 
are that many har hunters have harvested multiple deer, uh, especially on Douglas Island, and hunter satisfaction seemed to be up this year. Unit 5 has an introduced population of deer uh, from Rocky Pass. They were put in that area in 1934. This hunt starts with a youth hunt that lasts two weeks uh, of October. And then there is a one month, one buck season uh, that continues after that. The number of the deer of deer in the area increased in the early 2000s and currently the harvest is around 30 deer per year for, for the Yakutat area. Most of the hunting in Unit 5 is near Yakutat and the islands uh, just outside of town uh, and it's mostly a local uh, hunter's hunt. The management goal for Unit 1C for mountain goats is to maintain a goat density so that at least 30 goats per hour are seen during fall surveys. To the south, surveys in the Tracy Endicott area had been more than 90 goats per hour. However, there are a few management units north of Juneau where numbers are low and they have been closed until the populations can recover. We also use pamphlets, videos, and other educational materials to ensure male to female harvest is at least two to one. Uh, for Unit 1C, there is currently a 14% female goat harvest over the last five years. We maintain a guideline harvest not to exceed six points per 100 goats uh, observed on our fall surveys. And all our current hunts are based on on this harvest system. Harvest has been pretty similar across the last 10 years and we are maintaining goat viewing opportunities along, along the Juno Road system. Unlike other species, the Juno Douglas area managers have specific population uh, moose populations uh, because many are isolated from each other. We focus on the talk, we focus on the Taku River and Chilkat Range, Gustavus Forelands and Yakutat Forelands, which are our re registration moose hunts. A hunt in Haines is a tier two hunt, and the hunt in Burners Bay is an, which is an introduced population uh, that we have that we have a draw on. The Gustavus moose herd is looking really good with a population of about 250 to 300 animals. We have had a, we've had a harvest of seven, seven to 15 moose over the last 10 years and hunter success has been about 13%. It seems like we have recently turned a corner with this population the last two years. We've had many greater than 50 inch bulls harvested, which was pretty unusual prior to that. It also seems like the population may be increasing, which would be good since it was at its lower limit of the population that we wanted to keep it at uh, um, prior to the last couple of years. I was able to get a survey in a couple of weeks ago after, after I had already uh, made this presentation. Uh, and at that time, we did get a population estimate uh, for this population of 341 moose. For Burners Bay, this is an introduced population of animals brought uh, from the Susitna and Matanuska Valleys uh, in 1958 and 1960. And this hunt was closed periodically uh, due to severe winters, but most recently after uh, the hard winter of 2006 and 2007. The draw hunt in this drainage has been held since 2014 with uh, five to seven moose harvested each year. Uh, the Burner's moose population is currently not doing that well um, because of the last three winters we've had pretty uh, high 
uh, snow loads in that area. Last spring when we were in that area, collar and moose, uh, the snow was six to eight feet. And when the, the moose would drop into the creek, you'd just see their heads just barely popping over as you were, they were running up the creek. Um, so we, we are currently reducing the harvest in this population until we do see a, a recovery in the moose. Um, so we'll keep you that updated in, that, uh, in the coming years. On the Taku and Chilkat, harvest objective is to have an annual hunter harvest of at least 20 animals. Uh, the number of hunters and a number of hunters greater than 165 and to have those hunters have a hunter success greater than 15 percent. Currently harvest for this population is 39 uh, to 64 animals and hunter success has been around 20 percent uh, with more than 200, 200 hunters out on the landscape. So we're doing pretty good there. And then the, the final area uh, for, is uh, up in Yakutat. I want to point out uh, that this graph looks a little different uh, with 5A harvest being in blue and 5B harvest uh, in the burnt orange so that we can split those two areas apart. The moose population in Unit 5 is doing uh, quite well. Hunting effort is going down while harvest is going up, indicating that the population is growing. While it's difficult to get to hunter success in Unit 5 is one of the highest of any of our uh, other moose populations. I did want to highlight our Unit 5 hunt because it is a hunt that we jointly manage with, the federal, with federal subsistence through the U.S. Forest Service Office in Yakutat. Unlike other federal subsistence hunts that would be open to all federally qualified hunters in Southeast, this hunt is only open to residents of Unit 5 who are federally qualified at least for the, the federal subsistence portion of it. The unit is roughly split in half by the Dangerous River, which is depicted on this map as the darker squiggly, squiggly line coming out of Harlequin Lake. The hunt on the east side of the Dangerous River starts two weeks before the hunt on the west side of the Dangerous River, and the federal season starts uh, two weeks before the state season on federal lands. To make it just a little more confusing, the state season starts seven days after the federal season on the state and private lands on the west side of the Dangerous River, but there are not enough state and private lands to make this relevant around Yakutat. So what does this mean as far as harvest? On the east side of the Dangerous River, a few local residents are successful in getting moose prior to the start of the state season. Most of the east side is only accessible by plane, but local residents do use some minimal access on the bridge crossing the Dangerous River at the end of the road from Yakutat. Typically, the hunt on the west side of the Dangerous River lasts four to six days uh, because of greater access by road and boat and closes before the state season even opens. The state season has opened one time in the history of this hunt for one day, and then it was closed. There was no harvest from non-federally qualified hunters on that, on that one day. Um, the, the last moose that needed to be taken was taken by a, a federally qualified hunter. Unit one wolf harvest uh, is here in, with the burnt orange bars and uh, unit one wolf harvest is in the gray bars. Wolf harvest was high for a few years in unit one C between 2017 and 2019, but has dropped to levels similar to uh, about 10 years ago. The bulk of wolf, wolf harvest occurs in January through March. Over the last five years, wolf harvest has been low but steady in Unit 5 and is probably, and this is probably due in part uh, to a lack of access and a, and a small number of trappers in that area. The 
Martin are by far the most harvested fur bearer with some beaver and otter harvest as well. Although some trappers specifically pursue wolverine, not many are caught because they occur in low numbers on the landscape. Lynx are captured when animals migrate out of Canada, Canada during the peak of the snowshoe hare cycle, which happens about every 10 years or so. Small game hunting is also common in the unit with much of it occurring during the waterfowl season on the Mendenhall Wetland State Game Refuge. The refuge is located between the northeastern portion of Douglas Island on the mainland and the mainland. About 25% of permit holders don't make it out on the refuge to hunt each year. Even with the increased opportunity through the youth hunt, about 10% of the hunters are our youth. The refuge provides fantastic hunting in an easily accessed area, and it's uh, very popular with the, with the local hunters uh, in Juneau. However, safety is always an issue with hunting on the refuge and something we continually try to educate folks about. There is currently another exploration to put a second bridge across to Douglas Island and several popular routes uh, that where that bridge would cross put the second bridge across to Douglas, sorry. There is also another exploration to put a second bridge across to Douglas Island and several popular routes would cross the refuge and could greatly impact the ability to continue hunting uh, on the refuge. So with that, I'm gonna transition to uh, the assistant area biologist and let Carl tell you about the game management unit 1D and so I'll let him take it for the next little bit. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Burnett, members of the board, and members of the public. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you today. For the record, again, my name is Carl Koch, and I'm the Assistant Area Management Biologist in the Douglas Office of Fish and Game. And I've been in this position uh, kind of primarily responsible for Unit 1D since uh, 2015. And I'll go ahead and orient you uh, first to the area. Uh, you saw on the map from uh, Roy earlier that Unit 1D is in the northern part of southeast Alaska. And you can see on this map I have here before you, uh, it's surrounded by that black border uh, that the three primary communities are Skagway up in the northeastern part of the unit where uh, uh, Mr. Schumacher mentioned that's where the mule deer have been established, which is kind of an interesting, uh, we're the only uh, area in the entire state to have uh, mule deer consistently present. Uh, and then there's the community of Haines and the village of Kluckwan. And the area is surrounded by Canada on the north, east, and west, and Unit 1C to the south. It's also kind of interesting because it's uh, got the maritime climate along the coast, but it transitions to a more interior climate. So you can get some uh, deep snow and colder weather as you get closer to the Canadian border. I'll start with brown bear. Uh, they're very important to the folks in Unit 1D. Uh, where there's three brown bear hunting guides, and there's also a very uh, prevalent uh, bear viewing tourism uh, that goes on. Uh, and we had some concerns uh, with brown bear that, that came up in uh, tw starting in 2019 and then in 2020 uh, kind of came to a boil. Uh, the fish runs were poor in the fall of 2019, but the berries were doing okay. So some nuisance bear calls started to creep up, in, in especially in the town of Haines. And then in 2020, uh, the fish runs were dismal and the berry crop was dismal. And we had lots of human conflict. Bears were going in all the developed areas and uh, exploiting any human food or garbage that wasn't secure, whether it be dumpsters or chickens or freezers out on a porch or, or whatever. Um, that took a lot of time from Fish and Game staff, myself, Roy, and my colleagues, a lot of time from the police department and, uh, and AWT. Um, but as you saw on uh, the first day when Mr. Krupe presented, the timing we got a little lucky with, uh, they're doing a brown bear study and we'll have a very good population estimate. Um, 
we came up with a strategy to kind of help address this, which I'll go over as I go through the next few slides. Uh, but that population estimate is going to be uh, key to the success of our uh, strategy. And we can go to the harvest now. So in Unit 1D, most of the brown bear harvest is by non-residents. You can see that's the uh, orange bars in the graph here and the blue bars are the resident. 1D success percentage is averaged 13% for residents and 52% for non-residents. However, in 2020, when all of that uh, problems began uh, with all the human conflicts, uh, it led to a record high human bear mortality in Unit 1D, human caused bear mortality in, in Unit 1D, including a record fall harvest. And you can see that there on the graph with uh, the blue bar. Um, and then uh, I know some folks may be interested in hearing the kind of the ratios of females. 39% uh, of the guided harvest in 1D is female, and 41% of the unguided harvest are females. You know, it's, it's just not like Unit 4 where you can travel and see lots and lots of bears in every estuary and, and pick and choose real carefully. And especially in the fall, it can become more challenging when the bears are all fat to, to find a good uh, boar. Um, so in 2015, uh, before all this happened, uh, we implemented the requirement to watch the Take a Closer Look video so that people would get better at uh, targeting males and, and encourage them to do that because we had some concerns. And we can go on to the next one there. So this graph uh, shows the total human-caused brown bear mortality uh, by calendar year. And as you can see, uh, with that red line there is our guideline harvest level of 16 bears, which was based on a population estimate of about uh, 400 bears and taking 4% of that. Uh, we believe that that estimate of 400 was high based on information that Anthony's already gathered. And we think that in 2020, where you see that really tall bar there, 16 to 20% of the brown bear population uh, was killed including 30 non-hunt kills. You know, the average is zero to four non-hunt kills. We had 30 in calendar year 2020. It was just, uh, you know, uh, an untenable situation for the people and, and for the bears. Uh, let's see. I think I got most of what I wanted to cover there, oh, except that the right-hand side of that graph there, uh, sh the orange bars shows uh, when we implemented a new strategy, which I'm going to cover on the next few slides, but we did close the season by emergency order in 2021, uh, beginning in 2021. And so our new ma uh, bear management plan, you know, after considering the effects of the unprecedented bear mortality in 2020, along with the most, most current population data that ADF&G had, we had to reassess and come up with a plan because it was just unsustainable. And we had a lot of push uh, from some folks, including letters from NGOs, to please close the season. And we gave serious thought to do we need to do that. Uh, but we came up with a plan that could allow for continued opportunity and limited harvest uh, while preserving future hunting opportunity. And that plan includes uh, temporarily limiting the harvest to five bears a year uh, and EOing it when that happens. Uh, and trying to limit the total mortality to less than seven independent bears and no more than two females. One of the things that happened in 2020, unfortunately, was we had very high female, uh, reproductive female mortality, including, I think, 14 of the non-hunt kills and nine of the, of the hunt kills. So again, this strategy allows for some hunting opportunity. And uh, based on the brown bear reproductive life history, we expect the strategy may take up to five years. We'll, of course, reassess that when we get Mr. Krupe's uh, results in the population estimate and adjust accordingly. You know, I can't emphasize enough that the success of our plan would not work without the people of the public, uh, the hunting guides, the police department, and everybody. And I'm happy to report that uh, the community of Haines really, really stepped up. We worked hard with them, with Bear Task Force, to provide advice. And the landfill uh, expanded their electric fence. They bought a whole bunch, I think, 20 more bear-resistant dumpsters. 
the police department began uh, more enforcement of a new ordinance that the assembly came up with. You have to secure your garbage in a fair resistant can. You have to put an electric fence around your chickens, uh, things like that that really makes it a lot easier for all of us to do our jobs. You know, human safety has to come first and sometimes bears, you know, have to be removed. But this greatly reduces the workload on agencies and allows us, if we need to, to focus on uh, specific bears that are a problem. And it also doesn't keep replacing problem bears with new problem bears. Uh, and just to kind of say how our strategy is working, um, so far only one female was killed since we implemented that strategy. Uh, total mortality in 2021 was six bears, five were harvested, one was a male DLP, and then in 2021 uh, we had six harvested, so we did go over by one, but uh, we had one illegal uh, and one legal DLP, so still only one female, which helps a lot for our plan to succeed. And black bears in Unit 1D are super important food source. You know, other than the mule deer that we mentioned that they're, you know, still kind of few and far between, there's no Sitka blacktail deer season in 1D. So if you don't leave the unit, you can, uh, you can harvest uh, for meat black bear, mountain goat, or if you're lucky, a moose. And so they're super uh, important food source. And proposal 35 has to do with black bear. Uh, this next slide shows the, the black bear harvest and it kind of emphasizes that they're really just hunted for subsistence. There's no non, really hardly any non-resident guided harvest. It's all about the meat. Um, I think I mostly already covered the, the key points other than to say that the ANS was met every year uh, from 2012 to, to 2021. And here's the breakdown of the male and female harvest. Um, and we can see that uh, 20, overall 23% of the females on average, uh, of the harvest on average was females. Uh, you know, it was a little higher than that in some years. And then since the question will come up later about bear baiting, uh, only 15% of the bears harvested over bait were female. Moving on to mountain goats. Again, they're another important subsistence food source, and they're also important for uh, guided hunting. There's a lot of interest from guided hunters, and that has maybe uh, increased just a little bit with the limits we've had to place on the, you know, I should say the temporary limits we've had to place on the brown bear. Um, proposal 32, submitted by the advisory committee who you heard about from Adam Smith earlier today, uh, will come up again having to do with mountain goat, and I should mentioned that I really want to thank him for uh, reporting remotely. He's been in Juneau awaiting the birth of a baby and he just had a boy a little while ago and all as well, so we're pretty happy for him. Uh, and we're trying to understand uh, local population declines. Some of it certainly has to do with winters. You can see that photo there. That was taken in 2020 when Haynes had a 200 year rain event, about 10 inches of rain in several days down at sea level, which uh, uh, became 96 inches of snow in four days up high. And so uh, pretty uh, amazing things that have been going on occasionally. We'll move on to the next one. So we do uh, surveys as often as we can every year, as many places we can get. It's pretty challenging with the weather, as you guys have kind of experienced some of our southeast weather this week. Um, and we also have uh, collared uh, goats that we've been checking on over the years. And about 60% of the collared Females have kid at heel, and kid survival is about 72%. And we look and see that the female survival is 83%. That's a little lower than some other areas and a little lower than we'd like it. You know, I'd like to see that closer to, to 90%. Um, and I guess as you just mentioned, this data is from 2010 through 2020, 2021. The weather didn't allow us to collect uh, that data. And then moving on to mountain goat harvest. Uh, you know, again, they're super important for subsistence, uh, popular among non-residents. And again, I said, like I said, the guides, uh, you know, increased their, their harvest a little bit. Um, and mountain goat harvest in 1D is variable and depends on both population size and also weather conditions. You know, it's not shown on here, but in 2022, the, 
the harvest was down pretty low because the weather was just uh, low hanging clouds throughout the whole season and that, that's gonna affect things a lot. Uh, and we'll move on to moose. So as Roy mentioned earlier, uh, unit 1D moose is a tier two uh, subsistence moose hunt. Um, and that's been that way since uh, 1993. And you can see on the harvest there, uh, we've met our harvest objective, the blue bars. Every year, uh, that objective is between 20 and 25, except for 2021. And all of the hunters, or I should say the majority of the hunters, you know, complained about it was just horrible weather in 2021. And they believe that was a, a big factor. In 2022, we came right back up to a uh, higher end of our objective. The other thing that's been great is uh, we've been able to start a moose collaring project and that gives us a lot more precise information. Uh, and so uh, we now know from the most recent survey that the population estimate is 352 plus or minus uh, 94 and our bull to cow ratio 34 per 100 cows is, is looking really good. A couple of other things to mention, uh, there's a negative IM finding for uh, moose in unit 1D and a positive C and T with an ANS of 100% of the allowable surplus. And you can see, you know, we, we did close it by EO when we met our objectives 2015 through 17 and then again in 2020. Uh, moving on uh, to mule deer. Uh, in 2019, the Board of Game opened a year-round season. That was intended to help us collect samples. Uh, based on a lot of the folks I talked to, Mule deer are being harvested up there. It's hard to say how often, but I'm sure probably at least four have been harvested since we started this thing and just no one has uh, come forth with the, uh, with the samples. Um, so we don't have any idea what kind of diseases or parasites those mule deer may or may not be bringing in. Uh, and you can see that photo there is a good example. There's five of them right there near town in the Skagway River. Then we'll go on to wolves. Wolf harvest in, in 1D is typically lower than 1C in other areas. Um, in 2022, I'm sorry, in 2012, it reached a 20 year high of 17. And then as you can see, it fluctuated thereafter to some pretty low numbers. Um, it gets really weather dependent in 1D, you know, with the big river valleys and stuff, they can sometimes get out with a boat and then get real crummy ice where they can't take a snow machine, but they also can't take the boat or things like that will, will hinder them. And then of course, uh, Fur prices is a, a big factor as well. And then on the right there, um, the uh, cumulative harvest and the highest by far harvest occurs in December. And then lastly, fur bears. Um, it's kind of interesting when I was putting this data together. In 2017 for the Martin, we had a high of 304. The fur prices were I think uh, $60 or more a Martin and then it just plummeted and you can see it's been as low as 13. But there isn't a huge number of trappers in Unit 1D and it can actually change if just even a couple, three guys or gals decide not to get after it. And again, also by the weather. The other real quick interesting thing was, uh, you know, over time we only ever hit uh, double digits for links, maybe four or five times until 2019 and 2020 when we had 25 and then 26 before it, it dropped again. It's a real big bump there, probably related to the snowshoe hair cycle. And with that, I guess, questions for either of us, right? Yeah. Any questions from board members on overview? Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. So question for you <clears throat> on your moose dad and stuff. It looks like your calf to cow ratio is anywhere from high teens to low 20s. Uh, so do you consider those populations stable, increasing, declining, or how are you, uh, I mean, most places are looking for a little bit of higher calf to cow ratios than that to be stable or increasing. Uh, are you talking about 1D or, or his number? Well, I was just kind of- In, in 1D it was low this year, was uh, 16, and that's uh, toward the low end, it does fluctuate a lot. Um, yeah, but uh, I'd like to see it higher than that. It can, it can be somewhat low in, in 1D. Okay. No other questions? Okay, Al. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question's for Roy on, I guess, slide 12. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a, a harvestable surplus for your goats in that area? Uh, through the chair, uh, Member Mer Burnett, um, I think the harvestables surplus for all of 1C, if I could add it up real quick, would be uh, 70 animals does that give you concern about meeting the subsistence issues with the, the non-resident participation that you have in there through the chair um, mr. Burnett um we hadn't, we haven't really had uh, complaints about folks not being able to get a goat who wanted to. Um, you know, the one thing about goat hunting is that it's very, uh, as you probably know, uh, affected by the weather, uh, and especially in the last three years, the weather has been uh, really bad for September and October, which is when most of our ghost goat harvest uh, by resident hunters would occur, um, and so. I think that's more of a weather impact than uh, a fact of um, people not being able to get out. It's just that they didn't want to get out due to weather mostly. So if I could remind you, um, Al, much of the goat harvest in 1C occurs in the Juno non-subsistence area. Oh, I was just looking at the <laughs> ANS on the slide 12. Go ahead, Ryan. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also point out that we leave goat points on the ground every year. I mean, there's quite a bit of opportunity. Uh, doesn't necessarily equate to the number of dead goats, um, but, you know, other than a few places we've shut down because of lower um, observations, there's ample opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, Jake. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a couple questions for about 1D to you, Carl. Um, they're about black bear. I saw a couple of your slides there. Uh, you said that, uh, uh, you know, folks down there depend on black bear as like a, a source of, of food. Um, it looked there that you have a lot of resident participation. They're doing a really good job of killing, killing boars compared to sows. Is that a conscious effort by, by residents or do you have any idea about that kind of? That's a great question. Um, I would think maybe over bait it is um, and maybe outside of bait as well, but uh, I also think probably the population may be a little more biased toward males. It, it's hard to say for sure. We have, um, Anthony did collect some data, but we haven't looked at that. I think he did say, was a, uh, actually, I think he said it was biased toward a little toward females with his bait, uh, with his stuff there. But uh, um, I think they're looking for, you know, a big meaty animal, not a, not a trophy skull or beautiful hide or anything like that. And they also, the bulk of the harvest occurs in the uh, spring when they, uh, it's eat much easier, of course, to tell them apart when they don't have a lot of fat on them yet, to tell a male from a female. Thanks, one more quick question too. Um, when we're talking about brown bear, how, do, do you have a feeling for how many brown bear actually leave that unit to find prime denning country? Uh, you know, Anthony Krupe's research, uh, he seems to think that the majority of them stay in the unit. Some of them do come out and, when they're out of the den and go and come back, but for den-wise, they, most of them do stay in the unit. And, uh, it's, you know, I wouldn't say it's a closed population, but there's not a lot of back and forth outside of the unit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think 
Bell, one more question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, uh, this one's for uh, Carl. On slide 27, uh, I think that's your more recent bear management plan. You're temporarily having a harvest limit of five bears. Um, is that for just residents only? No, that's that's for everybody. Yeah, it's been it's definitely a challenge. Um, we worked with trying to notify the guides, and uh, I've had some conversations, you know, with clients who made it pretty clear where things are at, and they'll check in with you pretty frequently before they they so, uh, travel. So um, how do you justify that with an ANS of three to six and comply with subsistence? Yeah, it's a temporary uh, method to try and recover the harvest opportunity. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. That's okay. Thank okay. you. Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the chair, member Brett, uh, the ANS is three to five, and so we're we're actually meeting it even with the five, you know the no more than seven bears. Um, if we get to the two female bears, probably have to have a different discussion. Okay, I think well, then we're ready to start on Juneau area proposals. Mr. Chair, move to adopt proposal 28, change the hunt boundary from Little Sheep Creek to Sheep Creek for the RG014 goat hunt in Unit 1, Charlie. Second. Been moved and seconded, proposal 28. Um, the department comment, please. Just one second. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. Uh, in your um, meeting notes, this is RC4 tab 5.2. So proposal 28, this proposal, if adopted, would move the boundary of RG014 from the south bank of Little Sheep Creek to the south bank of Sheep Creek. It's a public proposal that the department is neutral on. The Juno Douglas AEC supported this proposal at uh, with a nine to zero vote with six abstaining. The RG014 archery hunt opened in 1999 and the proponent of this proposal believes that it is difficult to determine the hunt unit boundary in the upper reaches of Little Sheep Creek. They believe the south bank of Sheep Creek is an easier boundary to determine. Weather often has the greatest impact on mountain goat hunter participation. At first, it took a bit for the RG014 archery hunt to gain popularity, but by 2016, with good weather, it did. 2018 was also a good weather year, while 2019, 20, and especially 2021 were bad weather that contributed to low mountain goat hunt participation in those years. The whole of RG014 is depicted on the right with the area in question on the left. The part of Little Sheep Creek for which the proposal was written is contained in the dark blue circle. If the boundary is moved to the south bank of Sheep Creek, it will add to the, the, area, uh, the area in the, harsh, in the hash marks uh, up to the light blue line. The additional area is uh, roughly about three square miles.
There will be no goat hunting allowed within a quarter mile of the coastline due to an existing hunting closure for big game along the Juneau coastline. However, this will open up heavily used goat wintering areas uh, to hunting. This area also contains areas that are habitually used by goats that would allow them to be easily harvested by archery hunters. We also expect that there would be user conflict in this area as it is an area consistently used by locals and some tourists for sightseeing and for goat viewing. This area is small enough that there are not goats counted when we do our survey flights and it would not contribute to the number of goat points allowed for harvest in the RG014 hunt area. Because of the potential of local population depletion due to a concentrated winter goat population with habitual use patterns, the department suggests an amendment that would clear up the Little Sheep Creek boundary but not include the susceptible goat hump habitat. This boundary would follow the south bank of Little Sheep Creek up to the 2,000 foot contour and then follow the contour around the west to the ridge that leads up to West Peak. The crest of this ridge is the boundary up to West Peak. Elevation contours are not a unique boundary feature uh, as they are also used to define the boundary of an, on Blackerby Ridge in another portion of RG014. So this is proposal 28 on the Little Sheep Creek boundary of RG014. It's a public proposal and the department is neutral because it does not expect population level impacts uh, from this proposal, even though there, there may be uh, local population impacts. The Juno Douglas AC supported this uh, with a nine four to zero with six abstaining uh, vote. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Uh Questions from board members? Go ahead, Jake. Um, we, we had some, some public comment about, you know, wintering grounds, and, and you spoke to that too on your, on your proposal. Um, when we're talking about, like, like general general area acreage or whatever like that what what does this change propose as far as like you know i guess area on the ground do you have any idea uh through the chair i guess i'm not quite sure what you're asking I, it it would add about three square acres uh to the hunt area that's perfect thanks Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Has there been a, a lot of, well, maybe I should, either the department or law enforcement, has there been really an issue with the current boundary um, with hunters? Through the chair, I don't know of any uh, citations because of the current boundary uh, in this area. Go ahead, Stosh. Thank you. And just to clarify, this has been in place since 2015. The current, the current um, boundary, RG014. Through the chair, um, Member Hoffman, I think it's been longer than that. Uh, the RG014 archery hunt area opened in 1999, so I think it would have been then. So. All right. Thank you. And, and um, so there's a road going in here for viewing. Is that a public road or a private road? Yeah, through the chair, Member Hoffman, that's a private road, although it does get used uh, by some public that some who have asked and some who haven't. Although not to drive, sorry, to walk on. Additional uh, questions, comments? I, I have to make one little comment here. That this is Sheep Creek. It really should be Goat Creek. They, the, the miners didn't see that know the difference. So it has all history there. There's no sheep in the area. Yeah. But 
Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just for my own clarification, so this proposed amendment that you were talking about, that's something the department came up with to kind of take care of some of your concerns? Yeah, through the chair, Member Keo, that, that's correct. Um, it, yeah, if you guys decided that um, you did think there might be some confusion uh, on defining the, that area, that would be another solution that would, would be more definable uh, but not include the area that I have concerns about. Okay, thank you. So to be clear, your testimony was that this would not change the local harvest. It might change the localized harvest, but it wouldn't ch change the area harvest if this were to occur. Yeah, through the chair to the chair, that, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone, uh, Stasia, there's something else? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This, um, I don't see a lot of problems with this the way it is, and it's been in place for a long time, and it's, it's, you can get to it from Juneau. Looks like it's a popular viewing area, and I, I, don't, I don't like to change things that's been in place for a long time and that aren't causing that much of a problem, and I don't see that it is. Uh, Jake. Thank you, Chair. Do we have it? Do you have any idea of like the, the numbers of folks that go up there just to look at look at goats during the time frame that this this hunt takes place? Yeah, through the chair. Um, I know of a lot of people who go up there to hunt, or sorry, to view goats uh, very regularly, like um, once a week even. But I don't know if it's necessarily during the hunting season, but especially in the winter time when the goats do come down, uh, there are some people that hike up there quite regularly uh, to see them. Local folks. Thanks. Uh, Stash. Yeah, thank you. I forgot to add the. I thought one of the more important parts of my notes here is it's private road, so that I think I could see problems going on later if, if we adopted this and just really rather leave it alone. Well, I intended to support it, if, especially if the amendment was added, but um, it's not important to me, but it, it was supported by the Juno Douglas Advisory Committee. It's not going to really have much of an effect on the, thing, the things. And I, I don't see a lot of people hiking up to look at goats in, when, during hunting season or in that time of year. You watch them from the road at certain times of year, and some people go up when they're come down, and especially in late winter, they'll be down where you can see them. But um, I don't see a big conflict with changing this if if that's what the advisory committee recommends. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll make an amendment to uh, use the extra language that the department mentioned. I don't I don't have it in front of me, uh, so they'd have to provide that to us. But to uh, kind of relieve their concerns on on getting it too far into the area where people are accessing or viewing or whatever. Um, and I'll just do that just for sake of discussion. Second. The amendment's been moved and second. Discussion on the amendment. Go ahead, Lynn. So like, like the chairman mentioned, the uh, Juno Douglas AC supported this proposal. Um, maybe their boundary was a little bit wide and and uh, using the department's uh, amendment should still s satisfy what they were trying to accomplish there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would support the amendment also. I think it's a compromise. I would clarify just for the record that we use, uh, the department will use the language that uh, coincides with figure 28-2 in, in their a and &R. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion on the amendment? Jake? Hey, uh, thank you. And just, just to clarify, does, does the amendment, I, I, I think the original proposer here kind of wanted to simplify the boundary. And are we making a kind of a more difficult boundary, harder to find? It's my understanding from the, propo from the, uh, that from the department that this simplifies the boundary but doesn't expand it as much. Thank you. Go ahead, Al. Call the question. Questions called on the amendment. Would you call?
follow the roll, Christy. Yes, Mr. Chairman, on that amendment to change the boundary per the department's The department's comment. recommendation, yeah. Um, Mr. Barrett. Yes. Mr. Keough. Yes. Ms. Cusack. Yes. Mr. Fletcher. Yes. Chairman Burnett. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Cooney. Yes. Amendment carries seven to zero. Okay, the amended proposal is before us now. Any discussion on the amended proposal? Al? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, uh, I'm going to support this amendment. I think there was uh, uh, the department took out their problem area. I think the area is still definable than what it was before, and I think it is a good compromise again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Stosh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm opposed to this, and um, if I would have seen, uh, looks like we're meeting, we have stable harvest right now, and there's no one saying they're not getting enough goat meat, and um, it's been in place for a long time, and this private road stuff, I, I think we're, I'm not sure where this is going to go if we adopt this, so I think it's good the way it is. Additional discussion on the proposal as amended. Ruth. Yes, I just wanted to say I agree with uh, Member Stosh. Okay. Well, Call the question. Question has been called. Christy, would you oh, go ahead, uh, Ruth? The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 28 as amended. Mr. Keogh? Yes. Ms. Kusak? No. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? No. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. That proposal carries as amended 5 to 2. Thank you. Mr. Chair, move to adopt proposal 29, expand the hunt area of the RG014 archery goat hunt in units 1, Charlie. Second. Proposal 29 has been moved and seconded from department's response, please. Yeah, thank you. This proposal would open up the area north and west of Blackaby Ridge, almost up to the Mendenhall Glacier. It is a public proposal that the department is neutral on. The local AC did not discuss this proposal. This area has been closed to goat hunting since 1984, and there are two established uh, areas closed to goat, goat hunting areas on uh, each side of this proposal, which are the Mount Bullard and Mount Juno closed areas. The RG014 archery hunt opened up in 1999. And like most hunts in, south, in Southeast, the hunt is managed on a point system. During the fall surveys, for every 100 goats that are counted, there are six points allowed for harvest. During the harvest, a billy is worth one point, while a nanny is worth two points. Based on the typical count from the proposed area, we expect that the addition of this area would add one to two points to the hunt. This is the same graph that you saw in the last proposal, but uh, weather often has the greatest impact on mountain goat hunt participation. At first, it took a bit for the RG014 archery hunt to gain popularity, but by 2016, with good weather, it did. In two 2018 was also a good weather year, while 2019, 20, and especially 21 were bad weather years that contributed to low mountain goat hunting participation. Here is a map of the proposed addition. The map on the right shows the entire RG014 hunt area, and the map on the left focuses in on the area of interest. On this second map, the blue line depicts the current boundary, and the red line depicts uh, the area that would be added if this proposal was adopted. The finger of blue on the lower right is Blackaby Ridge, which was added to the hunt area in 2015 by the board.
The Blackerby area was added to the RG014 hunt at the 2015 Board of Game meeting. This area was added after an open discussion about how much land to add to the hunt, which would have included the area within this proposal. At that time, the 1,000 foot contour was used to delineate the hunt area boundary because it could be seen from the Salmon Creek Reservoir. Finally, a similar proposal on this was presented to the board in 2018 and was not adopted. The area under question here is very popular for goat viewing. Goats are constantly watched on Thunder Mountain by folks in town who can see them from all over the Mendenhall Valley. It is also a popular place to hike and watch goats and people come from the, the valley and from the U.S. Forest Service Mendenhall Visitors Center at the Mendenhall Lake. Adoption of this proposal will probably lead to some user conflicts. There are also a reliable number of goats in this area with a nanny kid group of about 20 animals that summer uh, in this area. So that concludes proposal 29, a public proposal which the department is neutral on. There are not any population concerns with this proposal and the main question for the board is about allocation. Traditionally, this area has been an area for non-consumptive use by hunters but hunters continue to ask for access to this area, asking the board to rule again on whether these animals should be used for consumptive or non-consumptive purposes. Thank you for your um, comments. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So currently under the RG014, what are the goat points assigned to that, that hunt? With nor uh, through the chair, uh, Member Keo, normally with our count, it usually ends up being about eight points. Eight points. So adding this, you'd, you'd be nine point. or ten points. So, so. Yeah. Additional questions? Go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just curious on. Uh, how much visitation there is, you know, one, I imagine in August it's still pretty good, but what about like the month of November and stuff? Yeah, through the chair, Member Burnett, um, I mean, I know people that hike up there year round. Yeah. Obviously, it's going to be a lot less in November, but um, yeah, there's definitely people that are up there. Uh, in November, December, the goats are going to be a lot lower. They, you know, come down off uh, the main and are you know quite close to town sometimes at that point thank you go ahead Jake. hey th uh, thanks um, and you know, you might not know the answer to this are there uh, are there a lot of like glacier landings via helicopter is there a, you know and is there like an established dog mushing camp on any of these glaciers in the, in the country we're talking about I know there's one around Juno <laughs> um, if you don't want to answer that I will the answer is yes <laughs> in fact, they fly directly over Heinzelman Ridge on the way to the Mendenhall Glacier regularly, several times a day on a normal day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, through the chair, Mr. Fletcher, I will, I will say it, it's not in the area with the goats, but it is, yeah, like five miles away. Yeah, so you, you go over them. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I don't see adding this much space for one more goat for someone to hunt. Um, it's not adding much additional opportunity from a hunting standpoint, but um, this is right over, you know, the most visited by tourist spot in the state of Alaska. Just to put it mildly, that the Mendenhall Glacier is the most visited place in the state. So. Um, lots of people, lots of concern from others if you do it. And I, even though it probably wouldn't have a lot of effect, it's a, there's, a, there's a psychological effect of doing something like this and adding that area. Um, I've never, I hardly ever see goats up there unless you go up on top but from the valley, but still. Um, for one, one more goat to shoot, maybe not. Go ahead. Lynn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have to agree. The cost to benefit here is just not there. Um, and this, this boundary has been in place for quite a while, so I don't, I don't intend to support the proposal. Go ahead, Stash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't intend on supporting it either. And we just made some changes to the, on the prior proposal, so I'm um, definitely not going to support this one. Okay. Al? Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you poll the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 29. Mr. Fletcher? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Keough? No. Mr. Brett? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Hoffman? No. And Chairman Burnett? No. Proposal fails 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt Proposal 30, open up all archery goat hunt in unit, unit 1, Charlie, the southern end of Chilcat Peninsula. Second. Been moved and seconded. The Department of Comments, please. Yeah, through the chair, this proposal creates an archery hunt on the Chilcat, uh, for the Chilcat Range along the Chilcat Peninsula for the month of August, so the 1st through the 31st. It's a public proposal. The department is neutral. Uh, the Upper Lynn Canal uh, opposed this uh, zero to nine. So originally registration hunts uh, and uh, mountain goat registration hunts in Unit 1C started in October. Uh, then some of the other registration hunts throughout 1C increased their season uh, to September. And this occurred in uh, 2003. Then in 2004, some of the other areas within 1C uh, went to an August start date, uh, but that didn't occur uh, for the area that we're talking about. Starting the RG014 season in August would create a similar season to uh, most of the other Unit 1C registration hunt areas. Because of the low harvest, indicating little pressure on the population uh, for this area and poor weather condition most years, a fall population monitoring survey has not been a priority for this area. However, as a man objective, we do try to maintain goat densities of at least 30 goats per hour observed during fall surveys. So the RG014 area um, is from the Endicott River in the north to Point Couverton in the south. Uh, it's difficult to access with few anchorages on the east side and only a couple of high mountain lakes uh, where people can fly into and have access. The home shore logging roads on the south end do uh, provide access on the very southern portion of the goat habitat on the peninsula. Um, although we do see because of this uh, high access that there might be uh, local depletion from time to time uh, as people have uh, can easily access that area. The number of hunters who hunt in this registration hunt each year is relatively small with minimal numbers of non-resident hunters. Only one goat hunt is available in this area uh, through guides as this is the current limit on the number of guided goat hunts uh, through the Forest Service uh, for this, this region or this portion of it anyway. If there are any more uh, non-resident hunters, they would be second degree of kindred hunters. So harvest has been quite low in this area uh, with, two nine, with about two to nine goats uh, being harvested uh, each year. So typically the harvest in this area is well below the guideline harvest level of 18 points in the area. Uh, Non-resident hunters is even uh, lower. 
And as a manager, manager uh, I'm not sure that a weapons restriction is necessary uh, if the board wanted to open this up to an unrestricted hunt starting in August. So this is proposal 30, um, and this proposal would create an archery-only hunt during the month of August, starting the 1st of August through the 31st for a goat season in RG014. Uh, the department is neutral because of the low harvest and difficulty in accessing this area for mountain goat hunting has led to low harvest um, of what we think is a stable population. Once again, the Upper Lynn Canal did... Uh, vote and oppose this proposal. That concludes my comments. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So did I hear you correctly that if the board were to amend this to include unrestricted weapons, you'd be still be okay with that? Yeah, through the chair member, uh, Keo, that's affirmative. Uh, Jake. Anything, Mr. Chair, I just want to go on the record by saying there was a there's a lot of public comment in support of this, uh, but uh, Icy Straits AC and Upperland Canal AC were, were against it. Yeah, and I think most of those comments in support were bow hunters. Uh, That's my impression as well. So, um, so I'm not sure how the public would feel about an unrestricted weapons hunt, but um, any additional questions from so I see, <clears throat> understand this is the this um, little effort hunting here, here at this time, low harvest, and plenty of goats. So, you know, adding additional opportunity certainly um, within the normal behavior of this, and it might help us um, meet an ANS and. So, any additional comments, questions, and are you still thinking about a, a uh, amendment? Yes. So, I mean, I, based on the department's comments, I mean, I, I think it'd be totally warranted, but at the same time, um, maybe just get this approved it as written, just to get get to see what the harvest goes to, and down the road, if somebody wants to propose something to maybe. Offer the unrestricted weapons. Maybe we go that with that then, but I'll, I'll support it as written. Stash. Thank you. A question to um, the department on the AC notes here. Unless I'm reading this wrong, it, it looks like they support the proposal, but um, the notes say they voted down zero to eleven. But the, the notes actually say. Um, Support is written. So, I'm, I'm, were you at the meeting? Because I'm getting, it's not making sense to me. Through the chair, uh, Member Hoffman, I wasn't. We do have someone in the audience that was, uh, Carl, I'm, was at that meeting. He could probably attest to what they talked about. Mr. Brian. Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I'm a little confused now, too, because I look in the opposed column and I see both the IC Straits AC opposed it, as well as the Upper Lynn Canal AC opposed it. The only other AC that would have been engaged probably would be the Juno Douglas AC. And the Juno Douglas didn't take it up. And they didn't vote. Uh, the IC Strait AC area encompasses the uh, west side of the hunt, proposed hunt area, um, and includes the uh, community of excursion yeah, inlet. Yeah, make sense. Uh... Uh, through the chair, Member Hoffman, I can talk about Icy Streets if you want. Um, Icy Streets did oppose this. Uh, reason being is um, they uh, were looking at federal subsistence regulations. Um, they actually looked at them incorrectly, but they thought that this area was open in August for federal subsistence. Uh, they misread that. Uh, and it is not, but that's why they voted it down, because they thought through federal subsistence they would have access to this area in August. Um, once again, they don't, uh, but that's why they uh, opposed it, because they thought they would have access um, 
and that uh, Juno hunters would not have access if this proposal went through. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't see that conveyed in their, their meeting notes. It, it only conveys the other way, but thank you for that clarification. Uh, through the chair, would you be interested in uh, Carl's uh, view of what they said at uh, Upper Lincoln now? Yes. Yeah, thank you uh, again, Carl Koch. Uh, they were concerned about a couple of things. One was the, they, did, they felt like it was specific weapons was, you know, helping one user, user group more than others. But then on the other side, they felt like uh, they were concerned about goat numbers in general throughout Upper Lynn Canal. And, and they didn't think it would be a good idea in the long run to be expanding opportunity in that area. It's kind of like two contrary uh, things there. Uh, go ahead. And through the chair, I, I also just want to point out, if you guys want to think about the next proposal, it, it will be unrestricted during this time period. And yeah, in that case, the they also opposed it according to our worksheet, so. Al, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, not looking forward like smarter people than me did. <laughs> <laughs> I was willing to make that amendment of, to adding, um, make it a, uh, not having a weapons restriction on it. So I think in light of that, I, I won't support proposal 30, but I'll, seriously consider 31. Any further discussion? If, if not, I think we might be ready for the question. I'm Call the question. Sure. The Quest. board has, oh. go ahead. The board has heard no concerns from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on Proposal 30. Mr. Huffman? No. Mr. Cooney? No. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Keough? No. Ms. Kuzak? No. Mr. Fletcher? No. Chairman Burnett? No. Proposal fails 0 to 7. Mr. Chair, move to adopt Proposal 31, lengthen the resident registration goat hunt in Units 1, Charlie, the southern end of, Chilcat, of the Chilcat Range. Well. Second. Been moved and seconded. The department comments, please. Yeah, through the chair. Um, so this uh, proposal would create a resident-only hunt in the RG014, or sorry, RG015 hunt area, extending the season one month earlier to begin the 1st of August through uh, the 30th of November. Uh, I do want to point out, um, I think in my a and I might have uh, suggested that this proposal wanted to create a resident only hunt for the entire season, but this proposal is uh, just for that, that August period. So I want to point that out. So um, this would begin the RG014 uh, hunt uh, in August with a, a one, re one month resident only season. Um, it was put forward by the resident hunters of Alaska. Uh, the department is neutral on it. Um, and as we uh, have talked about with the previous proposal, the Upper Lynn Canal was, did seem to be opposed uh, for um, possibly due to concerns about uh, declines in goats in, in their area. And then the um, Icy Straits AC was opposed because they thought they had federal subsistence access already during that time. So very similar slide to uh, the pre previous pre presentation, um, where uh, at first all of the 1C registration hunts uh, started in October. Uh, then a few of the, regist or the registration hunts went uh, to September, and that was in 2003. Then in August and in two, 
uh, in 2004, some of the registration hunts in Unit 1C uh, switched to an August start date. So uh, in the proposed season, the August 1st start date uh, through th August 31st would uh, be for residents only, but it would start the registration R015 season, uh, similar to many of the other Unit 1C hunts. Because of the low harvest indicating little pressure on the population and poor weather conditions most years, uh, a fall population monitoring survey has not been a priority for this area. Um, however, we have had uh, an objective to try and maintain at least uh, 30 goats per hour observed during fall surveys. So the, the area here is uh, similar to the previous proposal. Um, so it's from the Endicott River uh, to the northern point Coverton, uh, uh, to in the north to Point Coverton in the south. Um, once again, it's difficult to act to this with few anchorages, um, and there are a couple of high mountain lakes you can fly into, but, but not that many. Furthermore, you can uh, access the southern area uh, by way of the home shore uh, logging roads. So for this one, uh, the number of non-resident versus, versus resident hunters is a little more important. Um, the number of hunters who hunt in this registration hunt uh, is fairly small each year. Um, there is a relatively small number of uh, non-resident hunters. Only one goat hunt is available in this area uh, through guides, um, and that's uh, currently limited by uh, for service uh, guide use permits. If there are any more than uh, one guided hunt, um, which you do see in 2018, uh, it was B because there was a second uh, degree of kindred hunter. So the harvest has been low uh, with two to uh, nine goats being harvested each year. I do have the, the non-resident hunter harvest there uh, in parentheses for years that uh, non-resident hunter did harvest a goat. So typically harvest in this area is well below uh, the guideline harvest level of 18 points in this area. Uh, Non-resident harvest is uh, even much lower. And as a manager, I'm not sure that there, uh, that a resident, non-resident restriction is necessary if the board wanted to open this up uh, to residents and non-residents uh, starting in August. So this proposal is to create a resident-only hunt in, RG0, in the RG015 hunt area, uh, extending the season one month earlier to begin uh, the 1st of August and go uh, through the um, 30th of November, but the, non, uh, the resident portion only would be uh, for the month of August. The department is neutral because of the low harvest uh, and difficult in accessing uh, the areas where goat hunting occurs, um, and as we said, the Upper Lynn Canal and Icy Straits uh, ACs were opposed to it. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I intend to support this proposal. The department said there's not a resource concern. We can provide some additional opportunity, and we're providing that opportunity to all different user groups. Yeah, I would point out that, you know, the the Upper Lynn Canal group, or the Icy Strait group, had concerns about subsistence, but this is supported by the Federal Subsistence Management Group. So um, it does provide additional subsistence opportunities and um, also provides an earlier opportunity for resident hunters. So I think, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to to remind the board, no doubt you haven't forgot, but this proposal does have a resident, non-resident component to it. Yes. So. Right. The, the one month 
is resident only. The rest of the season is residents and non-residents. So the first month of the season is open only to residents under this. Go ahead. Clarification, George Pappas, OSM. Yes, OSM did support this. Um, I do not see that the uh, Southeast Regional Advisory Council provide a position on this. So for clarification, OSM did support this. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be in support of this also. And it, also looking at IC Straits, uh, AC comments, they did uh, feel that there was room for more goat harvest. And Lynn Cannell was just uh, worried about the, the population being depleted, but with the protection of the GHL point system, I don't think we have to worry about that or it satisfies the concerns of the Lynn Canal AC. Any additional comments from board members? Call the question. Question has been called. Go ahead. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Final action on proposal 31. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Brett? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Keough? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Ms. Kuzak? Yes. Proposal carries 7 to 0. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt proposal 32. Restrict hunters who take nanny goat in Unit 1 Delta from hunting goat the following regulatory year in Unit 1 Delta. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, department comments, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, this is uh, Carl Koch speaking. Uh, the effect of Proposal 32, it prohibits hunters who harvest the nanny in Unit 1D from hunting goats in Unit 1D the following year. Uh, the Upper Lynn Canal Advisory proposed it, and they did say uh, they'd be willing to have it go further than 1D if that was to uh, influence support from the board. Uh, and uh, we heard from a lot of ACs on this. Uh, of course, the Upper Lynn Canal voted to, to support it. Catch Can is opposed. Uh, Juno supports it for Unit 1D only, and Sitka uh, only considered unit four and uh, didn't seem to have any concerns with it in unit 1D. The department is neutral on this proposal because it doesn't cause any uh, biological concern. We do strongly encourage uh, nanny harvest and have, you know, what's that? I'm sorry, strongly discourage nanny harvest. I meant to say <laughs> Billy harvest, thank you. <laughs> and some background. Uh, it's highly valued subsistence for food for Unit 1D. Of course, I mentioned it's also important for uh, guided hunts. Uh, department, we've seen local declines. I've been hearing about it since I started in 2015. Um, guides have asked me to uh, you know, do something about it because uh, as I'll get a little into when I explain our management strategy, uh, the hunts close sooner when we have people take uh, female goats. We tried a mandatory online goat quiz beginning in 2016, and that was had very limited effectiveness, and I'll go over that as well for you. So this is a map of the how we've broken down the subunits in Unit 1D uh, for the guideline harvest levels. And how we assign those guideline harvest levels is flying a survey. We get a minimum count, and we assign six points for every 100 goats we see during a survey. When a nanny is taken, we deduct two points. And when a billy is taken, we deduct one point. And so uh, if all nannies are taken, the hunt can be over twice as fast as if all billies were taken. And you can see there's 22 hunt units in that table there. The ones in blue only allow one to two points. And so as soon as a nanny is taken, those units are closed. Also, uh, the three units in pink are, were closed before the season and have been for several years because of goat declines that haven't yet recovered. Uh, happily, the areas in green have been holding pretty good and had some uh, pretty good goat numbers, so they've been staying, uh, staying in good shape. Uh, proportion of kids to adult females is that top uh, table, and you can see it ranges from 50 to as high as uh, the low 80s. 
and the average is 67%. Uh, so those are collared goats, uh, about 67% of them had a kid with them. And then survival is a little bit lower in the haines skagway area. Uh, you can see on that lower table, it's 72% than it is in other areas, uh, and that's uh, kid survival. So that uh, you know, gets our attention as well. Adult survival, uh, you know, of course, is variable. Um, we do see that uh, adult female survival is a little lower than we'd like to see. Um, you know, the overall uh, survival estimate of 77% uh, and Baranoff Island has an overall survival of 87%. Uh, and then the female survival, again, is uh, slightly higher than male survival, but lower than we'd like to see it. And this is that chart that you saw before. Uh, which shows uh, if, if all the mortality factors uh, that are natural, such as predation or winter, you know, stayed constant and hunters were to target a billy, you can see there'd be a lot more goats out there. Uh, population could double in, in a short time, again, if all the other factors were, were constant. So can create more hunter opportunity by targeting males. This is a figure of the male female harvest with the percentages above the bars being the female uh, per proportion. And uh, it was kind of interesting. We started the goat quiz requirement in 2016 and had the highest female harvest that year in a uh, couple of decades at 46%. And then it's fluctuated ever since. Uh, I think I put in the ANR that uh, the five, six years before the uh, before the goat quiz went into effect, it averaged 32% and it uh, dropped to the high 20s, 26%, I believe, uh, after the quiz, as, as just as the average. So you may be wondering you know, about some of the other strategies that have been used and how effective they were. Um, the Board of Game adopted similar proposals in Unit 6, 7, and 15. Um, in Unit 6, 7, and 15, when a nanny is harvested, Hunter has to wait five years before they can hunt in that unit again. Before the penalty, the average in, in unit six was uh, 20%, and the range was 14 to 29%. Afterwards, it dropped to 13%, range is at times as low as 7%, uh, with a high of 26%. And I believe uh, from the biologists up there, the high number was caused by some really deep snow pushing goats down and making it a really hard year to, to be selective about goats. Uh, Mr. Bethune spoke earlier about how great the Unit 4 penalty has been working down there when a nanny is harvested and the unit is closed. So the whole subunit gets shut down and he showed you that his units are, you know, in some cases a lot smaller than mine up in 1D. Um, before the penalty went into effect, 41% were taken, and then after it, the average was 13%. There's one key difference, though. In uh, Steve's area, uh, there's no ANS. And so it's tough for me uh, to just shut down uh, an area with seven to eight points after one nanny's taken to then be able to meet the ANS. And so that a, that's a, would be a challenge if we were to try and adopt the Unit 4 strategy in Unit 1D. So just uh, kind of finalizing here, the kid survival and adult survival are low in Unit 1D. Uh, the quiz seems to be not that effective. Um, some of the strategies in other areas have, uh, have been effective. And again, uh, this is Proposal 32, prohibits hunters who harvest a nanny in 1D from hunting goats in Unit 1D the following year, put forth by the Upper Lynn Canal Advisory Committee. And I'm sorry it's not on the slide there, but uh, the IC Straight AC, I think I forgot to mention that earlier, they were another one that didn't want it in Unit 4, but didn't seem to have concerns about Unit 1D. Catch cans opposed uh, regardless, and uh, Juno supports it for 1D only, and Sitka only discussed Unit 4. And with that, I'll take any questions. Questions from board members? Discussion? Go ahead, Al, and then Stosh. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for the section of subsistence. I wonder if they have any issues about penalizing a subsistence user for harvesting a, uh, a nanny goat. <laughs> Through the chair to Member Barrett, um, that would be for the board to discuss on the record, please, how this, if you adopted this, how you would still provide um, reasonable opportunity for subsistence for those resident hunters. I noticed that of the three registration hunts mentioned in staff comments, of the four mentioned in staff comments, um, three are for both residents and non-residents. And so I guess my, my, I'm wondering um, how, how this, if this were adopted, how it might um, fit in with the subsistence law that says that um, uh, the regulations need to show a preference for subsistence uses. Did that help, Mr. Barrett? Okay. It didn't, it didn't clear it up much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm thinking hard about it, and I was hoping for some more clarity on it. Um, but I, you made the point, though, that a, a non-resident could take that nanny goat, and, and then many subsistence users would not benefit from that. Um, I have to think some more. Thank you. Stosh. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask a similar question along those lines. My notes have people intentionally target nannies in 1D. Do, do you know? Uh, you know, it started off as uh, it seemed like a... You know, somebody used the term one and done. A lot of the areas along the highway and stuff were lower numbers, and guys would or gals would see the lowest goat in view and go get it. And if it was a nanny, so be it. Um, they've, they've done a little better with a lot of conversations and, and the goat quiz, but it hasn't gotten us to where we want to. I definitely have had uh, a small number of hunters, co you know, come in really bummed out that they, they thought they had a billy in their sights and, and totally got it wrong, but um, there still is some, certainly some folks that uh, shoot whichever goat it is and, and take it down. Additional board questions, board comments. Go ahead, Al. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if the Department of Law could give us any clarity on, uh, on what seems like a quagmire there. I mean, I forgot about the non-resident component and and, uh, you know, subsistence brought that up. That even made it a little more complicated. Uh, through the chair, Member Barrett. Yeah, th this is a good discussion to have, and I absolutely agree with Lisa Olson that, um, that the board should be considering any uh, regulatory changes on um, subsistence resources, especially where you've got a long-time positive C&T on something. But that doesn't mean that, um, that you can't... Um, have some sort of a penalty to protect the resource for sustained yield purposes because that constitutional mandate is is above the statutory subsistence preference. So um, I, I would ask the board to 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 consider that um, is if you were to put that penalty in there, is it does it relate to sustained yield or or what would be the reason for that penalty? And, and would that uh, then impact on subsistence be reasonable? Hearing that, I'd like to ask the department, the purpose, my understanding of the purpose of this would be to increase the potential number of goats that could be harvested in the future. It's not really a sustained yield problem because you are restricting already the hunting by points, so you're you're already taking measures to to prevent over harvest, but in this case you are actually trying to increase the number of goats in the long run, which actually would be a positive um, thing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And and I should have mentioned earlier that you know every season there are multiple areas that are not closed and you know the opportunity wasn't fully utilized 
but we're hoping that this would build up the populations in some of the smaller uh, units. Thank you, uh, Al. Yeah, well, I thank the Department of Law and, and yourself for clarifying some of those. And that's why, you know, I've, I asked a couple times during public comments about, you know, going to Billy's only. And I think in some of these, to, to get away from the complexity of the point system, it would just be easy. I mean, we have many bison hunts or bisex, you know, which have females have horns. Uh, we have 50 inch rules. We have full curl management. Um, the, you know, hunters have to train themselves. I've goat hunted and in my first time, you know, two hours I had it figured out. And uh, it, it's, it's not super complicated. Telling a full curl sheep, that gets complicated some days. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I guess I can support this as, as we go along so far. Additional comments from board members, uh, Stash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I think I'm going to have to side with um, Icy Straits here in Ketchikan. If, if um, a non-resident can accidentally shoot an annie and, and it's punitive towards subsistence hunters, then I, I, won't, I won't support this. Yeah, I'm, you know, that, go ahead, um, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to try to murky the waters a little bit. No, just kidding. Um, I guess I just wanted to make the point and follow up with uh, uh, Mr. Koch's last statement. And, and please, uh, Ms. Olson, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, not every place in Unit 1D shuts down every year. So uh, there's a, a difference between talking about subsistence opportunity given the subsistence user population and the unit versus the one individual hunter who takes a, a nanny goat. Yes, if a Haynes resident runs up the mountain, shoots a nanny, they're going to have to wait a couple years. That doesn't mean that there isn't subsistence opportunity remaining in the GMU as a whole. This is a very different approach than Mr. Bethune has in Unit 4 where one nanny closes an area. We could have the, the taxonic range, is if you land in Haines and you drive up the Haines Highway, the mountain range that you follow all the way up to the Canadian border, at times has eight, nine, ten different goat points. It, somebody could shoot an ante up there, but it's going to stay open until we get to the points. And you, I believe Mr. Koch pointed out he had 23 hunt areas, 22? 22. 22. Three are closed now because of... Uh, low goat numbers, um, but that leaves, what, 19 areas that are open and available with a variety of goat points available in each one of those little areas. And I, as I went up to the front to confer with Mr. Koch, every season, some place in Unit 1D has mountain goat hunting opportunity remaining at the end of the season. So I think looking at it in a broad geographic scale, and separating overall subsistence use from the one hunter is, is probably the way to view this. Thanks for that, Ryan. Um, I was intending to support this, but you know what I really would like to see is um, a restriction that requires non-resident goat hunters to only take billies. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you have that power. I, I understand that, but I don't have that power, uh, and I don't make amendments at the table. So, um, but you know, really, you know, a lot of these people are guided. There's, they're here for a trophy value, and they really should be taking billets. Uh, and I think that alleviates some of the concern. I would still support this, but. Um, either way, but I think that would be something that Member Barrett has suggested in the past. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I, I certainly can't speak for all the guides, but uh, two out of three have told me, please make it Billy only because they feel like when they're out there and a client demands the goat and it's the last day of the hunt, they got to give it to them no matter what it is. And also they do a 
phenomenal job, you know, probably 90% uh, Billy's as, as it is. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to ask if you had data on how many non-residents are taking nannies. Yeah, I apologize. I don't have the, uh, the exact numbers, but I think I can think of three or four in the, uh, from the guided side in the eight years I've been doing it. Has any of those nannies ever closed the season or closed the unit? Certainly. Uh, yes, one, one time uh, a year or two ago that I can think of off the top of my head. It was uh, after uh, seven other goats had already come out of that area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, amend this proposal to restrict uh, non-residents to uh, billy goats only. In unit 1D. 1D, yes. Second. Amendments been made and seconded. Um, discussion on the amendment. Um, Jake. I guess just speaking for myself on, on, uh, on, on behalf of guides, a good guide would be able to stay within the parameters of that amendment. Any additional discussion? Go ahead, Al. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think through the discussion, we've seen that non-residents have affected uh, potentially some subsistence opportunity by taking a nanny, and I, I think this standard would be a good benefit for everybody. Thank you. Um, Stash, you have any comments? No, I agree with Member Britt. Yep. Okay. Uh, would you call the roll on the amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, on the amendment to restrict the non-resident bag limit to Billy's only in Unit 1D. Mr. Keogh? Yes. Ms. Kuzak? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Brett? Yes. The amendment carries 7 to 0. Okay, the amended proposal, which, go ahead. This is before us. Thank Lisa. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a note on what was provided earlier about the uh, closing of the areas, and there will be many other areas open. However, this penalty doesn't apply, I think it does apply to a person rather than an area. So that person would be prohibited from goat hunting the next year. And if that person is a subsistence user, the standard for reasonable opportunity is does keep it in the singular, not just for everybody. There's another opportunity in a different area, but it says the um, reasonable opportunity is an opportunity as defined by the board that um, allows a, norm, a normally diligent participant um, the opportunity to for success in taking that game. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, what I was a little confused about with the closed areas versus the pro prohibition against the subsistence user, Mr. Chair. So I would like to ask the Department of Law on that. What, if there's a historical present for an annual, you know, we're not talking about taking it away from them forever. We're talking about a penalty which takes it away for one year. Um, could that be defended? That's the best question. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I don't believe that the statute defines what normally diligent means. So if a normally diligent hunter can distinguish between a nanny and a billy, then I guess that would be a decision for you folks to make. Okay. That that would have been my, so that being the case, um, the, the amended proposal is before us. And I think the purpose of this proposal was to build up the population of goats in the area, um, which I think is to allow for greater harvest forever, ideally. Um, so anyone, any more comments? on the proposal as written. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarification, and maybe it's just me at the end of the day, um, just to make sure, for the record, we're understanding this right, the amendment replaced the language of the original proposal, not adding on to it. So when you no, guys do vote, so now it has the restriction 
and yes, amended was, together? Yes, okay. the amendment was adding to, not replacing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, the proposal is before us. Um, Call the question. Question has been called. The board has heard no concern from the public regarding cost to private persons if this regulation is adopted. Thank you. Christy, would you pull the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, final action on Proposal 32 as amended. Mr. Fletcher? Yes. Chairman Burnett? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Cooney? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Mr. Keogh? Yes. Ms. Kuzak? Yes. That proposal carries as amended 7 to 0. Thank you. I turned that off. Uh, thank you for the board for your hard work today and staff. Um, we're going to uh, recess until 8.30 tomorrow morning. And we'll come back on the next proposal, proposal 33.